So when the event starts, um, yes, make sure to record. Here, people. Um, thank you very much, everybody, for being here today. And my name is Brock Dahlman, and I'm the co-director of the Bring Back the Beaver campaign at the Occidental Arts and Ecology Center, with Kate Lundquist, who we're going to hear from later. And I also want to note that I'm here in sunny and unfortunately a little droughty Western Sonoma County. And I want to acknowledge and honor the Southern Pomo and the Coast Miwok peoples uh, whose land we are on, their traditional territory, and they are now known as the Federated Indians of Great and Rancheria. So welcome back all of you who are here with us on Wednesday for day one, which we call Beaver Essentials, History and Management. And I do want to offer a big orange toothy grin and welcome to all of you who are joining us here today for day two, which we're calling Beaver Dynamics Ecosystem Restoration. Um, if you missed Wednesday, uh, all of those talks are now loaded on YouTube. And if you go back to the California Beaver Summit website, uh, there's a link there that says day one videos and you can find all the videos from Wednesday. And that's then to say that we're recording everything that we'll be hearing from today and we'll get those on online ideally by tomorrow. So all the talks will be recorded for both days. And we are also um, wanna let you know that we that the chat function is enabled. So please use that chat and um, we'll record the chat. And then also the Q and A function is enabled. And so if you have questions, you can use the Q and A. We'll keep track of those questions, um, but we're not going to have a question and answer after each talk. We'll save up the questions and we'll organize those. And at the end of all of the talks, we have time saved at the end of the day up till five and we'll bring all the presenters back on and we'll answer questions that way. And then for those who really want to stick around, we actually will have an extended hour from five to 6 p.m. where you can stay on and we'll open it up to more questions. And so that's when you can use the raise hand function and be recognized to speak live. Otherwise, during the program, don't use the, please don't use the raise hand function. So, so that's that. And I do again want to just acknowledge and offer a big thank you to all my fellow California Beaver Summit Steering Committee members. So we have Worth the Dam's Heidi Perriman and Sonoma State's Jeff Baldwin, who've been the conference co-chairs for us. Thank you too for that. And then also the California Urban Streams Partnership, Jackie Vanderhoot, who's our conference facilitator. We've also, um, in the steering committee, there was Biodiversity's First, very own Elizabeth Johnson and Humboldt State Master Student, Zane Eddy, U.S. Forest Service, Karen Pope, the Institute for Historical Ecology's Dr. Rick Landman, CSU's Channel Islands, Dr. Emily Fairfax, and OAC Water Institute's Kate Lundquist. And we're gonna hear from both uh, Emily and Kate in a little bit. So that's very exciting. Thank you all for all the work. We're, we're feeling, I'm feeling really good about it. And I know that um, we all feel like Wednesday went really well. We're super excited about today. And I do want to also give a special shout out to just Sonoma State in general as a wonderful public institution for hosting and supporting all the technical parts of, of today. So looking like we've got 272 and counting of you all on today. As of last Wednesday, we actually had maxed out at a thousand registrants, which is amazing. And so hopefully lots of y'all are going to get joining on here. Um, and not sure what the composition looks like today, but uh, as far as registrants go, we at least had people from 31 states, which was super exciting and a whole number of various agencies that had signed up. So we're super excited about, <clears throat> about just the, the interest and the diversity of interest from uh, agencies, federal and state, quasi-governmental, public, private, uh, just across the board. It feels like California, there's just a incredible uh, wellspring of of intrigue about our very own uh, Castro Canadensis. So that is something we really like. And what we heard a little bit on Wednesday, which was great, is just a sense around really recognizing the bandwidth of beaverdom, if you will, and the many differences. Michael Pollack kind of gave us a compare and contrast about the many differences between modern humans who have been typified as agents of desiccation and degradation and what we might call the drain age, the age of draining everything. Whereas beavers are really agents of rehydration and resiliency in what we would call the retain age where they're about retaining water. 
and rewetting water and rewilding our fluvial landscapes. And towards what Ben Goldfarb mentioned, this idea of the castorification of the continent in California in, in olden days and, and has a vision forward for the future. We certainly learned a lot about historical ecology of beaver in California through Rick Landman and just really getting clear that based on the evidence, uh, beaver were much more widely distributed across the state than previously thought and certainly as current policy has yet to catch up with that reality. And that's something we'll continue to talk about more today about policy. And then I think um, we, there was a lot of just honoring and recognizing uh, what was quoted, uh, the deep wisdom behind the saying by the Haida people of the Pacific Northwest that beaver taught salmon how to jump. And so a lot of conversation about beaver as a keystone species for salmon and other, other uh, life forms. And then also the relationship and, and um, Jeff Baldwin really talked a lot about our changing climate and the dynamics of climate change and the history of climate change and the future projections of that and where the activities of beaver themselves can really step up as a buffering resiliency uh, benefit in so many of, especially our, obviously our fluvial riparian systems with the projections around less snowpack and more rainfall and hotter days and increased uh, erraticness of the, of the hydrologic cycle. And then uh, we heard from, uh, also I really want to acknowledge that um, Karina Cunningham, Cunningham with the Mighty Summit Consortium really spoke eloquently and beautifully just about her tribal relationship and the Tasmam Koyom and the Feather River system and honoring the, their a deep and long held cultural connection with beaver and, and all of life in, the, in their tribal territory. And then listening as well to, to Karen Pope talk about beaver and birds and frogs. And it made me think that maybe we can adjust that old saying, the Haida saying that beaver also taught frogs how to jump, although maybe not. I was pretty jumpy. Um, and then there was a lot moving forward of really uh, hearing from Marjorie with California Department of Fish and Wildlife about the recognition that beaver is a public trust resource of quote, we the people of California and how that public trust resource is being managed by the department and a lot of ideas about how that could be improved. And, and, and we'll hear more about that today as well. And then I think ultimately really finishing off with uh, uh, several talks there from Mike Callahan and Kevin Swift about just getting more into the pragmatic opportunities and the, the plethora of tools in our toolbox for how to coexist with beaver and manage those perceived parts of beaver's behavior that some folks think of as problematic, that there are ways to manage those behaviors. And so we're blessed to have significant um, resources and people both nationally, internationally, and certainly within the state who are actively engaging with and utilizing things such as flow control devices and tree wrapping and other techniques to live with the beaver and recognize that our, our beaver glass is more than half full and see that problems are solutions with beaver. And uh, one of the things that relative to today's program that we're talking about, and we've got another nine amazing speakers lined up that we'll go through, is this idea today we're talking about beaver dynamics and ecosystems and restoration. And I'm super excited about, for instance, the keynote address we'll hear um, in a bit of Beavers and Fire Refugia by Dr. Emily Fairfax. And this sense of recognizing, or what I really hope you all get, is that you reverberate with her talk and with beavers in general, because I emphasize reverberate because I really think that what we're talking about with uh, beaver dynamics is recognizing or thinking about beaver more as a verb instead of ne say necessarily a noun and, and thinking of verbs as process, as dynamism, as action in the sentence. And so that the reverberate is really about after beavers eat all your willows, they ate that verb, right? That's reverberate, right? The reverber reverber eaten of your system and the beauty of beavers as a keystone species is really because they engage in process-based keystone processes. And the relationship of the interaction of what we might think of as elemental processes. So earth and air and fire and water creating conditions conducive for life. And beavers are one of the great life conditioners out there who create those conditions so conducive for life at an elemental process-based based ways. We're going to hear a lot more about process-based restoration or PBR and how we can partner with beavers as agents 
of these process-based pedagogies? How do we think about and teach and, and support these uh, elemental keystone processes? And I think one of the key processes that we're really gonna hear about, and I wanna transition us to have Emily start us off with is this keystone process right now of fire in California. And while a lot of folks think of beaver and they immediately think of water, and you should because it's an aquatic mammal, and thus it by definition lives in water, the process of fire and how fire and water relate and how beaver habitat relates to fire is something that's uh, recently been much more acknowledged and witnessed. And, and Emily's going to uh, really offer us up an opportunity to envision the opportunity of working with beaver in California, where unfortunately, uh, I'll, say, I'll say our Eurocentric settler colonist paradigm in the Mediterranean California is a pyro illiterate paradigm. And so instead of where functionally most ecosystems in the state were fire dependent landscapes, we have a current fire suppression paradigm where the frequency of fire is low, and yet when it shows up, the intensity of fire is really big. And we've learned that lesson the hard way in a number of communities here recently. And so how do we also move back to traditional ecological knowledge of indigenous burning in California, where we have high frequency and low intensity, and how do we re-wet and rewild uh, the state with beaver to also act as a fire resiliency uh, support? And so with that, um, thank you all for being here. And I am going to just turn this right on over to Dr. Emily Fairfax, who's gonna to talk to us about beaver and fire refugia. So welcome, Emily, and um, take it away. All right. Perfect, thank you. Let me just go ahead and get my screen shared for you all. So the title of my talk today is Smokey the Beaver. And I'm going to be telling you just a very brief story about how beavers can help us with fighting fires. Climate's changing, right? I don't need to tell anybody here this. We can see it all around us. We can hear about it on the news and from our friends. And to be honest, like we can really feel this lately. It's been hotter, it's been drier, it's stressful. Particularly stressful is that wildfires are out of control. And a lot of people are asking themselves, what can we do about this? This is a problem. I don't like this. I don't want the world to be like this. What can we do about it? There's two ways to approach climate change. We've got climate mitigation and climate adaptation. These terms are similar, but just slightly different. So climate mitigation, this is long-term uh, decisions that we're making that will help slow or stop the trajectory of climate change. So we're getting hotter and hotter and hotter, and we would like to stop that trend and turn it the other way and cool things off a little. And that's what climate mitigation is all about. It's like greenhouse gas sequestration and carbon sinking, really important but not going to help us when there's a fire ripping through the landscape next door. That's where climate adaptation comes in. Climate adaptation is both long and short term actions that we can take to help us minimize the damage from climate change that has already occurred. Climate change isn't this thing that's happening 50 years from now, but right now we're OK. Like it's happened. It's it is definitely already happening. And so climate adaptation, its main goal is to protect our lives and our infrastructure that's being threatened today. It's to help us with the floods and the droughts and the fires that are happening right now. And to do climate adaptation, we truly do need engineers. We need these skilled, well-practiced individuals that can help our cliffs not go crumbling into the ocean, that can help us build levees to keep the rivers where we want them. You know, we've been watching our reservoirs very closely lately because while they're quite a remarkable feat of engineering to dam up these huge rivers, uh, it's a little bit scary when we see these reservoirs not really filling the way they're supposed to. Up in Oregon, lawmakers recently made a $17 million down payment on wildfire preparedness. And if that number seems really big to you, I'd like to introduce you to the Cal Fire budget, which was two and a half billion dollars for the 2021 year, 2.1 billion of which was wildfire response alone. So this is expensive, engineers are expensive, but it's not the kind of thing where we can just say, I don't wanna spend the money, so let's not do it. Like we need to do this, we need to adapt to this climate change because otherwise, like what's the option? We just let everything burn, that's not okay. So we need engineers, <laughs> engineers are running a really high price tag, but they don't have to. I'd like to ask, what about nature's engineers? Right? We're not the only engineers out there in the landscape. We're not the only well-practiced individuals at building. 
Beavers have been engineering for 7 million years. We've got nowhere near that long of a history. So what can nature's engineers do for us in the age of climate change? So climate's changing, wildfires are definitely out of control. But the question that I think we should be asking is not what can we do about it, but what can beavers do about it? And that story starts with what beavers do with water. They slow it, they spread it, and they store it. And now this talk is all about fire, uh, but I'm going to touch on some other aspects of beaver behavior and landscape modification that are really integral to the fire story as a whole. And the first part of that is slowing and spreading and storing the water. And beavers do this by dampening flood waves. Now, this isn't new science. This has been studied for decades now. But what we're seeing is that as you have flood waves come into beaver dammed areas, and that flood wave could be a true flood, like a massive rainfall event, but it could also just be your snow melt, that high peak flow that you get supposedly every spring when snow starts melting, or maybe you're getting those winter rains finally coming down the watershed and heading towards the ocean. Any large flow coming through, these beavers can help dampen it. They're not stopping it, they're dampening it. So imagine looking down at a stream from above. And that stream does not have beavers. This is probably a fairly familiar site for many of us in California. Uh, it's single thread. It's not particularly complex or interesting. Uh, we've got a little bit of a riparian zone around the edge, but it's not huge. But you know what? It's a creek. We're going to, it's fine. But now, what if that creek had beavers? Beavers introduce an incredible amount of hydrologic complexity onto riverscapes. We've got the beaver dam itself, a large wooden structure spanning channel to channel uh, and just going all the way out into the riparian zone, actually. As this pond grows, the beavers grow the beaver dam. They make it bigger. They want their pond to be bigger. And the beavers aren't engineering this with climate change in mind, necessarily. They're building this dam because beavers are so awkward on land. They are round. They are blubbery. They are a lot like seals, which you don't really want to see walking around on the landscape. Easy pickings for a predator. But once they're in the water, beavers are so agile. Beavers are able to escape predators. They're safe. They're happy. They're at home. And so all of beavers building is really trying to serve that purpose. It's trying to make it so that the beavers are safe in the landscape and they can avoid predators. And to that end, not only have they built a pond, but they go in and they dig these little canals out from their main pond. These canals are so that they can go further out into the landscape and have little water highways that they can jump into and zoom home or that they can put their logs in and float them home instead of you know carrying them overland. Beavers are definitely large creatures up to 100 pounds but they uh they're not going to be hulking an entire tree over ground. They like to use the water and the natural buoyancy of the wood for that. So it's an incredible feat of engineering that really starts to shine when you have a flood wave coming through. And that flood wave in the stream without beavers, where it's very simple and not particularly complex, it has a lot of power. It's confined to a narrow channel where all of its intensity and all of its strength is just acting on a very small surface area. And so as it goes down this river, it changes it, and not necessarily for the better. But once that flood wave gets into the beaver dammed area, that changes. The water here is deeper. And there's a lot more surface area and a lot better connection to the floodplain, which got its name because that's where flood waves are supposed to go out onto the floodplain. And once it's into this beaver dammed area, that flood wave will lose its power and it'll spread out into the landscape and it'll slow down and it'll take up a lot more space and it has time to soak into the soils surrounding this pond. So the water storage isn't just in the pond itself, it's in the soils all around it. And then when it finally does start going downstream again, it's smaller and it's more spread out, and it's slower. It takes more time for it to make its way downstream. And that's critically important, because when we don't have that kind of hydrologic complexity, we see a lot of erosion. We see a lot of soil loss. We see a lot of scouring. This single thread stream that's not particularly complex, it's in a bad feedback cycle of becoming less and less complex and more and more incised and cut down, just because every time high water comes through, it cuts it deeper. But in this beaver dammed area, the water is being slowed down, it's being spread out, and ultimately it's being stored. 
think about this like a gigantic sponge. And every time we have a wet period, that sponge fills up and it absorbs some water. And then once that sponge is nice and full, it'll slowly let water continue to move downstream, but it, it's taken its time. It has to move through the sponge material to get downstream. You're not just pouring out a glass of water, you're pouring it on a sponge and then slowly wringing that sponge out. Now, if you're thinking, hold up now, are the beaver dams stopping all the water? Are they starving that downstream ecosystem of water? That sounds like a bad thing to me. I would agree, that would be a bad thing. Uh, there's another creature out there that engineers dams that occasionally starve downstream of water and stop the water, but that's not beavers, that's us. What beavers are doing is just slowing the water down. And that's really important in the American West because we are snowmelt dominated. This picture on the left of North America, it's showing you how much of the runoff, how much of your stream flow is coming from snowmelt. And if we're up here in these blue numbers, this is 60 up to 90%. And that's pretty much the whole American West. We, are, we love our snowmelt. It makes up a lot of our rivers. But if you're looking over here and you're like, okay, well, I'm a coastal American West, so I'm not as dependent on snowmelt, that is incorrect because in this coastal zone, you'll see that a huge amount of our irrigation demand is still being met by snowmelt. So snowmelt is super, super important to our lives and our infrastructure, and we need to have it there available for us on the landscape when the plants need it. And the plants need it in the summertime. They don't necessarily need it that much in the wintertime. Photosynthesis takes water and sunlight, and the best time for that is the summer, provided that we have the water. So how do we keep snowmelt in the landscape all the way into the summer. Well, the beaver ponds are gonna slow it down, but not stop it. I'm about to show you a plot of stream flow over time. And so stream flow is just how much water comes through our stream over the course of a year. During January and December, all the way through maybe April, in California, that's when we have our snowpack accumulating, and that's when we have a lot of our rain falling. Once we get into May, June, July, August, and even a little bit of September, that's when the plants want to have a lot of water. That's when there's so much sunshine and it's abundant and great and they could do all the photosynthesis in the world as long as they're well watered. And then into the fall, this is peak fire danger. This is the fire season, although unfortunately I am hearing more people say that there is no fire season anymore. It's just fire time year round because everything's always hot and dry. But regardless, we see this cycle pretty much every year. We get all of our precipitation, then the plants want it at a later point in time. And then if that water runs out, we get into this really high fire danger. Now in a stream without beavers, uh, we don't have a lot of water during this peak fire time. We have a lot of water coming through the stream in the winter and in the spring, and even into the early summer as snowmelt starts to make its way down from the mountains towards the ocean. But then get into June and July and August, September, October, and even November, the streams start running dry. All the hills stop being that nice green lush color and they start being that crinkly golden kind of scary color. They look a little bit more flammable and that's not a good thing. But when we have the beavers slowing down that water, what you see instead is yes, a large reduction in the flow during the winter and early summer. But then into the late summer and into the fall when this peak fire danger, you can see an increase in base flow you can see more water coming down in historically dry periods. And that water is really important. Mathematically, there's about the same amount of water coming down these two streams. It's the area under the curve. And I, I will admit that there's a little bit of loss uh, to groundwater recharge and to plant evapotranspiration, which is them doing their photosynthesis. Um, but I am putting loss in really big air quotes here because I would argue that those losses aren't necessarily a bad thing. You might think that losing water is a bad thing. And I would say like, yeah, truly if we lost water overall, that'd be a bad thing. But it's not really being lost when it goes into groundwater or when it goes to the plants. What it's doing is allowing these riparian zones to stay green even during periods of drought. That sponge, it's like the savings bank almost where you're depositing all this water when it's wet and then you can take it out when it's dry. And so the slowing it down and giving it to the plants, that's not a loss, that's fire prevention. So I have a conceptual model that might help you see where I'm coming from a little bit more with how beavers specifically can help buffer droughts. We're again going to think about a stream with and a stream without beavers, except now instead of looking at it from above, we're going to look at it with depth, so into the earth. In both scenarios, we've got plants along the surface, the stream and the beaver pond in the middle of the panel. 
And then out here in the beaver pond, you can see these little bitty sort of micro pond looking things. These are those canals that the beavers have dug out from their main pond that snake through the landscape, uh, like little drip lines for irrigation. And in both situations, what we have is a deep water table. So it's the American West, it's California. Our water table is way down there for most people and some infiltrating precipitation. So when it's raining, honestly, who cares? Because all the plants are green and happy. You're watering them from above. This doesn't matter. As soon as you get into a drought condition, which I'm pretty sure we're already in right now, even though it's only April, this starts to matter. These plants that cannot reach the groundwater, they'll start to wither. They'll start to wilt. They'll start to change from that nice green wet color and into this golden, crunchy, flammable state. And that is stressful, and we don't like to see that. And so this is what I think is happening for how beavers can buffer drought. I think that it's, you know, this incredible storage of water in the pond itself, but also in the soils. But it's one thing to think it and to talk about it, to be like, this is what beavers do. It's another to actually prove it. So I'm going to show you just a little bit of data from a study I did on beavers in Northeast Nevada. Um, in a very dry place. Uh, they have seasonal droughts so every summertime, very little precipitation, much like places here. But then also I looked during a multi-year drought. So when there was about three years in a row, hardly any precipitation at all, like continuous lack of precipitation. The creeks that I looked at are called Susie and Maggie Creek. If you're part of the restoration community, you may have heard some of these uh, creek names before. They're somewhat of a famous restoration example at this point. Uh, Maggie Creek and Susie Creek both have a lot of beavers on them. And those beavers, there's pockets of the creek that have a lot of beavers, there's pockets of the creeks that don't have a lot of beavers. And these two creeks, they're separated by some sparsely vegetated hill slopes. Now these hill slopes are totally rain dependent. They need precipitation to be green, their plant roots do not reach the water table. And so when it's rainy, the hills are green. And as soon as the rain is gone, these hills go golden. We've got some irrigated alfalfa down here. So Humans are also little irrigators. We also run our own drip lines throughout the landscape. And I think that looking at this irrigated alfalfa is like a good comparison point. We know that we can irrigate the landscape well. We've got hundreds of years, probably thousands of years of irrigation experience under our belts. We've been fine tuning this with our big smart brains and our excellent engineering. Uh, so I wanted to see how does this beaver irrigation that I've hypothesized compare to this actual irrigation that's happening on these alfalfa fields. So I'm showing you now is a plot of evapotranspiration. And this is just how much water is being used in the landscape, how much water is being cycled back to the atmosphere through either evaporation or transpiration. Now, transpiration, that's the plants doing photosynthesis. That's them cycling the water through their tissues. Evaporation, I mean, that, that could be just evaporation off of a pond. That could be evaporation off of concrete. Uh, if you got a puddle on concrete, you're going to see a really high ET signal. Uh, so just having high evapotranspiration does not mean that this is a really healthy, well-irrigated riparian zone. To be sure that what I'm seeing when I look at this water use when I, I think what I'm seeing is plants being productive. To be super sure of that, I also looked at the NDVI, which is the plant greenness. So by looking at how much water is being cycled in this landscape, and by looking at how green the plants are in this landscape, what I can tell is that this water use signal that I'm seeing, that is definitely going to be coming from plant productivity if the patterns are similar, which they were. So down here in this alfalfa field, super blue on our evapotranspiration plot, which means it was really high water usage. Um, lots of water cycling through those plants. They're super happy doing their photosynthesis. And they were also very, very green over here. And the same thing's true up here in Maggie Creek. You can see that we've got these bright blue spots that are also corresponding to bright blue spots over here. So there's a lot of plants that are very green and using lots of water. They're very happy. They're doing all their photosynthesis. No water stress to be found. Now, to put that into the context of the landscape, what I'm showing you is year after year, the arcs that we should see in evapotranspiration. So if you are well watered, perfect landscape, the maximum evapotranspiration, the maximum water cycling that you would see, I've shown to you in gray. In green is the human irrigated alfalfa. So this is us trying to maximize the plant health. We're trying to maximize the productivity of all of those little alfalfas. Beneath that in blue, that's the beaver dammed areas. And then beneath that in yellow is the sections of creek that don't have beavers. And then beneath that in red are those hydrologically disconnected hill slopes. And you can see both in shape and in magnitude, the modeled water usage 
the human irrigated alfalfa and the beaver dammed areas have a lot of similarities. They're all relatively higher. They all have the same pretty classic arc shape, which you would expect given the sunlight in the area over the course of the year. And that's year after year. It doesn't matter if we're in a drought year or a normal year, same arc, same magnitude. Uh, they definitely look like a managed landscape. Down in the riparian area without beavers though, it doesn't have the same shape and it definitely doesn't have the same magnitude. It monotonously decreases. So as soon as we get out of that rainy period and into the summer, these plants wither. They turn crunchy, they shut down year after year after year. And then once we're back into this normal wetter period, there's a little bit of a rebound, but it's not that much. And that's because when you've water stressed your landscape three years in a row, some of these plants truly die. They don't just shut down for the season, like they're done. And that's not a good thing. But what was a good thing was that these beavers were a close second to us at managing the plant irrigation and they are doing it for free. They're out there digging these canals and building these ponds and watering the plants without anybody asking them to. It's just what they do to create their habitat. So your take home messages on beavers and droughts is that overall, the streams with beavers have more pl plant productivity. They're not sensitive to long-term droughts. They're not sensitive to short-term droughts. And they look really similar to when we irrigate plants. And so the irrigation that we've spent, who knows how many dollars and hours figuring out how to do perfectly, the beavers are already doing it out there in the landscape. And that's not true in the stream without beavers. The streams without beavers are acting more like the hill slopes that are totally disconnected from the groundwater system. And to be honest, most of them shouldn't be acting that way. Most of the streams that we have should have some greenness, even during dry periods, they shouldn't totally shut down. We've seen the river bottoms burning in parts of California year after year. And that's not really the place you'd expect a fire to be in the river bottom. That's where you'd expect water to be. So I want you to think back to the conceptual model for just a second and ask yourself, hmm, so if this is happening in droughts and these beaver ponds are staying greener and lusher and wetter and the places without beavers are kind of drying up and getting a little crinkly, what happens if there's one careless match? Uh, or since it's California, you know, what happens if there's one careless power line? Uh, what if there's an ignition event? What happens when you have something that could start a fire land in these two landscapes? And so again, I want to start off with a conceptual model to show you how I'm thinking about this. We've got that one careless match power line <clears throat> landing in the landscape and trying to start a fire. And when you have dry vegetation, that's flammable, that's going to burn. When you have wet vegetation, it's not as energetically favorable to burn that. This isn't the beaver is trying to do some impressive magic or really working, putting on their little firefighting outfits and going to going to town on this. This is just that water doesn't burn. It's physics. And in the landscapes without beavers, we've got lots of plants that are thriving when we have rainfall. And then as soon as the rainfall stops, all of those plants turn to fuel. They turn really flammable. But the plants in the beaver dammed area, I don't think they ever reach that really flammable fuel state. Now, I like this kind of conceptual model because it, it jives with my brain. Uh, but when I was trying to explain this to people for a while, I was having a hard time finding the right words. And so instead of telling my conceptual model with diagrams uh, or with words, I decided to tell it with felt. Uh, and so this is another way to envision that process I just described. He's okay, you made it, right? This is great. This is exactly what I was showing you with those diagrams, except now I'm showing it to you with felt and a cork board and some chopped up construction paper. And so I imagine this is happening and I've got this conceptual model, but I wanted to make sure that this is something that actually could happen like in real life science, not on my felt board. And I saw this photo that was posted by Dr. Joe Wheaton from Utah State University, who's gonna be speaking to you later today. And it was incredible. 
we've got this landscape that's up in the Sharps Fire area in Idaho, and it is primarily charcoal. Like it's super, super burned. The fire ripped through this area, had no problem burning most of the vegetation, except this patch right here that's super green, super wet, super lush, super full of beavers. And uh, as Dr. Wheaton said, it turns out that water doesn't burn, right? Surprise. So this at least happens sometimes, which is great because the worst thing is starting a science project and then realizing that there's no feasible way this could actually happen. Uh, but this does happen. What I wasn't sure of was, is this just a lucky fluke? Like these beavers made it and it was some wonderful combination of the landscape shape and the rainfall and everything, or was this because there were beavers there? So to answer that question, I dug deeper into a number of different fires throughout the American West. And I wrote a paper on it called Smokey the Beaver, uh, which you can read for free online. It's a fun paper. And that's really what I wanted to do is I wanted to show that this beaver activity repeatedly can create fire refugia during fire, uh, not just in a one-off kind of a situation. So I looked at five different fires in five different states. And at the time, I thought these were really big fires. I no longer feel like these are really big fires, unfortunately. Um, but they were ranging from about 21,000 acres to 395,000 acres. And what they had in common was that there were a lot of beavers within the fire perimeters. Uh, the fires were pretty big, relatively high intensity for most of them. And it had some really high quality satellite imagery. And I used that satellite imagery to look before, during, and after the fires and see how the places that had beavers versus the places that did not have beavers responded to the fire. I'm going to show you some data from the California Manta fire because we're here in California. Uh, it was up in the Domeland Wilderness, part of Sequoia National Forest, and burned in the summer of 2000, and the area was about 79,000 acres. There's been beavers here for decades. There's still beavers here today. Uh, this satellite picture up here in this top right corner, this is one of the most impressive complexes I've seen. There's about 15 different beaver it's just in this small area. This lodge is 60 feet across, uh, which with California housing prices, that's at least a million dollar lodge right there. So really impressive landscape, tons of modification by the beavers. And I was super into this study, but I also like to keep it grounded in the human side of things because these wildfires are scary events. So this quote from the LA Times says that it is a humbling expression of nature, walls of flame 70 feet high, twice as high as the nearest tree, leaping through canyons and valleys, at times in five directions at once, left behind, quite literally, is scorched earth. So that was scary, but science must go on. What I did was I imagined that you were walking up each creek in my study area, and as you walk, you stay close to the river, and you're taking note of how green the plants are as you go, and you do this before, during, and after the fire. That's what I did, except instead of walking these creeks, I use satellites to extract that plant greenness data from the whole river profile in every creek in my study areas for all five fires. And I saw something like this. Now on this plot, if it's a higher value, that means we have more green plants. If it's a lower value, that means we have less green plants. And we're looking down the river corridor. This dashed yellow line indicates the minimum greenness I would expect from a healthy riparian zone. The green curves in the back, that is the before the fire and after the fire year. And then this reddish curve, that is during the fire. Marked in X or marked in black boxes on the X axis are beaver dams. And you can see as soon as we get out of this beaver dammed area, during the fire, there is a huge reduction in plant greenness. And to make that reduction more clear, I've taken the difference between the before and after and the during fire data and now what I'm showing you, if it's a higher value, it was more affected by the wildfire. And in the black boxes here, you can see it's not a huge effect when we're in that beaver dammed area. The wildfire didn't really affect those plants that much. But then as soon as we got out, it was huge. We're seeing massive changes in plant greenness. And that is probably because they're burning. Um, they're not burning where we have these beaver dams, but they're for sure burning where we don't, just like we saw in Dr. Wheaton's picture, just like we saw in the conceptual model. And what I saw in my study ultimately was that beavers are repeatedly creating these refugia during fire. Here we've got a picture from the Manter fire, a creek without beavers, a creek with beavers. Uh, this tree was consumed by those 70 foot walls of flame. This scorched earth is where the soil was literally burning until it got into the beaver dammed area and no longer was able to burn the wet soil and the wet plants. 
And here's the beaver dam for you right there. Now I want you to keep this little rock outcrop in mind because I'm going to show you this picture again, but from a different angle. Uh, oh, and before I do that, though, the, the numbers, right, the, the number everybody wants. Beaver dammed areas were three times more protected from wildfire than areas without beaver. So threefold difference. The beavers were doing a huge amount of firefighting work in this landscape. And that is abundantly clear. You can see the beaver dam here again. Here's that rock outcrop I pointed out to you that's over in this side. So we've sort of flipped perspectives. You can see the burned trees. You can see the hill slopes that are scorched. You can see this incredible amount of burning. And you can see this portion of the landscape that looks totally unaffected. And you can see this beaver dam. So here's another view of it again. We've got that rock outcrop. Our beaver dam's now further in the foreground, burning up there, burnt trees, nice and crispy. Lots of greenery and something hunkering down in that greenery. Something is there. Is it trash? Is it a beaver? Like, what's going on here? Uh, I wish I was the one actually posing these questions. These are from a helicopter flight from the uh, burned area emergency response team. But it's impressive. And now in this photo, you can't even tell there was a wildfire here. Like this just looks like a helicopter photo of a river. But this is from that burned landscape. It's just not burned in the beaver wetland. And there's animals hunkering down in this area, taking refuge from this fire. We've got a black bear hiding here. Maybe he was not able to outrun those flames. Uh, maybe there's fish, maybe there's frogs, maybe there's birds. But whatever it is, it looks to me like Smokey Bear got a little helping hand here from Smokey the Beaver. And so your take homes on fire then are that there's that three times more protection when you have beavers in the riparian zone than when you don't when it comes to wildfire damage. We've seen these green patches from aerial images, from satellite data. This happened in all sorts of different climates and landscapes and land covers and antecedent conditions. There's potential for these green patches to be preserving native plants, to be providing refuge for all sorts of flora and fauna. And there's potential for them to attenuate those post-fire peak flows. So we've come full circle back to filling that sponge back up again after the fire with more water. The opposite is true again in the stream without beavers. Much more burning, uh, a lot faster rate of spread. We've got the potential for invasive plants to recolonize these heavily burned sites. Uh, and a lot of times there's mudsliding or big rainfall induced flooding afterwards. And so your final summary, your take home message in my last couple of minutes here. These beavers are creating and maintaining incredibly resilient landscapes. They keep the plants green. They're doing an enormous amount of work routing the water throughout the landscape, keeping everything well watered and happy and healthy. And if you're not motivated by the beavers themselves, maybe you're motivated by dollars. Uh, this is a wonderful paper that just came out this past year that put a dollar amount on how much work beavers are doing for us in ecosystem services. And it's a lot. If you have one square kilometer of riparian zone with beavers, those beavers are doing up to $69,000 worth of ecosystem services per year. And 12,500 of that is an extreme event moderation alone. For some perspective, in 2002, there was an estimate that California had 1,450 square kilometers of active riparian zone. That's $100 million of ecosystem services on the table with 18 million in fire moderation if we fill it with beavers. And also remember, these beavers can make more riparian area too. So if you can't get enough beavers in fire, if you're like, this 30 minutes wasn't enough, give me more, uh, keep your eye out. My research team is doing some really cool projects this year uh, on beavers and fire. And if you want to work with us or share data with us, definitely send me an email. I've got it on this slide. You can also just Google my name and find it pretty easily. And there's also some really incredible beaver storytellers out there. Sarah Kernersberg, who uh, made the amazing film Beaver Believers, is just starting to work on another film that may have some beaver and fire aspects in it. And then there's all these organizations that I'm showing you the logos for down here that are just doing an incredible job of bringing beaver science to people, and that includes beavers and fire. So definitely reach out to them and keep them in mind. And at the end, during the Q&A this afternoon, I am more than happy to answer your questions. If we don't get to them this afternoon, you can definitely hit me up on my Twitter. I tweet about beavers constantly. Woo-wee. <clears throat> wow, Emily, that was amazing. Bertha and Benny are right here. Yay. So fun. They're so happy. Are you so happy? We love you. We love our bears when they come to visit us when the fire is happening. Okie doke, we are going to transition, all three of us, 
over to none other than Nina Hemphill, who I'm happy to, we're happy that she's here with us today. And um, over the years, Kate and I've had the blessing of working with Nina when she was at the Forest Service. And now that she's moved over to the Bureau of Land Management, we're very excited and we wanna hear a lot more from her about basically, she's gonna to talk to us about BDAs and restoring small meadows with beavers. So without further ado, hello, Nina. Can you hear me now? And then could you send that link again or am I on here now? You're mm. on. Hmm? We hear you, I see you. Okay, and then um, uh, th can you see this now? Uh oh. Uh, no. Just a minute. Uh, let me end this. Yeah, I I think you. Uh, my training did not help me get the right um, uh, message that says exact as presenter. So if that could be sent again. Yeah. Jackie can. Yeah, send Jackie. That. You should have your availability to share your screen. Oh, share screen. Okay, there we go. There we go. Um, okay, there we go. And let's make it into a... Um, slideshow. This is in the way, so let me get rid of that. Um, there we go. Okay. Um, one of the things I was going to talk about today was that um, Bureau of Land Management uh, has a lot of lands in California, but they're scattered all over the place, and they're little parcels in many places. And so we oftentimes have to work with the Forest Service or Cal Fish and Wildlife or ranchers or private landowners throughout the state to get any sort of uh, restoration work or any kind of uh, um, protection of the habitat or conservation measures taken across a, a larger landscape. So there's um, a challenge to say the least. Um, the majority of the lands we have are down in the desert. They're, they're um, within the Sonoran and the Mojave deserts. Um, we have uh, reports of beaver down in the Mojave River. Uh, whether or not they're in sections that BLM operates, I don't know, but we have a lot of fishes down in that area that it would not surprise me if beaver had not been in those areas. Um, and then we have a lot of lands up in Northeastern California, really going into the Great Basin. And we do manage part of Nevada, the part of the Great Basin in Northern Nevada. Um, and there are um, areas there that have quite a lot of water coming out of the mountains. Um, but uh, I'm not certain, I have not had good reports from folks that are in those areas of there being a lot of beaver in those areas. And it would not surprise me uh, because of the happiness with guns that a lot of those things were not hunted out a hundred years ago. One of the things that folks who work for the BLM love to say is, oh, we got all the lands no one else wanted. So BLM was given all the tailings piles on the Trinity River. They were given all the lands that had all the soils eroded on the uh, Clear Creek down in uh, the Redding area. And so they say that they were given the lands that were just beaten to death or in the desert that no one wanted. And what's very, very interesting today is that these lands have become much more valuable for recreation purposes, for fishing, for hunting. Um, and then what's ubiquitous is uh, OHV use. So we, we have, and we're a multiple use agency like the Forest Service is. Um, so we have a lot of different uh, background of degradation of the habitat throughout the BLM lands. Um, first of all, I this is not really a small scale meadow restoration, but this is a use um, by the Trinity River Restoration Program and by um, 
the Bureau of Reclamation and by some of our the tribal partners like the Yurok tribe to overcome some of the problems that came about in Clear Creek um, because Whiskey Town Dam was built um, and there was a huge, you can see that Kennedy came, huge delight in the fact that this dam was built um, for water purposes. Um, and as you can see, uh, Clear Creek in the area that BLM currently owns has had a lot of the soils taken away. Uh, they have been adding gravel through the years into Clear Creek to try and provide more uh, spawning habitat for uh, Chinook and Steelhead that lost habitat in these areas, not just because of the dam which held back um, gravels, but also because of the um, sluice mining in the area and the placer mining that occurred lower down in elevation. And so um, what we wound up with were these lands that had disconnected floodplains. Um, the elevation of the rivers had been changed. And so there was a disconnection to smaller streams that are often perched above the, the main channel and drop precipitously down into the river. And, and so we really have a lot of issues, if you will, with places where you might have beaver, you might have had um, uh, spring chinook spawning, uh, going up into small tributaries and spawning. Uh, but a lot of that opportunity was lost um, after a, all this mining occurred in this area. And, and while a lot of gravel was added into Clear Creek as a means to get more spawning, um, they didn't really have a lot of juvenile rearing habitat. And so there have been all these proposals for building side channels, reintroducing sinuosity to uh, the primary channel on Clear Creek and um, creating wetlands uh, because there are frogs in these areas and there are a lot of other uh, listed species or uh, state uh, listed species in these areas that are quite important, aquatic species that are quite important. And so this is what the um, Yurok tribe and in cooperation with Bureau of Reclamation and a lot of other partners did on BLM lands. They took this construct of a, of a BDA and they closed off what used to be the primary channel and turned it into a kind of a sluggish backwater. Um, and they put in a couple of these BDAs in order to slow the flow of water. They didn't want to eliminate the flow of water. They just wanted to slow the flow of water. And these backwater areas are actually really good for fishes. They're good for fishes during higher flows. They're good for a lot of different species that depend on these backwater habitats um, in, in streams. So the Trinity River, uh, which is uh, up in the um, near Weaverville is really similar to Clear Creek, except that they also added in a hatchery. And you can see that this is a very straight channel. They just linearize the stream to shoot the water from the, this is from Lewiston Dam, but it is uh, the, uh, um, this is Trinity Dam. Trinity Dam sends the water down into Lewiston. Lewiston sends half that water down to the Sacramento River, and then the other half comes down in this much smaller river on the Trinity. So they built a hatchery to make up for the hundred and odd miles of really good habitat that would have had a lot of beaver and a lot of ponds and pools for coho, spring schnook, steelhead, and other anadromous uh, fishes to be able to um, have good habitat despite um, you know, the cold and despite the floods that came through these areas, uh, they would have had a tremendous amount of habitat present in these areas. Um, so the river uh, was lost, 100 miles of river was lost. A lot of habitat for juveniles that depended on these uh, backwater areas and slow flowing areas 
for their habitat was lost. Um, the river was locked into place and uh, uh, people loved the river. It had alders all along it that were turning senescent 10 years ago, but that was their idea of a beautiful river was this placid, never changing, always static river system. So on, on BLM lands then, we have this um, area, and I used to live right up the hill here, so I love this area, which is why I picked it. Um, we have the bucktail in it, so it had a river access here. This is Lewiston Road, and, and it had a river access. But what uh, the design change was going to be in this area was a creation of wetlands in this area and uh, a new river access for um, fishermen and boaters to come in and use uh, for access to the Trinity River. There were a lot of other features being put in these side channels were, were supposed to be open. They were um, trying to make uh, more juvenile habitat in this area because that's one of the things limiting fishes. Um, and a lot of the streams that come into this area would have had beaver in them for coho and, uh, but uh, to my knowledge, I never really saw places that had a lot of beaver in when I was looking at a lot of these streams. But there are also people in some of these areas and I'm absolutely certain they removed them um, because they were uh, interfering with their uses of the river and the springs and the streams. Um, so again, this is an area that, uh, and a wetland that was created for wetland frogs. There are uh, foothill yellow-legged frogs and there are other frog species, native frog species, not just uh, Pseudochris, but other um, native uh, frogs in this area. This, this wetland area that was created is also when the river rises habitat for young salmonids that can come in and out of these areas as the river rises um, in the spring. Um, and it's all artificially managed, but it does rise up to sometimes 13,000 CFS. And as you move further downstream, a lot more flows come in. Um, and you can see it's a highly engineered area with a highly engineered um, BDA. So these are very, very highly engineered, but the, the purpose of them really is still to restore ha wetland habitat um, for a variety of different native uh, aquatic species. So now I'm going to switch to the Northern Great Basin. So this is looking out at a, um, you know, a checkerboard of BLM habitats in, in the Northern California area. Um, and it's looking out into lands that extend into Nevada. Um, it's looking down at a dry lake that's that whole lake is uh, uh, part of a spring system and it's a lot of these lakes that are in these areas are inland lakes and they are terminal lakes um, but that does not mean that we don't have uh, lovely meadow systems or systems that could have been meadows uh, leading down into these valley bottoms um, so this is an example that is, it's Fitzhugh Meadow. It's, it's up on Applegate, which is up in the sort of the tablelands near the volcanic uh, volcanoes that are up there. And a lot of water is present in this area. This was done with cow trout. Um, and it was uh, done very similarly to an assessment that was done on the sequoia. So they, they really um, were able to, uh, gather a lot of information on a, about 35 or meadows and then chose about five meadows to actually restore. So this, this meadow is on and off of uh, BLM lands. It's owned by ranchers or by the state of California and by BLM. And so what I'm gonna focus on is the work that was done by and on BLM lands as part of this overall restoration of this uh, meadow and according to this plan. And uh, I believe this was designed by Todd Sloat. I had the pleasure of working with him on meadow restoration. 
down on the Sequoia and he's a fabulous uh, person to work with. So um, these BDAs, um, this series, this is one of them, uh, was built, um, this is approximately one year later. Uh, this is looking at higher water where the BDA is backing water up across this landscape and, and, and across here where it used to be previously dry. So it's really initially, um, and remember it is in this kind of flat meadow area, but it does get floods in it. So this is the first year looking at this area and it is beginning to flood out. It's beginning to create willows. We get um, a lot more willows growing in these areas. A lot more areas are flooding, the streams spreading out. You can see from this diagram that deeper pools are being formed in this, this meadow area um, and that the water is also spreading out into these uh, areas into the meadow, creating more wetland habitat for uh, species that normally would occur in these areas. One of the things that I wanted to um, really uh, point out was that we have, um, we've got a lot of uh, uh, beaver down in the valley and also in places where we have um, nice uh, portions of the mother load and uh, down in the uh, San Joaquin, but up in the foothills. We also have a lot of areas that are in the foothills um, along the uh, western side of the Sierra Nevada. And so we have areas that could have, and do indeed have beaver. And I was searching through the, um, Flickr photos that BLM maintains. And I came across this photo and it was a hilarious um, uh, description for this particular photo. It said this was rodents that had built this fire refuge. And this was a fire refuge that they had used during the car fire. And then it was actually these, these rodents that had built it. <laughs> Well, okay, so this is a beaver dam, and this was an area that stayed green and wet during the car fire, and the firefighters used it as a fire shelter uh, to rest uh, as, as part of their firefighting. So I found, found that to be really quite remarkable, and it certainly meshes with what um, uh, Emily was talking about earlier and what various folks of learning about uh, the importance of beaver across the landscape is that they really are great for maintaining good water supplies and good uh, riparian areas and protecting them from wildfire. So I, I just thought that was uh, very, very interesting. I hadn't really um, uh, thought about it. So just to sum up very quickly, um, on the eastern side of the Sierra, because that was on the western side of the Sierra, and we know that we have uh, beaver up and down the foothills and in, in the Sierra Nevada. Um, on the eastern side of the Sierra Nevada, there are a lot of streams that flow out into these drier areas. They, they flow out into sage grouse and they flow out into other areas, and they really are potential habitat for beaver. As you can see, here's Susanville, which is the Eagle Lake office. There are a lot of dry areas in here, but you can see these ribbons all over here, these ribbons of green, which are perfect places to build dams. And this uh, field office is going to start building BDAs across their field office in places that they believe um, they can uh, benefit uh, the um, riparian vegetation and benefit rare plants and other species. So uh, I, I don't know how I'm doing on time, um, but uh, that's pretty much wraps up my talk. I was just going to say, yes, there are plenty of beaver on the eastern side of the Sierra Nevada. And uh, um, that's the end of the 
talk for me. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you, Nina. That's perfect. You're so right. do I say stop share? Yes. Yep, you okay. can go ahead and do that. Wow. Thank you, Nina. That was amazing. And um, <laughs> we're so Such happy funny little creatures. Today. The BLM needs you even even though the Forest Service has a lot more land in the state and, pro and produces more water, the BLM, as you noted, has plenty of really critical beaver habitat, especially in that sagebrush zone where the sage grouse needs some help. So thank you for yeah. that. And we are now gonna scoot and get a little bit more coastal focused over with Bob Pagliuco of NOAA and talk about uh, beavers BDAs and coho salmon recovery. So without further ado, welcome, Bob. Thanks, Brock. Can you hear me? Yep, I hear you. All right. We hear so you. I'm Bob Pagliuco. I'm lucky enough to work for the NOAA Restoration Center as a habitat restoration specialist out of Arcata. And today I'm going to talk a little bit about beavers, BDAs, and coho salmon recovery because they go hand in hand. Uh, I saw we had a really large and diverse audience. Someone is from the north of Iran. So I was going to uh, go through a little bit of the salmon life cycle and kind of what they need throughout the watershed in their life cycle. So up at the top there, this little ball of eggs there, they start in the gravel nest. They pop out as albins. They uh, end up spending about a year in the ocean as little fry. They head on down to the estuary to get ready to go out into the big old ocean. They spend anywhere from six months to a year or two out in the ocean. They come back to that stream and then they they complete the cycle and spawn and die. <clears throat> so in the watershed, uh, they typically like to spawn like up in the headwaters or up in the tributaries. Um, and when those fry emerge, they typically stick around uh, where they were spawned. Um, some of them move down the main stem and, and go to other tributaries, but they pretty much hang out pretty close to where they were born. Uh, and then they head on down the ocean uh, in the estuary, get ready for uh, smultification. Um, but what what I'm going to talk about today is kind of what they do in the winter time and kind of what their needs are. A lot of the um, the rivers up here get pretty crazy and turbid and turbulent and very high velocities, and it's really hard for a co salmon to kind of you know eke out a living while they're expending all that energy. So oftentimes these fish they move down to the lower reaches and lower tributaries to look for that slow water. So they don't have to expend all that energy to uh, to get big. And just a reminder, um, you know, it takes a basin to raise a fish. So that's definitely a key takeaway here. Um, like many of the flat areas in the world, California is no different. Um, that's where people like to build their houses and their cities and put their farms. Um, unfortunately, they've uh, humans have manipulated the streams so that that slow water uh, is pretty much lacking across the range of the coho. Uh, you get these straightened channels, and when the winter flows come down there, it's like a bowling alley, and uh, you don't really get that slow water. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about coho recovery. So uh, SONC coho recovery in particular, SONC stands for Southern Oregon, Northern California Coastal Coho. And this graph over here on the right shows uh, Benbow fish counts on the South Fork of the Eel River from 38 to about 1975. And you can see the precipitous decline in populations. So the feds took note and they put them under the Endangered Species Act in 1997 as threatened. Uh, and we developed a coho recovery plan. You can see this map over here on the left. The pink shows a uh, very high extinction risk. And then the yellow shows moderate extinction risk. You can see that these fish in the sunk are not doing so well. Um, I'm going to kind of hone in on a river that I, I frequent often and like to work on the Scott River and focus on some of the stresses and threats that we identified in the recovery plan. Uh, that box up on the left stresses our altered hydrologic function, riparian forest condition degradation and impaired water quality. And then if you look at the threats in the bottom right, you could see ag practices, dams, diversions, and then channelization and diking. If you look at that picture in the top right, that's just a snapshot of a five mile long tailings pile on the Scott River, main stem of the Scott. And uh, the Scott used to have the ability for that river to move 
back and forth that east and west um those in between those east and west roads you see there but now it's just stuck up against the eastern wall and slow water is kind of hard to find nowadays so um our recovery actions that came out of that is a, lead, a need for more slow water habitat. And you can see some of the highest priority actions, increase beaver abundance, construct off channel ponds, restore natural chan, channel form and function. It all points to slow water. So um, that's definitely a problem in the Scott and for many of the populations in California. And a cool little fun fact is that beavers mentioned 395 times in the Sankoa recovery plan. And there's a good reason for that. Um, I snagged this map here from a friend of mine, Eli Sarian from Riverbend Sciences. He uh, put together a publication in two, uh, 2013. And you could see uh, how beaver habitat, well, this is current beaver distribution. Uh, we heard from Rick on Wednesday how that's been expanded. Uh, but this is exactly, you know, what has um, basically what is in place for 2013, what, what Eli found. But these coho need uh, slow water, and this is where the beaver are found as well. They love the low gradients, the slow water, the swampy habitat. And once again, you've heard this before, you're going to hear it again. Beaver taught coho how to jump. So um, there's lots of benefits of beavers and BDAs. Um, they remediate channel incision, reconnect the floodplains, which in turn uh, recharges the groundwater. The riparian habitat, as you saw from the previous presentations, starts to flourish. And then again, there's that slow water for both the summer and the winter rearing uh, habitat. Encourages beavers, traps sediment and nutrients. Uh, the food sources improve in these habitats and they're cheap. Uh, the BDA structures are two to $4,000 a piece. They can be even cheaper. And then uh, from Kevin Swift's uh, presentation over on Wednesday, we heard that it was 65 cents an acre if you use actual beavers instead of BDAs. And then we just heard from Emily that there's $100 million worth of ecosystem services out there if you use beavers. So uh, it's a really economical way to get like a large bang for your buck when doing coho restoration. So if you didn't believe me that coho loves slow water, I'm gonna show you a little bit of data. The picture up on the right is not a beaver pond, but it's an off-channel pond that we funded uh, and constructed by the Yurok tribe uh, with Recovery Act funding back in 2009. And uh, the picture of those fish are the coho that came out of that pond. And uh, the Yurok tribe and, and us, we compared some of the growth rates of uh, fish in this pond to an adjacent riverine environment where they didn't necessarily have slow water and freshwater creek. And you could see uh, those red bars to the left show uh, significant um, growth rates compared to, you know, some of the other growth rates found in the adjacent riverine environments. And then this table on the right, I've been kind of keeping track of other pond and slow water habitats and growth rates that we have measured and compared them to stream growth rates at the same time period. And you can see those are significantly uh, greater as well. So these, uh, these fish are growing fast and bigger. And the name of the game for ocean survival is the bigger you are when you hit the ocean, the better your chances of survival. So uh, these slow water habitats are growing the next generation. BDAs might not be a, a good fit everywhere. Um, they could potentially present passage issues, um, specifically in regulated rivers that don't have flushing flows or a natural hydrograph. Uh, there could be infrastructure or culvert issues. We heard a little bit uh, about some solutions to that from Mike Callahan on um, Wednesday. You could see that trapezoidal fence or the beaver deceiver that can help manage some of those areas where there are conflicts. And they don't typically uh, you know, um, do well in steep stream gradients, but there's a, a couple tools that we use to try to figure out where to put these things on the landscape. One is the BRAT or the beaver restoration assessment tool. And another one is uh, the caster model. The California Assessment Tool Optimizing Restoration. So, they're, uh, they're, you know, you can't put these things everywhere, but there's definitely a lot of tools out there that we can use to kind of figure out the best place to, to put BDAs or uh, introduce beaver. So, how we've been involved in BDAs, I was lucky enough to sit on the funding panel to uh, essentially develop the monitoring framework and fund the first uh, BDA in California on the Scott River. I think Betsy and Sharna might talk a little bit about that later on. 
uh, working with watershed groups and tribes to develop monitoring plans and other strategies to get these on the ground. And then uh, another really cool forum we put together was the BDA Tech Team. Um, and that's a forum to uh, essentially discuss concerns associated with permitting BDAs. When these things start showing up on the landscape, everyone was kind of scratching their heads. And there was concerns with uh, passage and water temperatures and groundwater recharge and uh, issues with potential uh, landowners. So we had this, this forum, about 45 members. You could see that acronym SOUP over there, a lot of state and federal agencies. We also um, are working across state lines with Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. They have a little bit of experience. We develop permitting and monitoring subgroups to address issues as they arise. But one of the coolest things of this group is that we were able to kind of keep track of BDA projects in California and then also learn from them all and then use that knowledge to kind of further, um, you know, uh, our body of knowledge for practitioners and, and regulators and funders and share some of, uh, some of that data. So I'm gonna take you on a little tour of some of the BDAs in California that we had talked about. Um, this one on the left is Audrain Meadows up in American River. This picture in the top right is probably one of my favorite pictures of a BDA because you could see what Emily had described in the background that uh, crunchy and flammable, dry, arid uh, landscape. Uh, in the background, and then this beautiful, lush, green wetland complex created by uh, Damien Ciotti's team um, uh, over there on the on the Feather River on Doty Ravine that created this great habitat, this fireproof area, and all they had to do was throw some BDAs in there and then get the rancher to stop uh, killing and trapping the beavers. So this is one of my favorite pictures of kind of the benefits of, of beavers and BDAs. This one on the bottom here is McGarvey Creek, done by the Yurok tribe in Lower Klamath. They're expanding that work. They've done it on West Fork McGarvey, and they're doing some more up there. Um, and Nina had just spoke about um, bucktail and um, on the Trinity River. This is a really cool project, and you can't really see it in that photo on the left, so I blew it up on the right, but that is a Chinook salmon jumping over the BDA. So you didn't believe us, but beaver taught salmon how to jump. Um, on the bottom left there, there's Boise Creek. That's done on Forest Service land and private land uh, with the help of the mid Klamath Watershed Council. And then we also heard from uh, Karen on Wednesday about Child's Meadow. So uh, a lot of these things we're learning about and um, talking to some of the practitioners and just understanding uh, what these things can do and kind of the, some of the lessons learned from these processes. Um, and then, of course, uh, the Scott River BDAs, where these things first started getting kicked off in California back in, I think, 2013. Sugar Creek up on the top left. Miners Creek up on the top right. There's Rattlesnake Creek right there in the center. French Creek on a side channel right uh, after it was being built on the bottom left. And then there was a few uh, mainstem Scott River BDAs uh, that were put in as well. So a lot of work on the Scott River that we're learning about. Betsy and Sharna will likely talk about some of that. Um, so lessons learned thus far. Um, I could take a whole entire hour and talk about some of the things that we learned through uh, this tech team process and just exploring all the data that we have, have been pouring in. But I think I'm just gonna focus uh, for this talk just on one really cool passage experiment that um, happened on Sugar Creek on the Scott River. So this is a picture of all of the, um, the BDAs and you can see these little rectangles all over the place here. These are pit tag antennas and they're, uh, they're essentially a, um, a checkout counter if uh, and then you would put these little passive integrative transponders or pit tags in fish and those are the barcodes so when a fish swims through one of those things we could pick it up and there's several different pathways a, that a fish can actually use to get through around or over there's these weir flows over here there's this side channel over here um, so uh, NOAA along with the Scott River Watershed Council uh, worked together to develop this experiment. It kind of came as an idea out of the Beaver Dam Analog Tech team. 
they snagged about 200 fish, 156 coho, 40 steelhead uh, out of this feature, tagged them with these pit tags and put them in this pool right below um, all of these BDAs here. And just to see uh, how long it was going to take them to move, if they can get through these, which pathways they preferred. And uh, the results are in. 90%, 97% of the coho were detected upstream of the first BDA and 89 upstream of the second. So these fish weren't necessarily having a problem getting through up and around and over these things. Um, they also passed uh, through the side channel. And this side channel I pointed out earlier is over here. It's got a 10% grade. And then also some of these, uh, this is really interesting to us and kind of helped us um, in management and funding and permitting these things in the future. Um, they would jump 16 inches over these, over these uh, pathways here, uh, which was really cool. 60% of the fish use the side channel and 49% jumped over at least one of the BDAs. So that was one little tidbit of, of information um, that we learned through this process of collaboration and communication uh, amongst the agencies um, that are kind of working on these issues. So I talked about um, BDAs, which is in our recovery plan, but I didn't talk much about the introduction of beaver, which is also highlighted in our recovery plan. Uh, this flyer over here, many of you have probably seen it, but uh, this is produced by the Division of Fish and Game many years ago, and uh, it's promoting um, the idea of, of of essentially trapping beavers that are kind of uh, bothering agricultural lands or infrastructure and putting them up in uh, mountain meadows to store water for fish, wildlife and agriculture. So um, this happened between 1923 and 1949. And uh, right now though, current California law prevents the beaver from being reintroduced or relocated in California. You can see the fishing game code there uh, saying that it's unlawful to import, transport, possess, or release alive any wild animal without a special permit. But we can't get a special permit in California for, for these critters because beavers are considered uh, detrimental species. So right now, we definitely don't have an option of a uh, relocation or reintroduction uh, in California. I think uh, Kate might talk a little bit more about that later on today, but that's where we're at. So I'm gonna wrap it up here and uh, hit some of the highlights here. Coho, they need more slow water and they need more slow water now because of uh, their risk for extinction. And uh, beavers can play a really important role, you know, in, in preventing that extinction. You know, we can implement more BDAs in the appropriate areas using those tools that I mentioned, uh, Brat and Castor, trying to figure out where to put these things on the landscape. And we need to continue the monitoring uh, in order to prove the, um, the proof of concept and also get folks more comfortable with this type of restoration here. Um, another thing we could do is work with the states, remove some of the administrative barriers to relocation or reintroduction. Um, identify strategic watersheds to maybe have a pilot uh, reintroduction project and of course monitor the results. I mean, I think these are low risk projects. If something goes wrong, humans are really good at catching and trapping and killing beavers. So if something goes wrong, it's not like uh, we put a whole bunch of wood in the creek and you know it's gonna be really difficult to pull out you know two miles worth of wood. We can definitely relocate one of these beavers if, if something goes awry or or, or trap it or, or come up with some kind of a management solution like Mike Callahan was talking about on Wednesday. And we do have these huge landowners, BLM, uh, state and national parks, forest service, tribal lands and large timber companies uh, in the range of the Sunk Coho. They, they, a lot of them own entire watersheds, you know, where these things could occur. And um, on Wednesday, I saw a really cool link someone put in the chat for the, the state of Washington policy on beaver relocation and reintroduction. It was pretty straightforward and simple and made a lot of sense. You know, we could potentially use that as a model. But um, coho needs slow water and beaver can definitely help. Um, and that's the end of my presentation. I don't necessarily think we got time for questions, but I will be able to uh, potentially um, answer some questions in the chat or, and I'm gonna be sticking around as well um, for the panel, if you guys have any more questions. Great.
Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Bob. That was amazing. Love that. Um, and yes, people are definitely active on the Q&A and the chat. Jackie's catching those key questions. Thanks, Bob, for offering to stay around at the end. And that's when we'll do the Q&A. So that's all perfect. And love all of that. And I, and I love all of the, we especially love your last slide with all the ideas and the fact that one of those ideas you mentioned was talking about uh, working with timber companies. As you said, many timber companies own whole watersheds or at least significant portions of watersheds. And that's a perfect segue to turn this over to Bethany Johnson Howell, who's a wildlife biologist and works with Collins Pine and gonna talk about the relationship of beaver restoration and uh, managed timberlands and conservation. So without further ado, welcome Bethany. All right, thank you. Um, hello everyone, my name is Benny and I'm a wildlife biologist with Collins Pine Company. Um, I preface this talk with the fact that I'm not a beaver or restoration expert, but I do interact with a number of people who are. So in this talk, I'd like to give a landowner perspective of how beavers are helping us with restoration and conservation on our timberlands, but also how beavers are helping us achieve our overall land management goals and objectives in Northern California. So I first want to start off this talk acknowledging all the different partners we've been fortunate to work with. The work that's been done on our property has required a lot of different groups of people for each step along the way. To do the work we've done has required buy-off from the regulatory agencies. It's taken the help of nonprofits to pursue grants. It's taken the granting entities to believe in our projects and actually fund them. And then it's also taken the universities who are conducting research on these projects. So all of these partners have been instrumental to this work, and I am quite certain that there are partners that I'm even missing from this slide. So some quick background information. Collins Pine Company is a small family owned timber company with a relatively small land base in Northern California in the Lake Almanor Basin. We manage about 95,000 acres of Sierra mixed conifer timberlands in Plumas and Tehima County, which is shown in red on the map otherwise known as the Collins Almanor Forest. On the Almanor Forest, we use uneven age silvicultural methods, which results in a multi-layered canopy and complex stand structure across our ownership. We are also certified by the Forest Stewardship Council, or FSC, which promotes sustainable forest management. The Almanor Forest occurs at the headwaters of multiple major streams, including Mill Creek, Deer Creek and the North Fork of the Feather River, all of which ultimately drain into the Sacramento River. Embedded within our timberlands are a number of aquatic habitats, including riparian streams, springs, fens, wet and dry meadows, and aspen stands. Uh, Collins Pine Company takes a holistic approach to forest management, meaning that we believe in order to manage for a healthy forest, it requires the other habitats within the forest to also be healthy. And so about a year ago, um, sorry, about a decade ago, we began doing what most timber companies wouldn't, and we started doing habitat restoration projects. So pictured here are two of those sites. We began managing for encroaching conifers and dry meadows and aspen stands, which were small areas where we could easily mechanically treat under current regulatory restrictions. In basically all these areas, though, treating encroaching conifers wasn't really a solution to the problem. And we knew that these treatments were temporary fixes, and that in about 15 to 20 years, we'd likely have to retreat these same areas for the same problem. We also began to recognize a number of other problems and stressors on the property that were resulting in degraded and stressed ecosystems. So these included areas that were too wet for us to mechanically treat, but that weren't wet enough to keep encroaching conifers out. Fire has also been excluded from these areas, so the lodgepole weren't getting removed naturally by wildfires. Because these types of areas require hand treatments, which are very expensive, they typically don't receive treatment from us under our normal forest management. We also have meadows and streams which are experiencing incision, cattle grazing damage, and many of these streams are also structurally starved. This photo is from 2015 and conditions have only gotten worse at this meadow. 
We are, of course, seeing increased drought conditions in California. This picture is from early May of last year, and we all know that conditions are way worse moving into this year. And finally, increased drought, among other factors, has led to increased fire activity and increased fire severity. These are all really difficult problems to tackle, and they are all problems that our normal forest management activities can't fix alone, though I would like to note that some regulatory relief from CAL FIRE is helping with um, some of these problems. So in 2015, we acquired land management rights for Child's Meadow. Prior to us taking over management of the meadow, the Nature Conservancy was managing this meadow and was already implementing restoration activities, including the implementation of beaver dam analogs or BDAs. So this photo was taken by one of our partners and it was prior to those BDAs being installed. So when we got the property, we knew the upper part of the meadow, which is shown here, was in pretty bad shape. And so we were really excited that research and restoration improvements were already underway by many of the partners I showed at the beginning of this talk. We were able to go on site with these partners and get a crash course in management and restoration options, which were beyond what we had been doing internally as a company. And it also provided us the opportunity to talk to our partners about what we at Collins could do with Forest Health to help their restoration efforts. This was also when we got to understand the role of beavers on our property much better. So if you saw the talks on Wednesday, you got some of the background information on this area. Um, but this picture is also from Child's Meadow just downstream of the previous image. And so one of the big differences is simply that there are beavers present in this lower part of the meadow. And so when we acquired the land management rights for this property, we also began asking how can we improve habitat for special status species that occur in the area. Our primary species of interest were wet meadow dependent wildlife, including willow flycatcher, greater sandhill crane, and cascades frog. And while there is, of course, no one solution to all of these problems that I've already mentioned, we did quickly learn that there was a relatively simple and cheap solution that could help fix a lot of the problems. And this was beavers. And so it was really enlightening to us as land managers to see the stark contrast within this meadow complex and the difference the presence of beavers made. Through working with our partners, we've become more educated on beavers and how beavers can actually help us manage not only our meadows and stream systems better, but our timberlands as a whole. So I want to talk on some big picture examples of how beavers are benefiting our land management and overall environmental goals on the Almanor Forest. And all these examples, of course, can be applied to other areas as well. So first off, beavers for restoration. So I mentioned at the beginning that we were removing encroaching conifers from degraded areas. And while this was better than no treatment at all, letting um, no treatment at all or letting these areas become overgrown, it was really just a band-aid approach to a lot of these problems. We weren't fixing the problem, which was largely fire exclusion in those areas. But we also realized that in these areas where beaver could occur naturally, beavers could restore these areas for us. Um, it's a cheaper restoration tool, and it's definitely a longer term solution than what we were doing with just removing the encroaching conifers. In addition to considering where beavers could occur naturally or already did occur, We've also worked with our partners on using beaver dam analogs on the property in order to improve ecosystem function and also improve conditions for those special status species. So this photo is a BDA that was built in Child's Meadow and the portion I showed before that was highly degraded. In some areas such as Child's Meadow, beaver occur naturally adjacent to areas where these BDAs are being built. And we are hoping over time that these beaver populations will be able to expand into these areas and then take over these restoration efforts. Uh, beavers for, con for conservation. So I've already mentioned that we have numerous special status plant and wildlife species which occur on the Almanor forest. And many of these species are also dependent on healthy and functioning wet meadow systems. And so with increasing drought conditions, we are looking for creative solutions to help these species continue to persist on the property. 
We know that areas currently occupied with beavers provide excellent habitat for these species, and we are continuing to assess for areas where we can use BDAs to further increase habitat quality in areas currently not occupied by beaver. Cascades frog, pictured here, is a focal species that I study on the property. It's a species we are particularly interested in for using beaver restoration as a tool to improve and expand populations on the property. Cascades frog is being considered for, cons sorry, considered for federal ESA listing and is already a candidate species under the California Endangered Species Act. These frogs are literally disappearing before our eyes across the state, and we have a small window left to help the species persist here in California. Beavers are simply one tool that may make a huge difference for the species, particularly in light of these increased drought conditions that we're seeing. Beavers for forest health and resiliency. Um, beavers provide many ecosystem services, and while these benefits are easily observed within our aquatic areas, these ecosystem services also positively impact our adjacent forest lands. Healthy and resilient forests have been an increasing trend and focused in California, and beavers can certainly assist in this goal in many ways. We also view beaver occupied areas as being fire safe, meaning they are refugia for wildlife species during wildfires, as Emily mentioned in her talk at the start of today. But they also create defensible areas and provide safe points for firefighters in an emergency. Beavers for biodiversity. Biodiversity at beaver occupied areas was also discussed on Wednesday. Uh, beaver meadows create complex habitats. And again, these are areas that provide suitable habitat for numerous native plant and wildlife species beyond those that are listed as special status. And these areas also help create an overall healthier and functioning ecosystem. And finally, beavers for education and community outreach. In 2018, Point Blue partnered with Collins to do a straw program, which stands for Students and Teachers Restoring a Watershed. Elementary school kids grades first through sixth were bussed out to Child's Meadow over three days where they planted by themselves hundreds of willow clippings. Uh, this is an area where we have beavers downstream, but a lack of structure makes it difficult for the beavers to move upstream into this area. So over the last decade since we started doing restoration projects and over the last five years since we've gotten more involved with beaver, beavers, we've learned a lot and we've been able to do a lot, but we are not done yet. So what is next? Last fall, we started doing beaver activity surveys in areas where we knew we had beavers or in areas adjacent to beaver occupied areas. We plan to continue the survey effort across the property in order to identify where beaver dams are present, the failure rate of these dams, and also to find historical evidence of beavers in areas not currently occupied by beavers. All this information helps us assess restoration potential as well as helps us understand beaver populations overall on the property. We also hope to keep using beaver dam analogs as a restoration tool on the property, both to improve habitat quality, but also to encourage beavers to move into areas where they currently aren't occupying. Uh, again, this takes a village. This is not a solo act, and it takes a lot of the entities that I listed at the beginning of this talk in order to make these projects actually happen on the ground. Uh, I hope that there are CDFW folks listening in right now because this slide is really meant for you guys. The Amunor Forest is in a perfect area to allow beaver translocations, especially for moving nuisance beavers. We are extremely low risk in terms of infrastructure with high rewards due to our location in the headwaters of our state. If the state departments were to consider beaver translocations, our area would be a perfect trial and demonstration site. We are currently waiting to hear results from two grants for meadow restoration projects on our property, but if we can bring beavers onto the property in strategic locations, they can do most of that restoration work for us for way less money. And I'd like to add too that in terms of state regulatory barriers to restoration, 
Around 2011, the forest practice rules were amended to allow special forest management prescriptions in meadows, aspens, and wet areas. And I strongly believe that if Cal Fire can make a major change like this, I'm sure CDFW can too. This amendment to the California forest practice rules was a game changer for us and how we could manage the property. And because of it, we've been able to treat hundreds of acres of meadow and aspen area for forest health, but this simply isn't enough. We need to do more, we need to do better, and we need to be doing it now. Finally, we want to continue to improve our knowledge on beavers and using beavers for restoration and conservation on our timberlands. We want to be a part of the conversation and we want to be active in the beaver community. We want to be creative with helping finding solutions to the current problems and, and barriers and regulatory burdens do not scare us. As land managers, we have an obligation to the land that we manage, but we cannot do it alone. So I wanted to end with this picture as kind of a past and present comparison. There is a lot that we've learned so far about beavers in California, and there's a lot that's been done, but there's still a long ways to go. So I'm excited to see the advancements and next steps that California can take to continue its beaver momentum. Thank you. Yeehaw. That was great. Woo we are so with you on the low risk that you all have up there for reintroducing our kind. So we're going to get behind you on that one for sure. Thanks, Bethany. All righty. Now we are scooting right on over to California kid done good, although he had to go off to Utah to, you know, prove his mettle in the beaver world. But nonetheless, let's give it up for Mr. Joe Wheaton. Here he is. Whoop, whoop, whoop. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Brock. Um, I'm so excited to be here virtually. It'd be nice to be back home in California with you um, for real, but I'll come visit soon enough. Um, I've absolutely loved uh, all the talks uh, today and on Wednesday. Um, you know, California out is getting a, well, California usually has a reputation as, you know, progressive and being ahead of the game. Um, however, California's reputation when it comes to beaver um, has not been that. And I think this conference is uh, starting to disprove that. Um, and that's, that's really, that's really exciting. Um, so anyway, what I want to talk to you today about is, uh, low-tech process-based restoration, and we've heard hints of this um, throughout uh, some of the presentations. And um, I wanna make sure we're clear on what this uh, silly acronym is, um, LTPBR. Um, and I wanna spend most of the time talking about some principles. There's 10 principles, four that help us understand what a healthy riverscape looks like, and then six that sort of guide our actions and put them in context. Um, and oddly, you know, here we are, there's what, 387 people on this Zoom call. Um, you know, we are obviously largely beaver believers. Um, and I kind of want to encourage us at least some of the time to uh, stop talking at least directly about beaver. Um, and I'll, I'll try and elaborate on that here shortly. And, and instead start talking about what we've heard a lot of and that is investing in natural infrastructure. Um, I think you guys pretty much are a Beaver Dam Choir, and that excites me. I love I love talking about beaver. And when I first got involved, uh, when Michael Pollock and Nick Bowes dragged me out to Oregon um, to to work on some beaver restoration projects, um, you know, I was just so excited. I wanted to share it with everybody because it was so obvious. It's like, yeah, this totally makes sense. Um, but what I want to share with you today is not as much of a beaver story as it is um, just trying on some different messaging for different audiences um, that may not be as convinced as you are right now. Um, and, you know, I think we have to put ourselves in their shoes. Um, and, um, you know, yes, we could say just the general public matters, but truth is for Riverscape Health, the general public is probably not the most important audience because Riverscapes are owned and managed by a very uh, key uh, select group of folks. Um, certainly in California, farmers and ranchers um, are, are a big part of that. Um, and so we need to um, definitely uh, connect with and, and think about how they perceive these things. 
We've heard a lot about um, one of the, the, the barriers on the translocation front with CDF and W, but um, we need to be careful too. We heard from um, uh, Margie yesterday, and there's you know there's a lot at the staff level of support um, for 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 Beaver, but we've just and we'll hear more from Kate in a little bit about uh, you know maybe where to direct um, some pretty targeted messages uh, on Beaver um, to some of these. Um, different audiences that uh, make decisions about this. Um, but as obvious as all this stuff may seem to, to us and Kevin's impassioned um, wonderful talk on, on Wednesday about you know, Beaver Dam activity and how it could scale up, I'm gonna suggest that um, they, Beaver Dam activity is one of the most important solutions, but let's not mistake Beaver as the currency we should be working and communicating in primarily, at least for now, um, and or the action or the means everywhere. And we heard, you know, about, you know, what we can do um, uh, from Bob and others uh, to try and prioritize where um, Beaver may or may, may not make sense. I think that currencies that we might um, connect with some more key and bigger audiences are real estate, uh, sadly, um, but acreage of protected active riverscapes, I'll get into that in a moment. And the resilience, like we heard from Emily and so many others on the health of these things that providing ecosystem services. And I'm gonna really uh, argue that the vision should be resilience. We hear this, you know, in so many different veins um, all, over the, all over the place. And the means are these investments in natural infrastructure, because if there's something that beaver need, they need a place to do these amazing things in that ecosystem engineering. Um, and really for us to sort of get out of the way. So some examples that I think are um, better storytellers than I, uh, for example, Jay Wild, his story is a project we worked on with a rancher up in Idaho. I'm actually going up tomorrow with a class uh, to build another round of, uh, of projects um, on his property. And um, this story is being told in Beef Magazine. And so if we could do the show of hands, I mean, how many of you are subscribers to Beef Magazine? I'm guessing not a lot. Um, or or you know, uh, Range Magazine. Um, there's also this, I'm not sure if it'll play. I'm not sure if you're hearing that. What this is, is a TikTok little video of uh, a rancher in Kansas sharing what he sees um, in Beaver on uh, that his neighbors allowed to stay and what they're doing to improve those rangelands and improve that landscape. And so, we really do need to find um, other, other partners um, beyond um, just the, those of us that are pushing for these for ecosystem uplift and um, for environmental benefits um, to share their stories because they're, they're way more compelling with some of these key audiences that matter. Now, um, closer to home for you guys, um, just uh, the, the most recent issue of California Cattlemen. Um, got Glenn Nader sharing some stories, um, some experience, and we're hearing all sorts of experiences um, here in this conference. And so this is wonderful. We need more of this. But this common vision of resilience. Um, now we want to manage our riverscapes uh, for the resilience of, and I'm going to encourage us to just be vague for what? Let people insert what matters to them. You know, resilience of water, of wildlife, of, of you know, of, of communities, of working lands, etc. And um, you know, when we're talking about resilience, this is the capacity to recover quickly from difficulties or toughness, a lack of sensitivity uh, to disturbance. Um, we heard yesterday from Karen, or on Wednesday from Karen um, about um, resilience versus resistance. But the thing about letting this be a little bit vague in terms of the vision is we can let the things that people um, care about and they want to protect be what's inserted in the blank. And what they're fearful of, um, you know, fires, floods, droughts, there's so much common ground there. And so this, this resilience vision, um, as opposed to if we really strongly pushed a resilience of beaver vision, which I absolutely believe in, um, that can alienate and set things back. And I've seen that from our own experiences in, 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 in a number of places. So um, this is an example of how Jeremy uh, Maestas um, from uh, NRCS and the Working Lands for Wildlife has been sort of communicating this, you know, re-wet the sponge. Um, and I, we need to kind of back up a second 
and uh, be clear on what is this sponge. And Emily did a really nice job of, of sort of talking um, through about uh, sort of the mechanisms by which um, some of this resilience comes about. So that's gonna save me some time. Um, but I wanna be clear about um, what I meant by real estate. Um, I, uh, Katie Jack was uh, giving a talk at Wisconsin Wetlands Association a few weeks back, and she said something that I think just really encapsulated it. Um, when we talk about managing rivers and streams, we so often talk about um, just and, uh, and are thinking just of channels. Um, and even when we're talking about rivers and uh, or channels and their floodplains, the floodplains that are left are not the floodplains that once were and that could be. And so um, it, what Katie said was if she could change anything, one thing, it would be that on a map, rivers were not lines, um, they, were, they were area. And this definition of a riverscape that I want you to uh, walk away with, it's also more concise than saying, you know, rivers and floodplains, rivers and streams, rivers and their active flow. I mean, just this just encapsulates it. They're the part of the landscape that could plausibly flood by their rivers and streams and the natural flow regime. Um, and so, you know, another name for this is a valley bottom. Um, and they make up five to 10% of most landscapes. Um, but today, most landscapes in the West, only two to 4% of them have riparian on them. And it's not because the riverscapes went away, it's because these things are in poor condition. Um, California is even worse, um, with about half a percent of, uh, of California's landscape um, still in riparian. Now we hear pushes um, like, uh, you know, the 30 by 2030 push, right, to build climate resilience, you know, let's, let's protect, you know, 30 percent of, uh, of, of the United States. Um, California is about 104 million acres, about 27 percent is, depending on how you look at it, currently protected. Um, to meet uh, 30% by 2030, you could say, oh, well, that's just maybe another 3 million acres. If you want to share the proportion that we're currently sort of at, that's closer to 18 million acres. Um, whatever you want, whatever you say about this, it's, it's, it's big uplift that we, we need to look at. Right now, those valley bottoms, those riverscapes, um, what's active riparian is only about 350,000 acres. Um, there's this, there's huge um, scope to potentially increase um, the footprint of some of these riverscapes and think of that as an investment in natural infrastructure. Um, as, especially as we're hearing, you know, the, the big infrastructure bills um, being debated. So uh, the problem that we face, um, we, you know, we're all very clear on this, you know, we've got massive degradation of riverscape. We, we spend a lot of money on it but we spend it um, on too big, uh, too big of uh, price tag projects with too small of a footprint, right? Um, and the scope far out outweighs our, our actions. Um, there's a lot of riverscapes in the West that look something like this, you know, neat little ditch. And I come in and I look at it and, and what do I imagine is possible? I'm kind of looking for clues. What's the active floodplain here, for example? And when I do this um, and I look up on surfaces like this and I see sagebrush, um, it's understandable or if I zoom out and look at that same thing that I just sort of write this off, right? That's an upland. That's not an area that I should be concerned about. But when we've learned to read landscapes and, um, and find where these boundaries of these different riverscapes are, instead of just looking at the active channel and it's a wimpy little active floodplain um, today, if we can appreciate um, what we've lost, this is so important. I mean, this is like marketing 101, right? Like, you know, you don't know that you need something until someone tells you your life is incomplete without it, right? It's like, well, um, we, they, did, you, did you know that this could have been part of that riverscape, part of that active um, floodplain? And this takes different forms. It can take those very arid settings. There can be places like this um, example here that are extremely deceptive. I appreciated Bob using this technical term bowling alley. Um, it's, it sort of sums up what a lot of our riverscapes are dealing with. They're starved of structure. They're highly simplified. And in a lot of cases, when our land use pressures that might have limited riparian um, ease up in those and riparian comes in, they just armor in place a degraded um, and simplified channel. What's the structure we need back? 
part of its beaver dams, part of its wood. Um, in a lot of meadows, it's, you know, uh, rhizominous root mats that sort of uh, maintain sheet flow or convert concentrated flow into sheet flow. And, you know, we've forgotten for so many years with a shifting baseline what these riverscapes could be, what the valley bottoms were. And we heard talk on Wednesday about stage zero um, and stage eight. Um, so, you know, whether it's, you know, the work of like Ben Goldfarb helping us reimagine what these riverscapes um, uh, looked like. Um, or, you know, the work of Brian Clure and Colin Thorne um, trying to elaborate some of the conceptual models of uh, as phases of riverscape evolution in some of these systems. They basically added this stage zero, which is a horribly, you know, anastomosing is a horribly, you know, uh, kind of jargon, jargony way of saying multi-threaded channels where, you know, the multi-threaded stuff is forced by structure, things like beaver dams, things like wood jams, et cetera, um, around islands and with, you know, with highly connected floodplains. Um, so basically the science is finally caught up um, with giving us some justification and some nomenclature to articulate that it's okay to be messy and that healthy riverscapes were messy, okay? And so, what I want to do is take some of uh, what, what we've been talking about, um, wrap it up in this little low tech PBR bow, whatever that is, and then talk about these four principles of health that, uh, that sort of encapsulate and distill some of the science. Um, and then these principles um, of LTPBR that help us uh, kind of guide our actions, okay? And so, you know, what is low-tech process-based restoration? Well, it's really rebranding of some simple techniques, hand-built uh, sort of structures that have been around for centuries, okay? Um, and then, but with an emphasis on the PBR, on the process-based restoration. So these are going to be low unit costs, structural additions that are meant to mimic um, and promote specific um, processes. And so some of the more common features uh, that, that people associate with this, the low tech treatments are things like PALs, post assisted log structures. We can have owls, you just um, you know, wedge them in uh, roots and boulders or whatever without the posts, uh, beaver dam analogs. But it's important to remember that these are not the solutions. Um, they are the treatments. They are the things that we can do. Um, and so in the case of PALS, these are hand-built structures that mimic and promote the process of wood accumulation. Um, and BDAs are hand-built structures that mimic and promote the process of beaver dam activity. Now, this P in the process-based restoration um, is where uh, you know it's 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 not this uh, this this logger that could be compared with water. Um, it's um, it's something more. So we heard some discussion a little earlier about keystone species, and then I think Brock even hinted at uh, keystone processes. And one of the problems with the process-based restoration kind of push focusing on restoring the processes that maintain and sustain healthy riverscapes um, is it's easy to get lost. Um, and so I'm just going to show you like we have hydrologic processes, um, we have hydraulic processes, we have geomorphic processes, we have biologic processes, um, you know, so grow, survive, reproduce, die. These things are basically the stuff we, you know, we, you can go take uh, classes on, you can go get degrees in. And they are fundamentally important processes. They absolutely are, and they're very interesting, but it can be easy to lose the plot on what are the key processes. So we have keystone species that we focus on as indicators of healthy ecosystems because of their position, either you know, at the top of the food chain or um, how dependent so many others are on them. We don't have to measure every single species and everything that's going on if we measure the keystone species as an indicator of what else um, might be going on. It simplifies the problem. We can do the same thing with um, the key processes for riverscapes. These are the key things that you're going to design and solve for. Um, in short, it's wood accumulation and beaver dam activity, i.e. the structure that used to be a fundamental part of the diet 
of these rivers and streams. Um, and it's been starved of that for, for a long time um, in, in so many cases. And so, you know, when we're thinking about this, we focus on those processes um, and then put our actions, the low tech, simple things we might try to do um, in context with hopefully some humility. So let's, um, I don't have to spend a lot of time on these four principles of riverscape health, uh, largely because so many others have done a good job of, of presenting this, um, in particular, Emily kicking us off this afternoon. Um, the first principle is streams need space. Um, that's the real estate. And I'll, I'll spend a little more time on that. And I already talked to you about this definition of riverscapes. Number two, structure like these beaver dams forces complexity, forces this messiness, and that builds resilience. It literally builds a carbon fiber matrix in this real estate. Um, now, uh, number three, I'm not gonna talk too much about, this is really wrapped up in our favorite two words in the natural sciences, which are, it depends, right? And we know what it depends on. It depends on the hydrogeomorphic setting and all this stuff you can go take classes on, but we're just gonna kind of set that uh, caveat aside. And then finally, the inefficient conveyance of water is healthy, which we also heard um, Emily talk about. So this streams need space that is um, being wrapped up. Um, states like Colorado have um, adopted this fluvial hazard zone mapping where they're literally um, issuing easements to rivers and riverscapes to allow them to do what rivers would do. That is to flood and to potentially adjust on their valley floors. Um, and so we can look at riverscapes and, um, and a healthy riverscape, the active channel and active floodplain are what make up that, that riverscape. Um, they may be flanked by hill slopes, by terraces, by fans. Um, alluvial fans are the end of the riverscape of a tributary, but they're technically not the riverscape of that main stem. And so what do we do with those riverscapes? Well, historically, we use them right? Um, we convert them. We use them for, you know, uh, residential and commercial land uses. We use them for agricultural land uses. Um, and there's a big difference in the different types. You know, I might have an agricultural land use with crops that really won't do well with flooding versus ones that could be allowed to flood uh, versus, um, you know, grazing um, and with responsible grazing management, it can be an utterly compatible uh, land use um, with, with these sorts of um, riverscapes. And so what we need to kind of focus on is, you know, what's left? Um, where could we allow active channels and or active floodplains um, that where we could give the river some space to do some of the amazing things we've seen beaver do um, in, in so many of the presentations. Um, here's two contrasting riverscapes. Um, this one on the left, both of them have rivers that have basically used to be all over the place, um, um, occupying huge portions of their valley bottom and with active floodplains throughout and have both been artificially moved up to one side to make way for those land uses. In this example, it's to make way for grazing. And in this example, it's to make way for a mix of grazing and agriculture and roads and railroads and houses, and et cetera. Um, and so if we are to look at these and we are to map the portions that don't flood and that are not active anymore because of those conditions, this is a great way to express condition as a proportion of the valley bottom, how much of it is still active? And then you can pose the question in pink, you know, well, what could be in play for restoration? And here, a land trust has bought this valley bottom up. It's no longer used um, for, for grazing. And so actually the whole thing could be in play, whereas here there are constraints, okay? And so then we can imagine, you know, how do we put structure in to kick off processes that start pushing and eating into the inactive um, to try and make this a healthier, more functioning riverscape. And we can soak up that sponge and make it more resilient to disturbance and provide a lot of those um, ecosystem services and indeed economic um, benefits that we talked about. So structure forcing complexity and building resilience, we can illustrate with a beaver dam, okay? Um, 
there's a structure there. It changes the hydraulics, right? It backs up water, it makes it deeper, it makes it slower, speeds it up in other places. That changing of the hydraulics really amplifies geomorphic processes like erosion and deposition, which are not to be feared, but are to be celebrated as the exercise that healthy rivers do. And they leave in their wake more toned, you know, geomorphic units, uh, more diverse geomorphic units that provide complex habitat and support more biodiverse ecosystems. Now, when we allow that, um, we can create more resilient uh, riverscapes. Um, this is uh, this is an example. Um, this first one is actually uh, what Emily showed you uh, from grazing management, where resilience is expressed as green. Um, as a function of uh, precipitation, we're basically re removing uh, precipitation out of this. So the way to look at this is if you're high on this axis, um, it doesn't matter what the water year is, you're still going to be productive, you're still going to be green. Whereas if you're low, um, you're only green in wet years and in dry years, um, you're, you're, um, you're crispy and brown, right? And so th this is the, uh, this is basically that Maggie Creek um, with through time looking at how that resilience changed as a result of simply changing grazing management, um, not necessarily getting less cows, but just high intensity, short duration um, um, management that allowed riparian recovery and beaver to expand. And then that's where these resilient benefits um, came in. And we've seen similar results from um, using uh, little uh, structures in uh, like headwater meadows, like little zedite structures and one rock dams and zuni bowls. Um, and indeed using beaver dam analogs um, uh, this example from Bridge Creek in Oregon. Um, we've already heard this story um, and it just slaps in your face. It's, it's, it's so obvious that the, you know, how that structure for, uh, structural forcing relates to building a more resilient landscape to disturbance. Emily also talked to us about um, inefficiency in a way. And so our fourth principle is inefficient conveyance of water is actually a hallmark of health. And this is the LA River, and this is a beaver infested mess, right? And you can see sort of the difference really in how water um, is routed through that landscape, either quickly and efficiently, or, you know, the inefficient journey along the way. Um, you know, I can, I can hop in a plane and get from California to New York um, pretty damn quickly. Um, back in 2000, I rode my bike very slowly across the whole United States, and that was a much more interesting journey that I had connections with different parts of that landscape. One of the ways we can very simply monitor and quantify this is just take, a, take an aerial photo and uh, map out what is wet. And if you do this at low flow, um, this is at base flow, and 5% of this particular valley bottom is inundated and it's all free flowing. Um, here we take that same riverscape a few years later with some beaver that had come in and built these big dams and you still have free flowing, but we now have ponded areas and we have these structurally forced overflow areas and we're getting these diverse residence times and we're, we are inundating at the exact same flow, 20% of the valley bottom. This is, this is way more aquatic habitat it's not really any more water. It's a total illusion. It's more habitat and it's the water magic trick. It's what we do to, and we can see this in some really diverse riverscapes where, you know, classic settings where beaver can dam the main stem um, really steep, you know, five on up to 20% uh, slope uh, of valley bottoms and little first order tribs. Um, or where the rivers are so big that they have to dam on the floodplain and they can't dam on the main channels, we see very similar responses. And so it's, it's quite, um, quite an exciting and very simple sort of a result, um, this magic trick, this illusion of more water, but you've really just diversified the residence time um, or how long it's taking for water moving through. It's the difference between a freeway and making your way um, you know, across through the countryside and all sorts of back roads. Um, it also happens to have, uh, you know, we've been able to document this resulting in a lot more production of, um, in this case, an ESA listed population of steelhead. 
um, by increasing abundance um, and density of these fish with much more habitat um, and increasing their survival, um, we tend to see so much more abundance that we actually can see a decrease in growth in some of these situations. And it's this magic trick and this increase in the population, this population response that really gave um, BDAs a lot of credibility. So what can we do? Um, now, translocating beaver, if you know where to do it and you're legally allowed to, can certainly um, bring about um, some success. Um, sometimes we kick that off with low tech, um, but other times there's some other things we can do. And our principles here are, it's okay to be messy, there's strength in numbers, use natural building materials, um, let the system do the work for you, defer some of the decision-making about what to do to the system and self-sustaining systems are the solution. And so um, it's okay to be messy. Um, one of the first questions we often get when you know people are asking, well, how should I build this? Like, you know, this, we can make typical construction details and we do but don't take them too seriously, right? Like they're, they're kind of a rough guideline. Um, and, you know, anybody that's cooked, you know that some meals, you know, everything and precision and, you know, maybe baking certain dishes really matters and the order matters. And on other things, you just need to get something in there and get the system fed. Beavers like to make messes, so can you. Um, and so take a cue from, from the rodent. Um, this can't be overstated. There's strength in numbers. We have so many miles of degraded riverscapes in need of investment um, to make them more resilient, healthier functioning riverscapes and part of our natural infrastructure. We need a lot. This is just two miles of a much bigger project. And what you're seeing with all the dots are different types of structures. This is the sort of density we're talking about. This is why we need things that are cheap unit costs. And most importantly, we are, what we do is not the final result. It should kickstart processes that have a bigger footprint than our actions. Um, and so the strength in numbers comes from being able to have cheap things that you can put a lot in of, as well as having processes take over. Using natural building materials is just kind of the foodie mentality of, you know, like it's just common sense. If you can source your materials on site, um, or uh, ideally, if you can borrow them from, um, you know, from things where they would otherwise go to waste, I'll show you an example in a moment. Wonderful. Um, if you're going to put posts in, they're not always necessary, but if you do, don't put pressure treated posts in, don't put T posts in that sit in your gut like a Twinkie would for, you know, decades, um, you know, put something in that's going to break down. Also, with all the excess fuel loading and fire suppression and a lot of treatments that are taking place for forest health and rangeland health, there is a lot of biomass and byproducts. Um, that are wonderful um, sort of food uh, to use as the structure to build some of these structures. And so teaming up um, with these whole landscape restoration efforts is really fundamental. Letting the system do the work, the way we've done restoration in the past was with Tonka toys and grading, diesel power. Um, Jared McKee says, if restoration, what if it was about stream power doing the work, not diesel power? I couldn't agree more. Stream power would manifest itself in you know, erosion and deposition taking place um, to rework those things. Um, and we can defer decision making to the floods that happen, as well as to the rodents and, you know, how, how high should I build this dam? Well, you know, the rodent can take that over and deal with that for you. How high should I build that floodplain? Well, let the flood stage figure that out for you. If you give it the real estate, if you give it the space, then these are not high risk, high um, consequence decisions, and we don't have to make them. Um, and ultimately, you know, building BDAs and PALs is fun, but all you're doing is mimicking a natural process. And um, great, hopefully it can promote that to naturally take over, but the real, the real game changer is sustaining it. Um, and um, if you can't um, think of a pathway by which these will become self-sustaining processes, you really got to question, you know, what are you doing? What's your exit strategy? Um, I'm going to skip through this in the interest of time, but just re-emphasize that that ultimate goal is a self-sustaining system. So I'm going to conclude with, it's okay to do things you thought you weren't supposed to. Um, NRCS, 
has codified this. Um, there's a uh, conservation practice 643, um, and there's a reimbursement code, and everything that we're talking about here in this low-tech process-based restoration. Hopefully, you got a little bored because when it becomes boring and this becomes institutionalized, this becomes not that big of a deal. And hopefully it can be the thing that spreads like wildfire um, and um, is, is something that can actually rise to the scale of the problem. And we're not spending all our time convincing folks. The design life is only a year. Yes, it's okay to go and build stuff that isn't meant to last. What's meant to outlast this are the processes that take these things over. Um, and there is a ton of funding for these activities in the Farm Bill. Um, Working Lands for Wildlife, you can check out their website and how they've been pr uh, promoting these sticks and stones approaches. Um, there's actually a full feature article on the cover of Science News. It just came out last week. And all of these practices have been standardized into a manual that's available for free um, uh, at the lowtechpbr.restoration.usu.edu website or the dumbed down sort of pocket guide um, that uh, is the, the Reader's Digest version. Uh, there's lots of self-paced training for free available and we do a number of in-person in, uh, classes as well. Um, at least we will again, post pandemic. And, you know, beaver are absolutely important, but, you know, hopefully there's some ideas littered in, in, in that talk for ways that you might communicate some of what uh, we're trying to achieve without actually talking as directly about beaver all the time. Um, and then when people get impatient about, well, how long is it gonna take? Or how do I make it look like that? Or how do we not have to do maintenance? Well, the rodent that you didn't wanna talk about or think about, um, that's where they come in. And then it's, then it's uh, an easier conversation to have. So it's okay to leave, leave your space messy. Um, it's okay to let somebody else do the work for you uh, like the beaver. It's okay to defer decision making, right? To all these things that we wouldn't think of as otherwise good and uh, just get out of the way. This is a real estate problem first and foremost. Um, and um, if, if there isn't the space there, we can't, we can't see and realize uh, some of these benefits that we all get so excited about. Um, it's also okay to be inefficient. Um, so those things will buy you healthy, resilient riverscapes. And I think that's an investment um, that we can all um, be excited about making. And there's a lot of different groups um, all across the country uh, making these uh, sorts of um, decisions and investments. And I think uh, California is primed for this to, to take off. So thank you so much. And I'll stick around at the end for, for questions. Woo Wow, thank you there, Joe. That was amazing. We are so happy. We're thinking about getting all that exercise. Seems to us that if you've got a whole stack of beaver dams in a river, it's kind of like having six pack abs, right? And so in that PBR thing, maybe that's a logarithmic sort of an idea there. That's my logarithmic PBR on that one. So as far as I can tell, these guys, their interpretation of your message is that it's time to bring back the beavers, bring back the mess age. That's the message of the mess age. So without further ado, we are going to move over to Susan Charnley, who's been is a U.S. Forest Service research scientist and has put out a series of really wonderful uh, studies and booklets that a number of us have referenced over the years. And so we are super happy that you're here and take it away, Susan. Okay, thank you. Let me share my screen. Let's see here. Okay, can you see that all right? We'll take that as a yes. Yep, um, looking good, looking good. Here. Great, great. Okay, well, gosh, we've received so much information up till now uh, as a part of this summit. We've heard a lot about beaver behavior and ecology. We've heard about some great examples of beaver restoration projects. And we've heard about many of the benefits that beavers and beaver related, related restoration can have for everything from wildfire firefighting to biodiversity conservation, to uh, watershed and meadow restoration, to climate change adaptation and mitigation. Um, and I'm gonna shift the focus a little bit now to uh, really talk about social considerations that uh, we might wanna be thinking about when we're trying to do these beaver related restoration projects. And I'll refer to that as BRR for short. 
But um, I think the social considerations really deserve some attention because really they play a critical role in determining whether and where and how we can implement these kinds of restoration projects. So just a couple of reasons uh, to underscore why social considerations are so important. You know, on the first day, Michael Pollack pointed out that there's extensive geographic overlap between people, beaver habitat, and beaver themselves. We all like to live in low-lying areas and close to water. And so whether people view beaver as more of a nuisance or more of an asset is going to have a major effect on how beaver get managed in a particular place. And then is secondly, yeah. You might want to be on full screen, I guess. It's looking like you're split screen and we see your notes. Do you want to just share one solid slide? In oh, there? yikes. I do just want to. Um, OK. Yeah. OK. Um, how do I do that then? You can um, hit that display settings pull down and swap. Um, let's see here. Sorry. Um, Got it. Okay, I'm going back to, to to this. What are you seeing now? You still seeing my notes? Yeah. 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 Okay. You could go to that display settings pull down at the very top. Very top. On the left top, middle left. Screen show taskbar and in slideshow. Thanks. I don't see it. Just over to your right. Right next to it. Just one more to the right of that. Oh, video. Display settings. Video. Um, Participants, Q&A, new share, pause, share, remote control, more. I don't see the display settings. Stop sharing your screen. You might be able to see it. It might be that the navigation bar is obscuring your view. Stop share. OK, sorry. Do you see that in your application? Do you want me to share? Uh, do you want me to share my screen again? You should go to your slideshow in your application and if you can see the display settings, it's the middle. It's just at the top of where your photos are. Oh God. Slideshow. No, I don't see it. Oh dear. Susan, if you share your screen again, I'm going to request remote control of your screen and I can try and pull it up for you. Okay. Hmm, this worked fine during the tech chat. Okay. Oh, there you go. Now it looks good. It looks good. Okay. Sorry, I must have just uh, done the wrong one. Okay, I'm Great. so sorry. All right, well, anyway, the next point I was trying to make here was that, um, you know, a lot of people have invested a lot of time and effort into figuring out how to develop and design uh, beaver related restoration projects, but we're not going to be able to implement them if uh, there are social, economic, or regulatory barriers that stand in the way. You know, if they're too expensive, if the regulatory environment is not favorable, if um, people don't want to do this on their property, if members of the public uh, aren't supportive of it, you know, if these projects happen on public lands, for example, uh, we're not going to be able to do it. So I think it's important to uh, pay, pay attention to what some of these things are. What I want to do today then, um, oh God. So now I'm trying to advance my slide. I'm not having any luck. Uh, are you seeing the next slide? <laughs> no. On the on those the arrow buttons that are on the lower right of your keyboard, that there's not working for you. They're not working. Um, oh. 
Maybe one of you should run my slideshow for me because I'm not having success here. Susan, if you want to stop share, I can uh, share my copy of your uh, show. And then you just tell okay. me next slide. Yeah. Okay, wait, let's go back to the social considerations. Social, yeah. Next one. Yeah, so, okay, so I guess the six is the, is the magic number today. So I'm going to talk about six social factors that are important for creating a supportive social environment for beaver related restoration. And these six factors emerged from research that I conducted uh, about different beaver restoration projects between 2016 and 2018. So next slide. Um, yeah, so the methods that we used uh, for this project, uh, the six case study sites are shown on the uh, left side of the screen there. One was in California, the Scott River Basin. That was actually the only uh, site at the time of the study that where there was active um, beaver-related restoration taking place. And then we had three sites in Oregon, one in Idaho and one in Nevada. And you can see the kinds of restoration that was occurring at those sites on the right there. Um, so in addition to reading a lot about these projects, we uh, conducted interviews with project stakeholders. Uh, we conducted interviews with 105 people, some of whom are uh, giving presentations today or are participating in this conference. Um, half of those people were ranchers because all of these projects were located in rangeland environments. We wanted to focus on places that were more dry land areas where the water benefits of beaver related restoration could particularly be helpful. So um, we talked to ranchers who implemented these projects on their, their own private property or else who had grazing allotments on public lands where these projects were occurring. But we also talked to a number of agency staff and NGO staff that were involved in these projects. So next slide. So the first factor, people are most are more likely to support beaver related restoration when they perceive that the benefits outweigh the drawbacks. Now, I think pretty much everybody who has lived around beavers and beaver dams sees both uh, positive and negative effects of their presence. If you go to the next slide, um, you can see on the left there. So, okay, beaver move into an area and they start to increase in population. And then they cause the both desirable and undesirable changes. And what those happen to be depend on who you are, where you are, and how you make a living. And oftentimes, you know, the, the, the next step in the trajectory is down on the lower level there in brown. Um, you know, eventually the drawbacks of beavers and their dams may be seen as outweighing their benefits. And that means that social acceptance of beavers goes down and actions start to be taken to get rid of beavers in their dams. So for example, if you're a farmer and you're trying to do irrigated uh, crop production and beavers are out there damming up your culverts and creating sinkholes that your equipment gets stuck in, et cetera, uh, you may just wanna get rid of them. But alternatively, um, if you're on the upper trajectory there where the benefits of beavers and their dams outweigh the drawbacks, then you see that social acceptance of beavers increases and actions are taken to encourage beavers in their dams. And um, luckily in this rangeland environment where we did our research, we found that the ranchers that we worked with really felt um, that the beavers uh, benefits outweighed uh, their drawbacks. And primarily that was because they very much recognized the way in which beavers increase surface water availability uh, during the long summer months. And that was really good for livestock. But they also found that there was a much wider sort of green line around uh, these riparian areas. So wet meadows increased and that meant that forage production increased both in quality and quantity, which uh, really benefited their livestock. And so they, um, of course, we didn't do a random sample of ranchers to see what their views of beavers and dams were, but the ones that were involved in these projects very much thought beavers were great. And they were willing to put up with some of their drawbacks, which for them primarily was, um, again, sort of blocking irrigate, irrigation infrastructure in their hay fields, sometimes cutting down trees that they cared a lot about, that sort of thing. So I think this finding really bodes well for carrying out beaver restoration in rangeland environments. Um, but go ahead to the next slide. Um, so the second principle is that, you know, um, education and assistance for landowners to help them 
um, mitigate some of those negative effects of beavers uh, without compromising restoration um, can take place. And um, if we can encourage them to adopt some of these non-lethal mitigation techniques, that really helps to make a more favorable uh, cost benefit ratio um, for the landowner. And so we heard a lot from Mike Callahan and from Kevin Swift on Wednesday about what some of these tools are. You see the pond levelers pictured here. You can see fencing around trees. Um, I think that effective ways of communicating about the presence of these tools that help us coexist with beaver include building demonstration projects on particular lands and then inviting people to come and check them out. Or um, for example, in the Scott River uh, area, I was uh, sort of impressed to learn that the local uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife, when people came in requesting a beaver depredation permit, they tried to point them towards the Scott uh, River Watershed Council and say, well, why don't you maybe talk to them first to learn about some non-lethal method methods for living with beaver. And so, you know, doing that um, education and outreach methods, I think that's really important for making these tools, making landowners uh, who are considering uh, living with beaver much more um, aware of how they can reduce their negative impacts and help to coexist. So the next slide. Um, so a uh, third principle is that land use practices have to be compatible with uh, beaver related restoration uh, in order for it to be successful. Uh, what those practices are depends on what, you know, who you are and where you are. But in the case of rangelands, um, it's important that ranchers adapt grazing management in riparian areas so that um, beaver habitat and beaver can flourish there. And in the six projects that we studied, we found that four of them uh, had riparian fencing in many places to basically either exclude or really limit access to cattle to these uh, riparian corridors. And in those cases, um, you had healthy riparian vegetation in which uh, beaver uh, lived. And a lot of that riparian fencing actually was not put in specifically for the purpose of uh, beaver risk restoration, but it had been put in in the 1990s to address concerns around Endangered Species Act listed fish and to help their recovery. Um, but in two of our cases, um, you had conservation oriented grazing practices. As Joe just mentioned, you know, livestock grazing can be quite compatible with beavers and beaver restoration. Um, and just by managing livestock so that you minimize their impact on riparian areas, particularly during hot summer months, um, you can get very healthy riparian vegetation in which beavers can thrive. And um, so you just, um, you know, on the other hand, need to have enough regulatory flexibility if you're in a public lands context to allow um, those grazing permittees to adapt their management practices accordingly. Next slide. So number four is that um, we need to have a low harvest pressure on beavers in order for beavers to be able to colonize areas undergoing beaver related restoration. Now, of course, there are a lot of things that limit beaver populations. Um, you know, there's disease, there's lack of habitat, there's predation, but in some areas, we also might find that harvest pressure can be a limiting factor. Um, you know, none of the state wildlife agencies in the states where we worked monitored uh, beaver populations statewide over time, but they did keep data about statewide trends in licensed beaver harvesting. And uh, what we found in all four states actually over the last two decades or more that uh, licensed beaver harvesting had dropped dramatically. And we did not actually have reports in any of our cases that uh, harvest pressure was a limiting factor on um, these beaver restoration projects. But you know it can be, so this may need to be addressed locally. Um, it's a big debate in Oregon going on right now over this particular issue. Next slide. Um, beaver related restoration really demands a regulatory environment that can allow for this process-based uh, restoration approach, right? It's a relatively new uh, approach. Most uh, beaver restoration projects have been happening over the last decade or so. And as we've learned about from Joe and other talks, you know, we're talking about um, dynamic stream environments that change, that fluctuate. Um, we're talking about an animal whose behavior isn't always predictable. We need to be able to respond throughout the restoration process and the feedbacks that we get 
by innovating, uh, experimenting, kind of adapting to changing conditions over time. And the regulatory framework you know, needs to allow for that kind of experimentation and flexibility. And it needs to support adaptive management because adaptive management is a critical part of these um, process-based restoration uh, approaches. Um, what we learned through our research was that, um, you know, oftentimes, uh, both in California and Oregon, especially for those projects that involved implementing in stream structures, we found that the regulatory environment was really the biggest challenge that these projects faced. And, you know, at least in one case up in Oregon, you know, people just finally threw up their hands and said, we can't keep banging our head against the wall anymore and trying to get the permits we need to do uh, Beaver Dam analogs. And so they basically gave up. Um, the restoration activities that they had been planning. And then in another case, we found that, you know, well, sometimes if the regulatory barriers are too high, people will just go ahead anyway, you know, without getting the permits and apologize later if it's a problem. But um, neither of those outcomes is particularly desirable because it doesn't help us to meet our restoration goals as best we can. So I really think that this, um, you know, the regulatory environment is something that we really need to get together and work hard on to try and make it support this um, approach where appropriate. Um, next slide. Uh, finally, uh, we found that the people involved in these projects were critical, and we've heard other people talk about this uh, as well at this summit, you know, the partnerships that are there, you know, we found that most of these restoration projects happen because there were a small number of people who were beaver believers and they were proponents of these projects, and they took the initiative to go out and make them happen. We also found it was critical to have landowners that would be willing to have this restoration approach occur on their property um, or people, again, users of public lands who might be affected by this approach needed to be supportive, such as raising permittees on public lands. But we also found that partners, uh, partner organizations played a critical role in providing technical assistance, financial assistance, um, you know, boots on the ground, volunteers, that kind of thing. And all of these people, you know, they had to think through and innovate uh, when they faced challenges. They had to also be flexible. They had to sometimes take risks because you don't always know what the outcome is going to be from your activities. Um, but they had to also stay committed through the process. I mean, I think, you know, process-based restoration, it's a process. It's not a one-time activity. And so people that are willing to sort of commit through the long haul and through the ups and downs of these projects were the ones that really, um, the places where there was really um, some remarkable successes that we found. Next slide. Um, okay, then, you know, this is just a summary that um, of the six things that I that we found across cases were really important social considerations for beaver restoration, you know, the benefits have to outweigh the drawbacks, non lethal mitigation techniques are an important part of the package, there needs to be compatible land use practices, we need to have low harvest pressure on beavers, there should be a supportive regulatory environment and proponents, innovators, and partners, as well as willing landowners and users are uh, critical to um, make these things happen on the ground. So next slide. Um, to conclude then, you know, I, I just wanna reemphasize that I think honestly, the social aspects of beaver related restoration are as important as the biophysical aspects and the technical aspects and so we need to approach uh, this restoration activity in a more holistic way. Um, and I think that, you know, including the social aspects of restoration, it's not going to guarantee that these projects are going to produce their desired outcomes. But I think it's really going to increase the likelihood for successful implementation, which in turn uh, will increase the potential for success of these projects. And so next slide. I just wanted to acknowledge my research collaborators, Hannah Gosnell, Rachel DeVee, and Jesse Abrams, as well as the organization that funded our research, the Northwest Climate Hub. And the final slide is next. Uh, just has my contact information if you have any questions. And if you're interested in learning more about our work, um, this is just a reference to a relatively recent article you might want to check out. And that's that. And I'm sorry for all of the technical difficulties. Thanks for saving the day, Brock. <laughs> oh, thank you. That was great. Thank you, Susan. I love that. And we love that too. Um, we're with you on the primary passage barriers appear to be in the world of you two-legged naked apes 
and what we would call our ecosystem restoration, which is really the issue here in the ecosystems and the beavers will sort it out if y'all just let us do our work. So, but we get to talk about barriers to beaver restoration and I'm so happy that we have both Betsy Stapleton and Charna Gilmore here from the Scott River Watershed Council and happy to her here. And it's been fun to travel this beaver uh, riverscape, beaverscape with you for over a decade now. So, yay. Hi, take it away, Betsy. Well, thank you very much. And, and so many of the previous um, uh, presentations and comments will feed into this uh, talk that, that Sharna and I are offering. Sharna is in the background and we'll be answering questions in the either the Q&A or comments. Um, and there's gonna be some request uh, out to you, uh, the audience to participate. So please be prepared to, to put your thinking caps on during this presentation. Uh, So the Scott River that's a uh, watershed that's been mentioned several times is in the very northern part of uh, California, almost to the Oregon border. Uh, and it is part of the larger Klamath Basin. When the um, first white settlers came, they described the area as all one large wetland swamp, like those beautiful pictures we've been seeing uh, due to the beaver dams there. The uh, settlers were motivated by beaver harvest, that was their original intent in coming, and they did a very good job of removing uh, beavers. The indigenous tribes that lived here were the Shasta and Karuk, and they're still very present and part of our uh, community and involved in restoration and leading the way with sharing their traditional ecological knowledge, which is invaluable. So the white settlers have developed a very close and intimate uh, relationship with the natural landscape. And this has involved gold mining, timber harvesting, and uh, agriculture. And as a result, we have a Scott River that looks like this during most of uh, quite a few summers. In spite of that, we have a large population, quite possibly the largest in California of the Sank Coho that uh, Bob Pagliuca was talking about. And we are able to be grow beautiful uh, juveniles and then uh, have the joy of seeing the returning adults come back to our watershed. There's other salmonids that live here as well as Pacific lamprey. Uh, in order to increase the habitat and support those uh, wonderful, amazing creatures, the Scott River Watershed Council in collaboration with NOAA um, uh, Dr. Pollock, who was the keynote speaker on Wednesday, uh, agreed to come down and work with us in our community. And we also uh, uh, developed a close relationship with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to construct the first BDAs in California. As such, we have the great joy of encountering uh, the regulatory pressures and questions that came up and therefore we were delegated the task of talking about barriers and challenges. So cutting through as our beavers do, some of the uh, legacy and current uh, problems that, that are barriers to restoration, irrigation infrastructure is an issue. Uh, beavers are very busy, they clog them up and it's a, a challenge to manage beavers in a high uh, agriculture environment. Degraded systems, uh, we had a lot of presentations about incision and drying and that's definitely a fact and a barrier. Fragmentation of habitats, that makes it very uh, challenging for beaver populations to flourish. Uh, if a, a juvenile that's dispersing from a family unit has to cross miles of dry habitat, they have a very difficult time expanding the population. And then there's the competing needs for water, human needs, agriculture needs, lawn needs, uh, bath needs, all those things are, are just a challenge when, and when there's a limited supply of water. And then the factors of upland management, I was so glad to hear a timber company participating in this discussion because upland fuel management, the dense stands of young trees, the risk of catastrophic fire and the removal of historic fire all have an effect on the ability to uh, have effective beaver and beaver related restoration. And of course the big, big factor of a drying climate and climate change. 
so then there's the issue of regulatory policy. And, and by the way, that's our, our picture of a fish that just got over a B, BDA. We were thrilled to stand there on the bank and watch it go over. But one of the biggest uh, barriers in terms of the regulatory world is the uh, California Dep Department of Fish and Wildlife Code 5901 that says that no one shall impede or tend to impede fish passage uh, through a stream. And this has been um, applied to natural structures as well as things like large dams and irrigation uh, uh, dams put in streams. Um, the Watershed Council has been very active in doing the research that uh, Bob Pagliocco shared with you that shows that under most circumstances, juvenile fish and adult fish can pass over these structures quite easily. There's an unfortunate unintended consequence of the pressures that are coming out against depredation and depredation permits is that we are afraid that we're seeing an uptick in the uh, shoot, shovel and shut up approach to managing um, annoying beavers. Uh, and then hunting regulations that do not have bag limits or reporting requirements makes it very difficult to, to monitor the effect of uh, trapping and other human removals. And the largest and most difficult and challenging issue that lies in the regulatory world is the complex, unclear, and unenforced ground and surface regulate water uh, regulations that make it difficult to manage water for environmental requirements. So here's your uh, upcoming opportunity. Get ready to type in your answers. This is a pop quiz. This is a BDA. You can see that beavers have been very active on it. They've been managing the site for several years now. And um, all of a sudden the stream is dry. In that small pool below the BDA, there are a few residual juvenile coho. Clearly they cannot pass that structure and they're at risk uh, of perishing and therefore um, perhaps uh, a take case for an endangered species. You're a regulator, you've been called out to the site, you've been asked to address this situation and you have three or four potential responsible, responsible parties. You have the happy-go-lucky restorationists there on the left-hand side of the stream who joyfully implemented some BDAs to, to restore the, the habitat there. Uh, in the middle, you have the rancher or landowner who the young restorationist uh, convinced that this would be a great thing for his property. The groundwater table would be raised, forage would be improved, and uh, the conditions on his uh, property would improve. And then upstream, you have the irrigated uh, lands and uh, the irrigation season just started and this guy turned on his uh, surface diversion and perhaps, you know, he really wants to get a lot of water out there and maybe it's running a little uh, fuller than uh, his legally adjudicated amount of water. And we have a similar uh, irrigated irrigator downstream that has a very large groundwater well that's pumping about 5,000 gallons a minute and lowering the uh, uh, water table there. So if you were the regulator, um, where does the responsibility for this potential take uh, occur? So this is the kind of complexity of the real life world of doing this kind of restoration in a working land landscape. So go ahead and take your vote. Where does the responsibility lie and how should the re regulatory authority address this situation? To move on, um, some of the permitting and funding barriers to doing this kind of restoration is the one and done concept. Uh, funders often have mandates to report miles restored. And if you come back and add some more structures or tinker or do this or that, you're not restoring new miles. So they have difficulty funding ongoing site management and engagement. And so the need to support co-management at a site over time is critical. And this needs to include adaptive management strategies built into the permitting to adjust to dynamic systems in the changing climate. So here are some hard realities. Human use of water is exacerbating climate change effects. And the bottom line is you can have beavers, you can have BDAs, but if the stream is shut off 
or the groundwater is pumped and you don't have any water, you're not going to have um, restoration on this landscape. And working in highly altered systems makes it very difficult to predict treatment responses, regardless of the le level of engineering. And if you're going low tech, you know you're gonna make a mess, but exactly where that's going to go or what it's going to do is not entirely predictable. And if you're in a constrained working landscape and you don't have all that uh, uh, real estate that Joe was talking about, but you're still trying to get some benefit, this is a challenging environment to work in. Um, so um, I have on the screen there on the left-hand side, an example of just this sort of situation. We were working in the tailings at six miles of boulder and cobble that uh, Bob put up a picture of. And we were pulling back some of those uh, tailing piles to give the stream a little more room to, to move, to give it some real estate. And we did some planning to jumpstart some of the vegetation so the beavers that are in the area would have some food to work on. And unfortunately, uh, what we did is we created a giant drain hole and water started pouring out through that rock. And we needed to come back and repair and put in some fine material and continue to work at the site. So again, permitting, funding needs to build in uh, some of the flexibility to continue to work in the site as we do take the risk of working um, in challenging situations. And we have to have the will and the energy and the courage to tackle these very difficult and hard issues and talk about things like failure. It's um, a little frightening to put up a picture of a project that didn't go well. It'd be a whole lot more fun for me to be showing the success pictures. So here's our second pop quiz. Uh, get ready to type, please. And I forgot to mention, um, out of the first five responders, we're going to offer the opportunity to come up and visit um, our, our working landscape here and see the challenges and the successes. So if you're interested, you better get ready to type and Sharna is gonna be monitoring and we'll reach out to you to offer you uh, an opportunity to come visit us. So on the left-hand side there, we have a beautiful little BDA and um, it's been raising uh, healthy fat fish um, and uh, you can see a bucket of them, but now we have climate change and we're not sure that the uh, uh, spring runoff is gonna come in time to get those fish out of that habitat. And so we will again have impeded fish. This is a hypothetical, I hope you know. Um, so you're the regulatory authority now and you're working with us uh, collaborating. Do we pull out the BDA and destroy that habitat that's been raising fish for years so we're not impeding? Do we take the fish out and move them, which is not a favored action? Do we allow them to perish? This is a listed species. These are the difficult and challenging decisions and issues that the Watershed Council and similar partners have been um, uh, addressing and managing and attempting with the help, for instance, of the BDA tech team to come up with realistic solutions for. So considerations going forward, we need to account for climate change in funding, permitting, and long-term adaptive management. We need to manage and water, manage and regulate water and land for ecosystem needs and for the future generations. I want my grandson to have the same opportunity to be on the landscape and see these wonderful systems and, and species that I've had. And we need to look for those opportunities to allow uh, the river, uh, the real estate to move as best as possible within the context of these working landscapes. And the drought is severe. There's going to be ranchers going out of business this year. Maybe uh, a thing to ask the legislature for would be a fund. Let's buy the properties of those folks going bust and repurpose them for ecosystem um, infrastructure. That might be an opportunity. And when we're talking about risk assessments, we must take into account the risk of not doing anything or doing more of the same because that's how we ended up with the Scott River looking like it does. So the risk of doing nothing must outweigh the risk of, of uh, you know, being brave and working in challenging locations. 
So that's my talk. Um, anyone who really, you don't have to be a winner. If you wanna come visit, we will put you up and tour you around. If you have questions or would like to follow up, there's Sharna and my address. And please feel free to go to the scottriver.org website to learn more about the work that we're doing. Great. Yeah. Thank you, Betsy. Now there. Wow. Thank you for that there, Betsy, and Charn in the back. And I hope I win because I'm always looking for an invitation to go up and visit those two and see the work. And but and if I don't, whoever gets to go, I can guarantee you their hospitality is amazing and you'll have a great time. So with that, we are going to transition over to none other than Miss Kate Lundquist from the Oxford Arts and Ecology Center, who I work with on our Bring, Bring Back the Beaver campaign. And I'm just going to send it right on over to you, Kate. So without further ado, hi, Kate. Howdy, howdy. Thank you. It's so good to be here with y'all. And um, thanks for all of everyone's input, the organizing committee, and for the presenters. And yeah, I really, really appreciate everything that's been said so far. So I'm going to talk about our Bring Back the Beaver campaign. And as Brock said, we work at the Occidental Arts and Ecology Center, which is a nonprofit in Western Sonoma County. We have an 80 acre demonstration site where we demonstrate all kinds of innovative practices for resiliency and how to harness processes towards biological and cultural diversity. And we get to run the Water Institute, which focuses on watershed restoration. And we thankfully have all kinds of partners because we're just this tiny team of two. And as you can see from all the acronyms and we're missing a lot of folks that I know you are in the audience, we work with and love you too. Um, but this is what we're doing. We're doing collaborative conservation from Ridgeline to Reef. And for us, we got really interested in beaver because of our declining coho as well. It seems to be a theme throughout the conference. And you know, we're all trying to think outside of the box. And since there's been all this great work happening, in other states to document the benefit of beaver to coho recovery. We were like, we gotta be doing this in California and what the heck, why aren't more people doing this? So 10 years ago, we started our Bring Back the Beaver campaign to really try to increase folks' awareness about beaver and their role in watershed restoration and listed species recovery in particular. And, you know, Brock says, we've got a beaver blind spot in California. And I would agree, a lot of folks we run into don't know they even exist here, let alone are native and uh, have had such an incredible impact on California's riverscapes for millennia. So there's a lot of work to be done. And I'm really grateful for all the folks in this audience and on the in the summit that are doing this kind of work because it's super key to get this word out and to really engage our citizenry in helping to collect the kind of data we need and to continue to really make sure that we're getting high quality research and demonstrations implemented on the landscape because California's exceptionalism uh, goes pretty far when it comes to research and since we don't have a lot of research that is based out of California and that is changing thankfully uh, we tend to get ignored for that research that is done outside of our state is, is not taken seriously. And we also work on changing rules so that we can have more rigorous science-based regulations to uh, support beaver restoration. We've got a guidebook. If you haven't seen it, check it out. It's available as a free download. And basically it'll just show you what we're up to and how we support our communities and regulators and becoming more aware about beaver and taking care of the current populations we have and figuring out ways that we can facilitate restoration to their former range. We draw heavily from the well-tested science, tested and practiced and peer-reviewed science of beaver and process-based restoration. And thanks to Joe for really spelling it out. The Beaver Restoration Guidebook is also another really great resource. If you aren't familiar, you need to download both of these and read them, but uh, cover to cover. 
so coexistence, I really appreciated what Susan was saying about uh, getting folks out to see your demonstration sites. We do a lot of coexistence around the state and I have noticed that there is a huge difference. Once you get one in, to be able to have the community to see, come out, see what it does, bring regulators out to see how low tech they actually are, how economical they are and to see how they work really well. And if you don't have a way to get a hold of people, just try putting one in because all the neighbors will show up and start talking your ear off and you get to educate them then. And I would recommend if you are installing these to make sure you have folks who are there to do outreach, which is a role Brock and I often play. We set up the table and the beaver puppets and, and just educate folks away. And then they become the next generation of people who then educate people who show up and, and wonder what these uh, devices are doing. And they're really, uh, uh, it's been a great way for us to bring more people on board with coexistence and with beaver in general knowing that there are these solutions. We're really excited to debut the Beaver Backsaver pilot, which we'll be uh, installing in uh, the Sutter National Wildlife Refuge. This is a design that was designed by the US Fish and Wildlife Service at the Sutter Wildlife Refuge. And we're piloting it in two other sites. And basically what's going on here is we all know those of us who are working in flatlands and have these conveyance uh, devices, they get blocked. And it, it, it causes, oops, sorry, it causes lots of back injuries and workers' comp cases. And so the, the reality is, is you can put in one of these structures. If you've got these twin track weirs, they will work and you can put a pipe and a cage on the end and you don't have to manage them for the rest of the season. So check it out. We're gonna be making a lot more uh, presentations and we'll do a webinar about it once these are installed. So stay tuned. So Brock and I have been involved in a lot of watershed restoration planning, but these days it's more focused on beaver and process based restoration planning and implementation all over the state with a particular focus in salmon streams and riparian rangelands and mountain meadows, in part because that's where a lot of restoration dollars are going and so there are funds to support this kind of restoration. And that's where there's a lot of high quality habitat that could really benefit from this kind of restoration and there's that space that Joe was talking about. So we're really grateful for the opportunity to be working with landowners, ranchers, and in particular tribes. You can see from the report cover here on the right, we did this recruitment strategy for the Mighty Summit Consortium and really just helping them figure out how we can make sure uh, they, we do everything possible to get beaver back on that landscape as soon as possible. And a lot of times when you're in places where beaver have been extirpated, uh, there's a lot of questions that get brought up of like, well, they weren't native here, they were relocated here. And so you can't bring them back. And this belief is held by higher ups in the department as well, our Department of Fish and Wildlife. And so we continue to reiterate the evidence that Rick talked about on, on Wednesday and then find new evidence like these buried beaver dams that we found in Yellow Creek that radiocarbon dated back to 1270. And thankfully, Saber Purdy was uh, part of the assessment uh, partnership for Yellow Creek and Tasman. And in her stream surveys, she found hundreds of remnant beaver dams, or dozens at least, uh, on Yellow Creek and wrote up this 10 page report. And in it, she really describes very well how to recognize remnant beaver dams in Sierra and streams. And for those of you who do work in the Sierras, I highly recommend you all read this too learn from her example. So in addition to helping aggregate all of this historic evidence, we also look at current beaver distribution. And uh, unfortunately, someone already mentioned this, we don't have any population dynamic data that's being managed for the state. We don't know how many we have, we don't have, know all where they are. And this is challenging when you're trying to manage a species, especially a species that's helping so many listed species. So we are now relying on iNaturalist because that's the most comprehensive database that we have access to and that we can also get public input. And uh, so if you're sitting on beaver distribution data and someone wants a research project, I invite you, uh, those of you who are looking for a project to help us get more of those data onto iNaturalist so we can have one place to refer to. Uh, where we're finding beaver. And uh, you can get your citizens involved by doing a beaver blitz and have them go out like the photo shows with their iPhones and, and log on. We got a lot of points added to Sonoma Creek by doing that. 
And thanks to the Utah State crew, we were able to bring uh, the Beaver Restoration Assessment Tool to California. And it's been mentioned a couple of times. And for us, you know, being part of that team was really helpful because it showed us how we could use it in our restoration assessments planning. And really for what we're finding really helpful rather than just stopping with the conservation layer that's available on the, the website, which is really helpful uh, starting place, we really tease apart the intermediates and look at all the different components of the flow and the, the slope and the vegetation and, and really compare that with our ground-based surveys to get a more realistic picture and, and make decisions based on a more comprehensive assessment. And, the Brad's been really helpful at giving us those kind of data. And while the Brat is a dam building, uh, uh, it's a dam building model. It really helps uh, figure out how many dams you're gonna get per kilometer. We really wanna make sure that we pay attention to the benefits that Beaver who aren't building dams are also providing as is illustrated in the work that was done by Marissa Parrish and Justin Garwood. And, it turns out that the bank rows themselves and the stick piles from their feeding are providing huge uh, cover for a lot of our native California and endangered species. Speaking of endangered species, we really want to uh, keep that in the fore when we're talking about beaver. That's the uh, intersection that we really focus on. California is endowed with a huge responsibility of caretaking the immense uh, biodiversity that we have, and uh, a lot of those uh, biodiverse species, species are endangered and imperiled and do in fact benefit from beaver habitat. And yet a lot of our practices and policies do not reflect that. And we're trying to figure out how to change that so that we can make them reflect that. So here we go, let's talk about policy. And Bob, thanks for um, already setting the stage. You covered different parts of the policy than I did. Um, as far as my understanding, and, and Betsy, I'm curious uh, if this is uh, not being practiced in your county, but with the passage of the Wildlife Protection Act in 2019, recreational trapping of native fur bears was banned. And so my understanding is that uh, that is off the table now for hunters. That doesn't mean people aren't still hunting, uh, but just in terms of uh, my understanding is that you can no longer get a permit to recreational trap and sell fur for beaver in California. But as Susan's data showed, that wasn't the big big uh, hit on beaver necessarily. Really what's uh, the bigger hit uh, is depredation, which is when you kill a beaver because you're suffering damage from those beaver or the perception of damage. And so right now the language in the code says that the department shall issue depredation permits and they can't condition those permits. Some do, but they're not legally required to condition those permits uh, so that you do non-legal things. And, and as it was mentioned, some of our our CDFW staff actually do try to get you to do that, but they, there's no mandate, so they don't have the law behind them. Um, there is some li living with beaver information on the website, which is great. And thanks, you know, shout out to our colleagues who helped get that, um, Mary Olswang in particular, get that information on the website. So at least now there's information about coexistence. And as Bob said, possession and movement of beaver are not allowed. So two efforts that um, folks should be aware of is that uh, the Center for Biological Diversity and the Environmental Protection Information Center, along with OEC and others, are uh, uh, submitted a rule change petition to try to change the code around depredation, in part to give the department more leeway, legal backing to condition those permits so that if there are listed species involved that they don't get harmed for one to make sure that there is an incidental take under the Endangered Species uh, Act. And then also to make sure that, they're, uh, that they do exhaust non-lethal management strategies. And I hear you, Betsy, that that can complicate things uh, and increase shoot, shovel, and shut up. And so there are other programs that um, we can draw from as well where there's funding to do this and make the non-lethal stuff more accessible and affordable. And there's lots of volunteers out there who are interested in helping with this effort as well. And there's also the uh, APHIS case, which is the Animal Plant Health Inspection Services uh, Wildlife Services Department, which is uh, helps uh, remove and kill uh, beaver from landowners that are suffering damages. And so uh, basically Center for Biological Diversity uh, filed an attempt to sue 
because they were not consulting our National Marine Fisheries Service about whether or not listed species were being harmed through that beaver removal. So that process is underway and in California. And so uh, stay tuned because this could help with uh, making sure that we don't take our endangered species when those beaver, especially uh, fish in this case. So what about relocation? Um, yes, uh, we, we did. We, California relocated 1,200 beaver back in the day. And we have the poster to attest to it. And we even have a, um, a, cons a conservation translocation policy that was put in place in 2017. And we could move beaver using that policy, but there is a, a, a stipulation that it can't be about nuisance management as much as it's about conserving the species itself. But I would argue that to use beaver translocation to conserve other species would be a, a way to uh, implement it in the case of that particular policy. So what are the concerns from what we've heard? And we've met with Director Bonham and talked about this and had lots of back and forth with different folks at the agency. Too costly to develop a management plan. Um, the impact to surrounding landowners and roads is a concern, which translates in our minds to liability for damages. Uh, fisheries concern. Uh, native trout conservation, two effects worm or wind disease, and these are the department words, not mine. Zoonotic disease transmission and cost to test. Beaver do carry diseases. Um, over exploitation of habitats and impacts to other wildlife we depend on beaver food sources, particularly aspen, birch, cottonwood, and willow, changing the dynamic of release site e ecosystems and stress caused to beaver being removed for its home range. Yeah, that makes me want to go to the bar too and talk about this. Um, so we have solutions to many of these concerns and they're already being implemented. Bro or Bob already uh, talked about this in his talk and I would point you to Washington State's plan. Uh, they were basically passed a, a wildlife a beaver bill and then the department had to come up with the beaver relocation pilot. And the way they get around the liability question, which I understand is key, is the landowner has to assume liability. And if you look at the form on the right here, the landowner has to say that they will not hold the, the department liable for any damage. And so I feel like we can learn a lot from these other examples and use them in our own state. So our recommended next steps are to continue to support beaver coexistence and restoration, start your own beaver you know, group, uh, the Beaver Brigade's gonna talk next. Can't wait to hear about that. Help us add distribution data and answer research questions here in California. And what about carrying out relocation pilots with federally recognized tribes? We are in the process with one tribe who has actually gotten permission to do that. And so our understanding is the department will in fact approve that. Um, so we need to get more federally recognized tribes that have uh, federally recognized sovereign lands to be able to return those beaver to, uh, to get on board and, and work with us as a way of piloting these techniques. And then we, we can work with CDFW to try to collaborate on a relocation pilot in non, on non-sovereign lands as well, which is what we're trying to do with the Mighty Summit Consortium, since they, those lands are not considered sovereign for them. And, um, or we could take it to the next level and pass a legislative bill to require CDFW to carry out the relocation pilot. So those are some options on the table. Look forward to hearing what folks think afterward. And this is a group effort, so everyone's got to get on board. We can do this. And I appreciate your time. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Kay. Yes, yeah. we can. That's the can is short for canadensis in our caster canadensis there. Oops, I can't stop my share. Hold on a minute. All right, well, <laughs> you're just lagging along over I there. I know, I'm screen sharing. I'm like, woohoo, here we go, folks. Okay, hold on, let me escape. And uh, All see right. if we get you here. There we go, thanks. All righty. Sorry, y'all, and sorry for going over time. <laughs> no, no, you're good. You're all good. Everyone has been great today. Thank you all the presenters for doing great on our time. And so without further ado, wrapping it up, we got our folks from the Slow Beaver Brigade, which is San Luis Obispo for folks who don't know that acronym. And 
So these are just the folks, uh, you know, relative to the past two days, kind of our southernmost beaver believers out on the central coast there coming in to tell us about this. So without further ado, Audrey and Cooper, there you are. Whoop, whoop. You're on. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. All right. You want to get this? Should we uh, going? give it to Elizabeth first? She's not on. Go ahead All and right. share the screen. I'll start sharing the screen. All right. Let's go. All good. All right. Can everybody see our slides? Yes. All Ooh. right. Thank you very much. All right. Well, my name is Audrey Tao with the founder of the Slow Beaver Brigade. I'm going to give just a little history of how we got started, and then I'm going to pass it on to Cooper. He's going to fill you in on what we're up to right now, and then we got a fun little video to share with you all. All right, just to orient you, um, San Luis Obispo County is in the central coast of California, halfway between LA and San Francisco. And we focus mostly um, in Atascadero on the Salinas River. And the Salinas um, starts in the foothills of San Luis Obispo County and it heads north emptying up into Monterey Bay. And we also are expanding our knowledge right now in Arroyo Grande Creek, which is in South County. All right, and there's a lot of excitement right now in Atascadero and our county around beavers. And uh, how did this all begin? And oddly enough, the story really begins about 15 years ago and a group of us started tracking and getting obsessed with animal tracking. And the Salinas River has great substrate, as you can see in this photo. And so once a week, there'd be a group of us heading out here to learn about the animals in our area. And uh, a couple months into this, if you could imagine, it's a 100, 110 degree Atascadero day. And it's got that, um, as Dr. Emily says, crispy landscape, everything's brown and dry. And we stumble upon a beaver dam and it's lush and a beautiful pond full of water, bird song. It's like 20 degrees cooler, the water's cold. Uh, we just couldn't believe it. The contrast with the, the rest of the land was just unbelievable. And we started telling people about um, the beavers and nobody seemed to know in our county that we had beavers. Even people who grew up here just didn't know beavers existed. Um, my Peterson field guide does not show beavers in our range. So it essentially just became our little secret. And um, over the years we watched the dams, you know, wash out or, uh, just break down and move and become a wall of willows. We've watched sandy beaches become river bottoms. And we also witnessed kind of the lack of support and understanding for the beavers. Um, we've pulled dead beaver floating out of the beaver pond um, before we knew that we could have called Fish and Wildlife to report it as poaching. Um, we've seen ATVs and even full-size Jeep Cherokees um, drive down the center of the river, crushing everything in sight. We've seen star thistle arrive and spread. And right now we're watching the slow spread of this uh, Phragmites reed, choking out the willow and the mule fat all around. Um, so fast forward a little to September 2019 and um, uh, my community got together and we wanted to talk about climate change, kind of talk about this elephant in the room um, so we can share our fears or concerns and really get to what act can we each take to contribute to climate regeneration. So I took this question to the river and um, realized what I wanted to do was to um, just to give back to this place that has given so much to me all these years. And this place only existed because of the beavers. So I shared in that climate council that I wanted to support the beavers as my act of climate regeneration. And sitting next to me was our host and uh, village builder, city repair guy, Roberto Monge. And he's like, yes, a beaver brigade. And I just loved it. I just pictured like a fire brigade and we're all standing in a line passing buckets of water 
And instead of dumping it on a fire, we just dumped it into a beaver pond. And there it was, the Slow Beaver Brigade. And from there, um, we began just um, emailing nonprofits and people in the county um, organizations to see what can be done, what is being done. Um, and uh, Elizabeth Johnson and Biodiversity First were one of the first organizations to say, hey, I wanna support you, this is great. They just immediately got what the beavers did for our county. We also began um, researching and discovered Heidi Perryman's work at Wertha Dam. And we just, you know, we, um, Water Institute's work, we had beaver, and it really hit us that there's a beaver movement in this country, and, and uh, we should be sharing that with the people in our county. Um, and at the same time, COVID began. So what we ended up doing is really focusing on our website, just keeping track of what our beavers are doing and <coughs> sharing that with our community and sharing everything we're learning on social media. Um, we also got a fiscal sponsor, so we became kind of a legitimate organization. We were able to receive donations through Eco Logistics. It's a local organization in our county supporting small organizations. Um, and through the website, we were contacted by Dr. Emily Fairfax, and she, she wanted to know if we would be willing to show her our beaver dam. And can you imagine the excitement when a beaver scientist wants to see your beaver dam? We said, heck yeah. <laughs> and, uh, whoops, sorry, missing the slides here. And, um, and, that, and that began our, um, our educational walks with Dr. Emily. And at that time is when Cooper joined the brigade. So I'm gonna pass it off to him. Hi guys, uh, that's me right there. Uh, I'm Cooper Linehart. And it's, it's just want to say it's such an honor to be included in this presentation. Um, so yeah, I joined the Beaver Brigade last summer while I was finishing up my environmental management degree at Cal Poly. And uh, I'm gonna give you guys a little run through of what we've been up to as the Beaver Brigade. So uh, Audrey and I are kind of like the boots on the ground helping with uh, Dr. Emily Fairfax's research. So uh, we go out to the pond at least once a week and change out those game cameras and check on the beavers. And uh, we take soil moisture and sometimes water samples. And uh, it's definitely the best part of the job because <laughs> we just get to enjoy this, the world that the beavers created. And we're, you know, we're basking in the sun, listening to the red winged blackbirds. And I just realized that, you know, it's these natural places like this that give us so much. And especially an oasis like a beaver pond you know, I just have these feelings of like joy and wonder and hope that, you know, this can be the future for all of our rivers. And uh, so that's, these are the experiences that we wanted to like bring to our community, to the people here. And so that is why I love taking people on our educational walks with Dr. Fairfax. You know, there's, you don't have to like try and convince them about the good that the beavers do. They can see it and really feel it. Uh, we a bunch of us go in barefoot and you're standing in that fresh cold water staring at a hundred foot long dam and you can just tell that every in everyone's eyes and smiles they're they're feeling the magic of the place and uh, we've been really fortunate uh, to have a bunch of local groups and organizations uh, come with us on our walks we've had people from the land conservancy uh, resource conservation district uh, fish and wildlife and so many more and it's so great when we just get to walk in and talk in and enjoying the fresh air. And we realize that a lot of our interests align and uh, that's led to a lot of cool possibilities. Um, so the Resource Conservation District was thinking about putting in uh, fire breaks along the Salinas River in Paso Robles. And uh, they were thinking about BDAs. So they asked if we could help out with that. And I was like, heck yeah, let's, <laughs> I wanna help as much as I can. So we went and uh, scouted out locations and we found a great stretch of river just downstream from this active beaver dam. Um, and it's such a fun complex because they have, uh, you can see that right angle beaver dam right there. Uh, so pretty creative beavers. And so hopefully uh, those will be installed this fall and then we'll be maintaining the BDAs for the RCD. Um, that is unless beavers take them over first, which I bet they will. And uh, we're actually also doing a cleanup in this area tomorrow. So that's exciting. 
And another fun opportunity that we're excited to start is uh, educational field trips uh, for kids. So uh, we've been talking with the Land Conservancy and the Water Mutual Company, and I wanna reach out to all the public schools and uh, start getting this beaver education out there. And so that'll be a really fun thing. And that's kind of what we wanna do as a beaver brigade, just kind of bring benefits to our county, just like how beavers bring benefits to the world around them. Uh, so we actually decided to structure ourselves like a beaver complex where uh, we each manage our, we're each our beavers in this big beaver family. And uh, we each manage our own beaver ponds. Uh, and then the green space to the right shows like the benefits that we'll bring from each pond. So for example, Kate and Fred, they manage the cleanup pond and uh, they're always at the river picking up trash and scouting out new locations. Our monthly pickups. And they've even formed a relationship with the people living at the river. And we started giving them uh, trash bags and they've been bagging their own trash. And uh, we come by on a regular basis and uh, pick up the trash for them. And ever since the, that stretch of river has been looking very clean. And uh, I bet the beavers are a lot happier too. Terry Donovan is another star member of our group. And uh, she, her pond is communication and organization. And she has done wonders on making us more professional and efficient. And uh, she creates these beautiful newsletters um, that are always so fun and informative. And uh, here's Victoria Carranza, another star member of the team. And uh, he, she's jamming at the river with her daughter, Aurora. And uh, she's been great on keeping us up to date on the local stakeholders <laughs> and everything. And um, and helping us prepare for our summit speeches. So uh, thank you, Victoria. <laughs> and you know, it's really exciting because I feel like we've made such a big ripple in this county already, but we're really just getting started. I'm currently training uh, at the Beaver Institute with Mike Callahan and Biodiversity First was generous, generous enough to uh, give me a grant to pay for my tuition. So thank you, BDF. And uh, yeah, so basically in a few weeks, I'll be certified to wrap trees and unblock road culverts and install flow devices and uh, do everything you know it takes so that people can feel comfortable and live peacefully with beavers. And it'll actually give the beavers a chance to expand their population in our county. So they'll be restored in our county bit by bit. And other exciting news, two more beaver brigades were formed in Santa Barbara and Ventura County. And we're just so excited to see that it's taken off and we're so happy with like the work they're doing. And uh, it's just really cool. It makes us feel special uh, <laughs> that people are uh, trying to copy what we're doing. It's great. Hopefully there'll be beaver brigades all over the country. <laughs> and um, yeah. And so, uh, yeah, we're just really honored to be a part of this beaver movement and we want to show you guys a uh, fun video a little taste of what life is like here in slow and it features a uh, uh, original song created on the river about the beavers so i hope you guys enjoy trying to give the beavers a chance. You know, if we can give them some clean water, all they need is the, the plants that they grow alongside. Uh, they live in complete harmony. Beavers are the sanest species I can think of. And they don't need us, but we'd like to be at least helpful. We've always picked up trash, but now we have focused since August I'm picking it up in the Salinas River where the beavers are living nearby. <laughs> because without knowing it, they are the first watershed engineer. 
And at best, we love beavers. We love beavers. Thank you guys. Yeah, thanks so much. Check us out on our website. Send us an email. We just love connecting with all these great organizations. Wow, we love that. It's a great riff on the slow it, spread it, sink it, store it, share it. Beaver love, Beaver Brigade. I got inspired to put on our beaver hat, seeing it in the movie there. So fun. Okay. Well, you know what it is now? It is time for us to transition over. And we're going to, um, Jackie has been dutifully uh, capturing the various questions and she's coordinated or tracked the questions relative to the various presenters throughout the day. And what we're going to do now is um, Go and look at some of those questions and, and try and, and then I'll ask them of the presenters and we'll go through that for a while up until the five o'clock hour and then we'll formally end and all of you who have better things to do than stay on the California Beaver Summit can go off and do that and others of us will continue on asking questions if there's interest in doing that. And I just want to say before we get into that because some of you may uh, take off early is just to, um, in the same way we got inspired by the, the New Mexico Beaver Summit, um, we want to uh, pass it forward a little bit and let folks know that for people in Colorado, there is a group of folks there um, that are planning the Colorado Beaver Summit for October 20th and 22nd of this year. So in the same way the Beaver Brigades are blossoming, uh, looks like these Beaver Summits are also blossoming. So may it be so. All righty, all righty, let's see, what do we got here? Um, let's see. One for Emily is uh, um, about the data on the beaver pond slowing but not stopping water and, and, and where can people learn more about just the, the kinds of data around trying to understand the relationship of beaver ponds and water and quantity and, and things of that nature? That's a good question. There's uh, sort of the large scale data of looking at like the USGS uh, hydrography data, so just the stream flow data, and realizing that most of these streams don't go to zero and they do have beavers on them. And so then it would follow that the beavers have not completely stopped the water. Uh, beyond that, there is a lot of research coming out where people are monitoring the flow immediately downstream of beaver dams, and they're seeing that it is more consistent. Uh, a lot of this research shows up in the form of groundwater being raised and base flow being raised, and so there's a little bit less of people studying the peak flows themselves and more of people studying sort of the downstream summertime effects. Is there still water in the creek? or not. Um, I know Sherry Westbrook up in Canada has done some great work on that. Uh, Joe Eaton's done some really great work looking at flows. There's uh, additional work that's being done currently in, I believe, Washington and Oregon on this topic. So lots of emerging research. Um, you can also go visit a beaver dam and see all the water downstream. I highly recommend it. Yay. Yeah. Um, thank you. Nina, are you still around? And uh, there's a question for you that is interested or the folks are interested in, in understanding what if any efforts are there for corporations that became wealthy by extracting resources and degrading the land uh, to pay for those restorations instead of the taxpayers? Um, one of the things I believe about how uh, BLM does this is that we don't have the funds to actually do any restoration. We normally work with partners who have that ability. And those partnerships, whether it's Caltrout, Trout Unlimited, or, um, you know, like Endow, the Nevada Department of, uh, you know, uh, and or Cal Fish and Wildlife or other agencies. But uh, BLM does not have a huge amount of money 
uh, we normally provide, you know, bare essentials. So we provide fencing, we provide, uh, you know, the wood, we cut down pinion pines and, and our crew, uh, fire crews chop them up into nice posts and so on and so forth. So um, we generally use things on site and it's relatively inexpensive and it's not a huge cost to us for restoration. The work that was done on the Trinity River is funded by the Bureau of Reclamation. And the, I used to work for Bureau of Reclamation and they have the funds to do that because they sell water. And as everyone knows, water is extraordinarily valuable in the state of California. And they use that money to mitigate for the effects of their dams on uh, aquatic systems. And so that's why the funding is available there uh, for that type of work to be done. That's not being provided by uh, BLM or the Forest Service who have a, or, or Cal Fish and Wildlife who have a lot of the lands along the Trinity River, along Clear Creek, but those funds are being uh, provided for mitigation. Um, so um, they're, that, 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 those are very expensive. I absolutely agree that it, they're very expensive, those projects, but they're mitigation for the loss of the 106 miles or more of fisheries habitat, and I forget how many it is on the um, Clear Creek, but but BLM, uh, BLM is not paying for it. Uh, uh, reclamation pays for it as mitigation for the dams, and it's being paid for by the water that those dams produce and the sale of that water to the irrigation districts and to farmers and to whomever they're selling the water to. All right. Well, that's good to hear the Bureau of Reclamations on that. <laughs> Otherwise, it might be the Bureau of Reclame Nation, and we should put the water yeah, back. We don't have a lot of nation. money. So, yes, uh, uh, but Reclamation um, does a lot of the work, and they have the funds for it. Nice. Uh, Bob Pagliuco, you still on here? There's a question for you about uh, how does the natural hydrograph change with the addition of a BDA? How does a natural hydrograph change with the addition of a BDA? Well, I think Emily kind of uh, talked a little bit about that in, in her talk and had some really cool animations to kind of show how that works. Um, you know, it, uh, some of the areas actually slow down, uh, some of the areas speed up. Um, you get flow dynamism there, you get a lot of dynamic uh, processes happening. And, Flow regimes. Um, I think, you know, potentially uh, one of the things we look for when we plan these things is how far upstream is this um, going to be influenced and whether we want a depositional environment, we worried about bank erosion. Uh, and it's all part of the planning process when you kind of put these structures in. If you do have sensitive infrastructure upstream and you're working with a bunch of landowners in an agricultural area, but uh, slow it, spread it, sink it, store it. Uh, I think, um, you know, I, I think it helps the hydrograph last a lot longer into the drier months as uh, Emily had shown in her presentation and others have as well. Nice. Well, to the degree BDA support the flow, it's a hydrograph instead of a lodrograph because there's at least some water there. Benny, um, we're wondering about if uh, in your work with uh, forest land, timberland owners, and at that scale, is, is are there other timberland owners that you're, you all are in relationship with at the state level that are talking about beavers as well, or is Collins Pine all alone? Um, I mean, I cannot speak for the entire state of California in terms of timber companies. Um, I know that there have been some nonprofits that are working with Sierra Pacific Industries with their meadow systems in terms of better grazing and willow plantings. I'm not sure if they're doing BDAs or any other type of in-stream structures. Um, I believe Beatty and Associates was involved with some meadow and in-stream work, um, but I, I haven't heard a lot of it going around through California and the timber companies. It's, the regulations with it are really complicated. 
um, timber companies are treated differently. So for example, we don't have to go through ACE or Corps of Engineers, um, but it gets a little complicated because CAL FIRE is our regulating agency and they don't want to necessarily get involved with the water aspect. It's not quite their jurisdiction, even if it's still our timberlands. Um, so it's, it's just complicated for timber companies to do this type of work. Um, and it truly does require the assistance, like I mentioned in my talk, of, of a ton of different groups to be able to make it happen. All right, thanks for that. Well, at least one thing in California is, uh, unlike Oregon, beaver, beaver isn't listed as a predator, meaning a predator of trees. And <laughs> uh, Joe, all right, you, I, you, I think various folks and Susan as well took various uh, attempted to uh, move this um, on, but the question really here is, I think it continues to be needing to be spoken about is, um, you had a photo about degraded upland streams and this person has a sense that it looks like uh, they're highly impacted by cattle. And so the key question is, is, is livestock grazing compatible with, with healthy riverscapes? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, it can be and it can't be. I, I mean, right, like there's, there's plenty of examples of poor grazing management. Um, and uh, that that basically, you know, it's, it's they're just eating out all the forage the beaver would need, and um, that that's obviously not going to work. Um, however, there's um, there's a lot of wonderful examples of of good grazing management, um, and the two can coexist. Um, you know, I I had that one slide about uh, you know, is it a compatible land use to have an active riverscape? And with, with grazing, it's, it is, and you can produce, you know, really good forage. Um, the difference is, you know, you've, you're pay, you know, somebody is paying. And for a lot of producers, I think that um, they don't necessarily have the luxury of the economics on just the price of, uh, you know, selling beef um, to pay for what it takes for grazing, you know, for responsible grazing management and to keep cows moving. Um, I mean, it's something I think we should be looking at as part of the ongoing maintenance costs um, associated with this sort of work. If we we know what it takes to do responsible grazing management, that uh, beaver and cows can coexist, um, and uh, sometimes that can be paid for on the economics of the actual cattle operations alone. Um, but uh, it's it's a really good investment. It's also a really good investment um, if we can better manage our uplands so that there's more green groceries for the cows outside of the creek. Um, then they have less of a reason to be down in the creek. And so there's there's a whole bunch of things that can be done, but there are costs. And uh, I think the conservation world should be looking at that. It's one of the reasons I really like this shift to a focus on investing in natural infrastructure, because no one in their right mind is going to build a bridge or a road or a building or any traditional gray infrastructure or water pipeline, et cetera, without considering that there will be ongoing maintenance costs. And if we are truly in a situation where we're getting completely back to, to nature, which is rare um, with our hand out of the cookie jar, then you can look at truly self-sustaining solutions. But so many of these landscapes we are co-managing. And so some sorts of maintenance um, is necessary. And I, I think the grazing can fit in, in that as well. Sorry for the rambling, but it's oh, well, yes and know. no. <laughs> Eloquent, eloquent way to say it depends, as you alluded to earlier. <laughs> I think sometimes the poor cattle get blamed for being degenerative disturbers when in fact the, the business end of that decision is on the two-legged side and the cows are, you know, victims of that thing. And uh, um, Susan, some folks were, trying, were wondering about what was the response to HB 2844 in Oregon to reclassify beaver? Um, I don't know, actually. Um, I guess, um, you know, the sort of the debate I'm a little bit more familiar with was uh, the effort to try and ban um, 
beaver hunting and trapping on federal lands, which has been a big debate over the last year in Oregon. And the Fish and Wildlife Commission here decided not to do that, but to kind of turn it over for further study and to like a beaver working group that we have here to uh, try and you know look into that issue more. But in terms of reclassifying beaver, um, I'm sorry, I'm not um, well informed about that. Anybody else in the crew know anything about organs HB 2844? Yeah, to I, uh, I testified on that and the bill was not put forward for vote at this time. Um, I believe it is also in that situation where there needs to be a little bit more study done. That would be a little more study. Okie doke. Um, let's see, uh, Betsy and Charna, what kind of environmental needs uh, do beaver need in order to have good habitat in terms of the amount of water and the gradients? Um, well, certainly with water, they need um, some surface expression to, to dam, and then um, there needs to be enough groundwater um, connectivity that uh, riparian vegetation can grow. Um, so those are some of the, the um, most basic components that they need. Um, what was the second part of the question? I, I, I think, yeah, they were interested in water, amount of water and, and gradient, which I guess you're uh, addressing is slope. And... Yeah, gradient. Um, our experience is that they really like the low gradient alluvial reaches and, and preferably where there is floodplain connectivity so that when they build the dams, the waters can disperse and the stream power is reduced. Um, that's their preference, but um, you know they're not given that opportunity too often these days. And they're they're generalists, and they can make do where they can't build dams by living in in banks and and um, uh, less than optimal conditions. But they're very subject to predation under those cir circumstances. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I, I think it comes to a surprise to many people the, um, when we're trying to reestablish beaver or tracking existing beaver populations, just how, uh, how much mountain lion, especially in California, love to eat beaver. And if those beavers don't have enough deep water and, and refugia and being able, a capacity to escape, uh, as, as often has been said, uh, certain beaver reintroduction campaigns are just mountain lion feeding stations at certain times. And I think the folks up in the Met how are acutely aware of this. And I think Kate on Wednesday had shared a question was asked about, that's a little bit to this question um, that it seems to me like the person is asking around just general assessment of what makes good beaver habitat. And the MedHow folks have a scorecard that is a nice introductory way for folks that allow you to analyze a, a series of factors around what makes good beaver ha habitat that has to do with valley width and slope and water and flow and vegetation and uh, predation and you know a bunch of these key factors. So Kate, Kate might be able to share that again or somebody else. Or go to the MetHow Beaver Project. I'm happy to put that link. And uh, Utah State has a good uh, assessment uh, sheet as well. Joe, I don't know if you want to put a link to that. Uh, yeah, I can, I can go dig that up and put a link up. But yeah, it's basically brat on the ground. So um, you can just answer the question. I, I, it is important to point out that so many of the places where there are beaver in California right now, they are so below the capacity of the landscape to support them that it can be really misleading to draw conclusions about you know where where they can be like, you know, we, we find them in extremely steep streams um, that just barely have a trickle and they make dramatic impacts to those. But the caveat is that's when all the easier stuff has been filled up and they're spilling over into those areas, right? And so California has a lot of stuff that beaver could dam and, and uh, make a living in, but it also has a lot of degraded waterways, some of which are deep enough that, you know, easy trailer park living in a bank lodge is, will suffice. So um, just be careful with what conclusions we draw, you know, at, at, at a system so, so far below capacity. Yeah, I, I think some of us like the term that Ben Goldfarb was using on Wednesday about castorified, <laughs> the, the sense of just the, the amount of beaver that were in so many of our places across the country, across the nation in California before. Um, 
Kate. Uh, folks who are interested, somebody's interested more in just wanting, if you can share more information on the whole remnant beaver dams in the High Sierra and the meadows and some of those studies about the aging and, and Sabre's work. Yeah, so that was also put in the Q&A box and I posted a link. Uh, I can do that again after I talk about what I'm talking about right now. Um, so thankfully, there were already many remnant dams that have been carbon dated that Rick talked about on Wednesday in Plumas County, in the Red Clover Valley and in other areas. And so we have several examples already that were discovered and carbon dated in the 80s and 90s. And so this is just adding to that body of evidence. And what I'm appreciating about Sabra's work is she's trying to help uh, folks understand what to look for in the riverscape and what are signatures of beaver dams when you see these constricted points that are now grassy and tufted, those are good places to like dig in deeper and see. And in this case, this is a pretty deep creek, Yellow Creek in these spots. And so, you know, when you're out there surveying, you're like in some areas, it's, it's almost overhead, but you can see the water clarity is really high. And so we were able to see a lot of sticks literally sticking out of the banks. And so, um, yeah, that's, those are the kind of signatures that we need to be looking for and um, getting carbon dated and just adding to the body of evidence so that we can continue to uh, rethink this, this age-old story that's been persisting and, and really affecting how beaver are managed in this era in particular. Nice. All right, uh, Audrey and Cooper, I, everybody wants to know what's the, what's the secret sauce in your all's beaver brigade thing? Cause you guys are clearly having way too much fun. So like, we need, you know, you, you get the, you've gone beyond the fundamentals. You're at emphasizing the fun on this. What do you got for us? We just have a lot of fun. And we have this understanding that we need to be in the river more than we are behind the computer. So mm -hmm. <laughs> that's the goal. <laughs> what else? <laughs> you said it pretty well. <laughs> All right. I'll keep it up. Keep it up. Keep it up. Um, let me see, heading back up here. Uh, boy, let's see. Um, Emily, folks, like a little bit of, uh, and this came up for others as well, but the question is, uh, how do you explain the effects of beavers on water supply to private landowners who are concerned about their water rights? And this was an issue on Wednesday as well. I think the whole water rights and beaver, and are beavers stealing our water or not? And how do we explain those effects? Got some thoughts for us? Yeah, I think a big part of it just comes down to being very clear that like you will probably see a change in the water that you're used to. And if you've been watching the stream flow a certain way for the last 10 years, beavers will change that. And to not be freaked out when you see the change, because what you might notice initially is the big reduction in your peak flow, or like they're spreading this water out and suddenly your river's not running as much. There's a lot of disconnect between seeing fast flowing water and thinking about volumes of water coming through an area. Um, and so just like acknowledging those concerns as real and that the things they see are real and expected, I think goes a long way. Because if you come in and you're like, well, just trust me, like it's, it's fine. And then they see this huge reduction in flow or they see the water flowing slower, they'll feel like you lied or that you were misleading. And so being very upfront, like it will change. It will look like less water. But let me like talk to you about why you have to wait it out until we get to the summertime and the fall and then look for the water. And it's going to be there when it didn't used to be there. And so just trust me for at least one year and see it. And if after a year you disagree and you don't want your water to be like that anymore, we can have another conversation. But being honest and being genuine with your connection, I think goes a really long way when you're talking to landowners, especially because they are right to feel stressed about water, especially in California. We're all really stressed about water out here and protecting your water is fair and beavers are helping even if it doesn't feel that way. Yay, yeah. Um, Nina, there's a couple questions that are interesting and, and while we do recognize you're with the BLM now, some of us do know that you used to work for the US Forest Service before. So these two questions, um, one is, 
are beavers more prominent on US Forest Service lands rather than BLM? And what relationship, if any, does the Forest Service have with beavers and BDAs? And so I think you could probably take a whack at those even though you're currently being paid um, by the BLM. Wait a minute, there we go. Um, yes, when I worked on the Sequoia National Forest, we had river beavers in the Kern River, North Fork Kern River, and we had river beavers in the South Fork Kern, but we had beavers building dams in tributaries like Fish Creek and as um, Emily had said in Manter Creek and some of the other tributaries to the South Fork. Um, we have uh, beavers building dams. We have built them building up on, um, up in some of the bigger meadows that we have up along Fish Creek. And uh, though we do have some unwilling landowners up there who have nested properties who don't like them. Um, however, their cows love them. Um, and so it's, uh, it, we have, uh, and then I know that, uh, and part of that is because of the large swaths of land that the Forest Service owns. They can, they don't mind having the beavers there because they're not affecting infrastructure. They're not affecting roads. They're not affecting um, people's homes. They're not affecting, uh, you know, transmission lines. So, so we're much more, uh, large landowners are much more comfortable with these animals, if, they're no, if there's no infrastructure being threatened by them, then they're beneficial out there on the landscape and there's no reason why we should do anything with them. So um, in general, my understanding is at least for the biologists and fisheries folks that I knew and hydrologists, uh, we knew we had beavers, but we weren't going to um, uh, stand for any elimination. And I gave uh, presentations to the fly fishing groups to say that, you know, uh, beaver dams are perfectly fine. They don't limit the distributions of fishes. Fishes can move past them, through them, over them, live in the ponds, benefit from the ponds, jump back over. Uh, they're, they're really beneficial to fisheries. And so as fly fishermen, they should not be worried about beaver dams being out there on their favorite fly fishing uh, locations because it uh, it just would not adversely impact any of the fishers, fisheries that they were concerned with. And, and so, um, and I know that we have uh, a lot of, for BLM, um, since we border places like, and we have lands along the South Fork Kern, um, and we actually own a lot of flatter land, um, there's there are beaver in in those areas as well, and and again, uh, uh, as a land management agency, we're not really getting rid of them unless there's issues with infrastructure. But there are so many mechanisms available that are relatively inexpensive to control um, potential effects to roads or other infrastructure. That again, we as a land management agency would not really have a reason to get rid of them. Uh, our only concern would be um, that the habitat that they're providing for birds, the willows, for um, some of the willow flycatchers and other rare birds and are, are being able to be maintained. Great, thank you. All right, Bob, um, there's a question here wondering if there are efforts to target areas for building BDAs to create additional habitat for existing beaver populations as a kind of riparian highway? Um, I, I might have misled you all. I, I really don't do this work. I basically take everyone else's work and then just present on it. Um, <laughs> we, we do um, a lot of prioritizations and um, we, don't, we don't necessarily, I, I'm not actively running a BRAT or a caster model to kind of identify these areas, but I have been involved in a lot of different restoration prioritization efforts. And this is coming up. We're working on a big one right now um, up in the Klamath Reservoir Reach above the dams, getting ready for those uh, things to, to come out. And Spencer Creek up there is is definitely something that um, is a really uh, great place that already has some beaver and there's already some been some BDAs in there. So um, there's definitely uh, some some 
options out there where folks are thinking about this stuff. Um, and, you know, these tools are out there and it just kind of takes the right, uh, the right time and place to kind of employ these strategies. So there's a lot of uh, different efforts going on uh, with um, led by the Department of Fish and Wildlife right now um, called SHARP, um, looking for prioritization of uh, salmon habitat projects in certain areas. I think the focuses right now are in the lower eel, uh, I think over in the, the Russian Mendocino and also Lagunitas Creek. And these uh, opportunities to potentially, you know, include some of these restoration techniques, um, it's, it's ripe right now. We can definitely start including that. I'm not involved in those because those are out of my jurisdiction, but a lot of people on this call or on this webinar are. So uh, that might be an, an opportunity to employ that and get some of this habitat um, on some of those those lands and these prioritization processes that are ongoing right now. Great, thank you. Uh, Benny, this is a, a question for you and with your wildlife biologist hat on. I mean, it, the, re the relationship of beaver and salmonids has had a lot more play, but it feels like in the recent years, some of the other species, like you mentioned, Cascades frog and willow flycatcher, those biologists are beginning to recognize that beaver is their friend. And so I'm wondering if your experience in the general wildlife biologist community is beginning to look more favorably at beaver as, even though you may not be a beaver person, you're a flycatcher person or a frog person or a snake person, um, do you begin to see beaver as a keystone species to move your, your specific species forward if, if that's the case? Uh, short answer, yes, definitely. And I think Karen's talk really hit on this yesterday too, talking about the biodiversity and just the unique habitat features that beaver dams and beaver meadows create. Um, you know, specific, I mentioned in my talk that I study Cascades frog pretty extensively on our property and we know that they need those calmer backwaters that are typically fish free and specifically at Child's Meadow those are the exact conditions that the beavers are creating that the Cascades frogs are then able to utilize because we do have fish in the stream. Um, and so it's pretty much the only spot that those frogs are able to breed is those, those backwaters that the beaver dams are creating. So I think I answered the question. Yeah, yeah, no, I think we're just that, yeah, the increasing recognition by so many other folks in the, in the bio biology realm and the, it's interesting, the botanists, I think I want to keep getting more botanists involved here too, because there's so many plant benefits and such. And, all right. Um, and I'll, oh, go ahead. I'll add real quick to Brock. I mean, we're, we're taking some of the concepts that Joe mentioned from his talk and applying it to another population of Cascades frogs that we have where it's a system that beavers will never occur in, but we're using those beaver techniques of creating some, you know, in-stream structures to back up the water to improve habitat there because we are seeing major drought issues. So it's not just the presence of beaver, but just what we're learning from what beavers can do and how we can apply that on the landscape too. Yeah, it's an amazing epiphany, the idea of just keeping more water on the land, huh? In a Mediterranean and droughty climate. All right, Joe, um, is, it was all very fun to talk about freedom space out there in the wildlands, but what happens when we get to the urban area? What are we going to do? Is that so low risk? Um, it depends. Next question. <laughs> um, it's, um, yeah, it, it's, you know what, it's the same exact planning thought process. Um, map the footprint of the area that could plausibly flood not for the purpose of necessarily getting it all back everywhere, but then to look at the overlay of what, what land uses and what infrastructure fall within that riverscape, which tends to often be a lot bigger than, for example, in an urban area, what FEMA might've mapped as, as the floodplain or floodway, um, and also things adjacent to it. And then, then it's a, in a negotiation to figure out you know, what, what, could, what could be left over. And so this idea of recovery potential, um, it's, I mean, really modest little um, 
uh, gains in space, right? Instead of fighting with a with riprap in an urban area and just getting tiny little pockets of floodplain that are a fraction of the former riverscape can produce really important kind of local habitat as well as uh, sort of relief valves. So no, we've worked with uh, Mile High Flood District in Denver. We've worked with uh, Park City, a, a number of municipalities to um, basically uh, develop adaptive beaver management plans as well as, you know, apply that same thought process. And I, and I think it's a big misconception that you can't get away with any of this stuff in urban areas because it's too high risk. It is, you know, you got to put your, your, uh, I mean, you have to be responsible about it and you, and it's a, it's a little more, uh, serious situation than just dragging volunteers out to the middle of nowhere and throwing stuff in where there can't be any impacts, but, um, it can be done if done responsibly, and it can be quite sustainable right in the middle of an urban area. And let me just say that as a person who lived with beavers in an urban area for a decade, it definitely can happen and it definitely can create little uh, new habitats and micro habitats and all kinds of new wildlife and uh, real biodiversity in an urban creek. And that was Heidi Perryman, if folks didn't, we didn't have her pinned there so you could spotlight and see her. But yes, Heidi, the work of the Martinez beavers in Worth the Dam is obviously one of, in California's in the West, great case studies. And for us other Californians, if next time you're wine tasting in the Napa Valley, just go check out Napa Creek. And Marjorie spoke about that on Wednesday and the amazing work and the benefit of those urban beavers. And that's downtown Napa, if anybody thinks that's not urban. So we've got a number of case studies. So I think Joe's entirely- They've, they've done a really good job in Napa. I was amazed um, the work that they've done there to get their floodplain, to get buildings out of their floodplain um, because of the flooding of the Napa River, I think once before it flooded a lot of areas and it cost them a lot of money. And so they were able to um, get the funds to pull all those buildings out of the floodplain right through downtown and move that into more of a park. But that was a lot lower risk to infrastructure than having all those things there. So I think they've taken enormous strides to make that river system more natural. And now even Los Angeles uh, is going to be trying to get portions of the LA River looking more normal again, taking away that you know, cement uh, movement of water, they're now talking about um, beginning to return some more natural portions to that. And I, uh, I know that um, that'll take time, but it'll be very interesting to see that uh, how that proceeds over the next 15 years. But boy, Hollywood's going to lose a bunch of good car chase scene. <laughs> I, I know, I know. Um, I do want to say just for the, the, the everyone who's still with us here, um, we have passed our, our five o'clock threshold a little bit. Still see that there's 180 attendees out there. Um, but I do want to just acknowledge that we're at five. Thank you all very much for that, um, for being here for up till now with us. By all means, go to the website. The talks will be loaded up by tomorrow for today. The Wednesdays are already there. And um, otherwise, uh, those who can stay of the presenters and um, all of you will keep going until six. I have a open, an open hour now and we'll, I've got a couple more questions just so that each of the presenters had two and then we'll open it up to um, people can raise a hand and we'll from the audience there and we'll let you in. So thank you very much everybody for being here if you have to take off. Um, all righty, let's see. Um, uh, Betsy, why, uh, let's see, uh, why is it difficult, why, uh, I'm not sure I get the question. The question has to do with what's difficult about beaver's legal status in California. Well, you've Betsy why, change? why is it difficult to change beaver's legal status in California? Uh -huh, that's Bet Betsy bailed. Um, okay. She had to leave. Anybody else? Yeah, I, I think. Okay the difficulty of changing Beaver's legal status in California? I would punt it to Kate, who's been trying to do this along with you, Brock, for 10 years. Um, I don't know. 
I'm, I'm not the moderator, but I can act like one. Um, I'm happy to take another crack at it. Um, you know, I, I think it's just there's a lot of differences of opinions. And, you know, there are definitely people within the department who would like to see the regulations change. And so it's not a, you know, blanket statement that the department is just against it. It's, you know, there, there, there was a moment where they were getting a lot of pressure and, and they, they did lean back in and say, okay, you know, we're not going to allow this. And, um, here's why. And so those are the reasons that I put up. Um, so, you know, I feel like it's our, at this point, it's our job to, you know, give them the political and legal cover so that they can say yes, and the biological cover, because I feel like it's not, I mean, there, there absolutely are biological reasons. Of course, we do not want to be like, unnecessarily spreading, you know, pathogens that we don't need to be, but they can be tested, they can be quarantined, you know, it's, this is not, this, this has been solved. And so it's just a matter of, of really supporting the department with funding. You know, this is me, a non-department person saying this. So if there's anyone in the audience who wants to like talk in the chat and, you know, feed me some lines here, I'm, I'm really happy for the support, but really, you know, funding to do this, and um, and then uh, you know not making it so crazy complex that then hands get tied. You know, there is we have so many interests in California from the real estate, like Joe's talking about, but especially agricultural interests. And they you know they will not be happy if if suddenly it's just like we cannot do anything with beaver anymore. We can't kill them. We can't trap them. You know, etc. So really figuring out ways that we can support those interests and, and give the agriculturalist strategies as well and and make it, um, you know, something that we can do in places where it's appropriate. And maybe it's it's not something, you know, maybe we do just like, okay, we, we, we don't relocate them within agricultural areas, but we can take them out of agricultural areas if there are extras. And um, again, I, I feel like this has been solved, but I, I don't, I mean, I, back to Marjorie, what she was saying is like, no one has forced us to do this. And it's, it's until we get forced to do it, it might not happen. And so I think that's kind of, you know, I, I know when we met with Chuck Bonham, you know, Director Bonham, we, we got a whole letter together, like, okay, we're gonna do this, 2015, Michael Pollack, a bunch of us went and met, you know, Renee Henry from Trout Unlimited and folks from, you know, TNC. And we're like, look, what can we do here? And, and they were just like, are you kidding me? We just like got finished with the wolf management plan. Do you realize how expensive that was? And it's like, forget about it. We're, we don't have the capacity. And so I feel like that's where we, we have an opportunity to really support the department in identifying the funding sources and making, you know, helping build their capacity so that this can be done would be my answer. Nice. All right, so from here on out, I'm just cruising the Q&A and I'm gonna, I'll toss out a question and any of you all who wanna pick it up, but following up where Kate just went, um, Elijah Portugal, who's a beaver believer out there and working for the department, I'm adding you Elijah, although maybe you're asking privately right now, does anyone have recommendations or examples of good funding models for, re for responsible entities um, to support ongoingly, you know, living with beaver strategies in a restoration context? So I guess it's really a question of, do we have any good funding models, granting models that could start actually directing uh, restoration funds to coexist in strategies with beavers in other, in other states, other places? Anybody want to take a whack at that? I, I can, if, but happy to defer if somebody else. Uh, well, so I think what we've seen where the policy barriers have been removed in other states, um, there's still these remain unfunded mandates. Um, and so Kate's point about making sure that more than just the shame, which is um, appropriate at the high level um, to, to just how far behind um, CDF and W is. I mean, it's inexcusable really. Um, but uh, in addition to that, some funds uh, need to go along with it. And I, I think that the way we're funding all of our restoration and conservation with the same old tired grant models, 
um, is a real problem. Um, and it's a real problem for any projects. It, it favors grant type funding, the sort of year to year, spend whatever we can scrape together, favors the sort of one and done type approaches. And none of this stuff is one and done, right? All of this stuff is a process um, and you want to get to the point where you don't, you're not that necessary to the process, but, you know, sorry, we are part of it for at least a while. And that costs money, whether that's for CDF and W staff to be able to provide those sorts of support and services or to pay for them for, you know, hiring swift water design. I mean, it's, it, it costs money. It takes effort. And those are good jobs, actually. So um, I think the alternative models like uh, groups like what Boot Blue Forest um, has done in the Yuba for forest health restoration, but resilience bonds and environmental impact funds that get a broader net of beneficiaries to share in the payment of this of these sorts of projects. It's much easier to roll that stuff in than it is for agencies who don't know what their legislatures or what Congress is going to appropriate to them um, to have a little bit more flexibility and pool some of those things and provide support for that. And so there's some really promising sort of frontiers there, but uh, there are some very real barriers to, you know, even when all the, all the, um, you know, the doors are open and, and you can do it. Sometimes it doesn't happen because, you know, even, uh, you know, you're an irrigator, you call, you want to do the right thing. You want to help um, see this beaver not go to waste, but, you know, live trapped and relocated somewhere where it can do good. But there's no one answers the phone. There's no there's no one there. So so the funding the funding is a big piece of this. I, I could just add to that, uh, Joe. I know that the state of Oregon uh, dedicates seven point four percent of their lottery funds towards restoration, and they utilize that for their match to the NOAA Pacific States Salmon Recovery Fund there. And I know that that's kind of already taken up for Oregon, but. Um, I, I do agree that, you know, it's more of a long term bond like, um, you know, funding source would be more appropriate than, you know, kind of this one to two to five year cycle um, element that we just keep getting stuck in there. But yeah. Wow. Lotto and beavers. A lot of beavers. Um, Muriel, you've got a hand up. So I just let you in. You want to ask a question? Yes, I would love to hear about what beavers could do in the San Joaquin Valley. Let's dream big. Uh, well, let's figure out Friant Dam and figure out, I mean, there has been some good work on the main stem San Joaquin in some years, right? NRDC's work lately about trying to figure out on behalf of Fish and Chinook to get those flows more consistent, but yeah, San Joaquin, that's a big one. And Lake and the Tulare Lake, imagine that back in the day when the whole bottom end of the valley was nothing but a massive beaver swamp down there full of elk and grizzly and yoke people and beavers. It's, a, it's the most and productive fish. agricultural every area on the planet. And it also has the highest, uh, it's, it's one of the number one or two most uh, lowest income and highest poverty rates of anywhere in the United States, back to back. So the San Joaquin in the social system is rough. And I think there's a few beavers there. You got a specific spot in San Joaquin you want to work on your own? Well, I don't know that we're gonna get traction on a specific so spot because the San Joaquin is kind of big. I mean, one of my favorite, absolute favorite engineering failures. I mean, you, you saw me on Wednesday, I collect them. One of my favorites is a, it's a road crossing that's next to a canal and both of them are broken and offset by a matter of feet because people have been pumping so much groundwater in spite of the canal that everything has subsided enough to break the surface conveyance by pumping the groundwater. So I, I don't think that we're, it's the same problem as Wednesday. I don't think we're serious about the problem. And when everyone's hungry and starving and completely miserable because the Central Valley has given up on egg because there's no water and all the pumps are now standing, you know, 20 feet above the water and they can't drill anymore. I think at that point it'll become, you know, somebody's going to just turn the money press. But until then, I really think that we need to just 
make the case for process-based restoration and beavers in California on that basis of groundwater recharge for ag. Joe, I think you're, I think you're really nailing that, that point of, at one level, it can't be about beavers or you get that pushback against, just based on the historical misinterpretation of beavers. So I think, I think the San Joaquin is one of the higher hanging fruits on a very thorny tree. The uplands with less human infrastructure, we might be able to get a, foot, a foothold. And I think if we wanted to do projects there, we'd want really, really good, robust discharge data at the bottom of whatever we're treating to prove, okay, we can get base flow. And then we'd want to start looking at what's your, what are your ground elevations below those recharge zones? And can we start adding water? Can we hydraulically jack the Central Valley back up? Because there's no way we're going to fire a bullet train through there from San Francisco to LA. Like, in the most active subsidence zone in California? I mean, that's the next great engineering failure. We're just not there yet. So I think rather than thinking, you know, small thousands and a couple of BDAs, think, you know, two digit millions and 30, 50, 100 miles along that range. Maybe if you dream big enough, you do get people interested. I don't know my thoughts and i would just say having looked at the depredation permits for california for the last decade that the san joaquin valley is one of the hardest places um it depredates most beavers so it's a tough sell having worked a bunch in the san joaquin with my other more general water hat on beyond bigger than beavers per se is uh, the, I would, you know, look at the Kern Water Bank, the, the Kings River Basin, um, look at what they're calling flood mar, which is managed aquifer recharge, and they're, they're doing these, you know, hundreds to thousands of acres of recharge zones and groundwater banking and those alluvial fans on the east side are, that's, that's a, yeah, we got a lot of work to go there, boy. All right, Todd, you um, are up. I see your name here. So what you got for us? Todd Enders, unmute yourself. Well, I, I thought I, I saw Joe had something to add in that last comment, sorry. Todd can't speak. No, I, I can speak, can you hear me? Okay, yeah. yeah. So I just wanted to ask Kate, because she's the she's the bomb, like which California State Assembly Committee heads and Senate committee heads can we chase? Because I know how they're operated. It, it uses coins. How can we chase them to get a reduction in the top down obstruction of reintroducing beavers? It's a great question. And since I'm not an active lobbyist, I'm actually the wrong person to ask, but we work with a lot of lobbyists. And so I think, you know, if this, you know, if there's an interest in that, that, that question can be answered. There are people who do these initiatives all the time and we work with a lot of them. So I've already put out a few emails to our lobbyist partners of just like, who would you um, pursue? Uh, to carry a bill like that to try to get a legislative change made. And so stay tuned, but maybe someone else on the call has more experience with that and actually working with different representatives towards uh, changing wildlife code. Joe, did you have something earlier you want to grab or get in on since there's no hands up? Sure, it's, it's not a million miles off of Todd and Kate were just talking about, but back to the San Joaquin, I'd just say um, it is a little overwhelming and it is discouraging and, you know, um, but things can change pretty quickly um, sometimes. Um, I mean, look at what's happening on Wall Street right now where there's this, I mean, this is part of what's going to drive the, the resilience bond market is that there's so much demand for climate resilience, whatever the hell that means to people, 
um, there's way bigger investor demand than there are actual viable projects to get this done. You know, and this is coming from the same sector that was heavily lobbying to, you know, deny, <laughs> um, you know, only a few short years ago. So um, I, I think that in the Central Valley specifically, one of the advantages of a huge, you know, agribusiness, um, you know, sort of landscape is that there are a few key players. Um, there are some massive, massive landowners. Um, and if you can get in the same way that, you know, it's much easier dealing with, you know, some down to earth ranchers, but in the same way, um, if those um, businesses are singing the praises and telling the story and taking the credits that go along um, with this, where Beaver um, is, is a tool that's, that's helpful for them managing their lands, then that can spread pretty rapidly. So I wouldn't give up so quick um, on the San Joaquin. I think there's 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 actually a lot of a lot of opportunity there. Well, you just got to get Stuart and Linda Resnick of Paramount Farms in the Westlands Water District because that's one of the biggest farming operations. And right now, Westlands is all in on just raising Shasta Dam. That's their their solution. And the twin tunnels under the Delta, right? So just pipe dreams and and raise the dam. Unfortunately, spell raise R A I S instead of R A Z E, but that's a that's the damage of the damage. That's a different conundrum. All right, who else wants to get in on some action here? Because I got no hands up. I, I, I wanted to throw Joe under the bus just because I've been bugging him about this in the chat, which is <laughs> um, there's just this perennial question of water rights and oh, and the paranoia and how do you deal with that? And Joe was just telling me what they did, and I think it's a brilliant strategy. And I want to just get it on the record. Sorry, Joe. All good. Oh, you want me to say it? <laughs> you are now under the bus. Dude, oh, God. Yeah, I want oh, you to tell I us about crawl it. I got to out from underneath that moving. Okay. Um, yeah, sorry. What was uh, there's been a bunch of chat. Was this this, this was this about thing? the the flow control device with the gate? Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. I see. Yeah. So you you asked um, that in we we have proposed in some uh, projects to gain the trust of a downstream irrigator or water diverter uh, to um, to basically put the best structures in um, and then potentially install you know uh, pond levelers and flow leveling devices because. Um, if they're going to take their water during their turn and it isn't there, then you could, you know, grab a little out of the out of the ponds and use this, and then you know, put, plug it back up. Much like a lot of irrigation operations operate anyway, we haven't actually done any of that yet. We've used it successfully on multiple occasions to um, as for for just negotiating. Basically, yeah, I hear you. That, like Emily was suggesting, this could be a problem. Why don't we commit to if it's a problem that's realized, then we can pop those things in and um, and then that can become you know, part of the solution. And part of that is committing, just like on the Beaver Translocation, committing, hey, there's some expense, there's a, he a headache there. We're including that in our budget. We're going to do this. And so it's all just been talk and then put on paper with adaptive management plans. And that's been enough. And because the concerns haven't been realized, we haven't had to put a damn one in. Um, so it, it's, it, it's, it's like a few others have said, it's validating what the potential concerns are. It's listening in a lot of, I mean, each state is different with its water law, um, obviously. However, what's not different is usually these projects, they'll trigger a review and then it comes up to, you know, whether it's the regional engineer or whomever is going to be listening to the water masters and the users. And if they raise objections or concerns, then they raise objections and concerns, and then you get into the pickle. If they don't, because you've had these conversations ahead of time, then it's just not non-issue. Um, and we've seen that in a, in a number of states um, where these projects keep keep flying. Eventually, you get enough of these things, and then the states have to provide some actual specific policy to these as opposed to just interpreting past policies that weren't written for this stuff. And that hasn't, you know, that's been mixed, but not too scary, um, honestly, in other states. I know that in, in the foothills and other ditches around, a lot of those ditches were originally came from the mining era. So when they measure out the amount of water you get, you get it by the miner's inch. So maybe in this case we'll just measure it by the beaver's inch and you know the beauty of a beaver is you give them an inch and they'll take a mile so you can get a mile restored to the beaver jessica what do you got for us 
Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you. This, is, this has been a, a great conference or summit. Um, my question is kind of about the scaling up idea, and, um, and I love it, and I can see that that's where it needs to go for sure, but it also seems like if we're trying to kind of re-wet these really large areas, this really big sponge, these big riparian aquifers, there's going to be, at some point, there's going to be this time lag, and, and the perception is going to I don't know, how, how, how are we going to navigate that time lag, right? Because if it's a huge sponge we're trying to re-wet, depending on how much water is coming into the system, there's going to be some time in there. That, that's not a question for anyone in particular, but I'm, I'd be curious if anyone has thoughts on how to tackle that. Well, there's the old Tip O'Neill saying that all politics are local. And in this case, all beaver water politics are super local. So we just start one BDA at a time and one beaver at a time and work our way back out. But Kevin, you look like, or Bob, I don't know, or who else? Karen? Yeah, Karen? I, had, I had that one slide um, uh, quoting Dr. Uh, Fairfax of, of the, the Doty Ravine, right, where you just had that that crinkly, uh, flammable, golden vegetation uh, all downstream. And then you had that beautiful, lush riparian zone. I mean, I think that picture uh, is worth 10,000 words uh, for landowners. Um, and I think that that is what you might need as a sales pitch. Have that right, right on the top of your binder when you go to meet with that landowner for coffee. Um, at the, the potential and the possibilities for, for um, you know, water restoration on their property. So I agree with Brock. I don't know if there's this, you know, we're gonna start shooting beavers out of airplanes and parachutes like we did back in the day. I, th I think we need to have this kind of grassroots movement where uh, the proof of concept over time is, is gonna be really the driver of that. Um, that's how I kind of started in the Scott River. Um, the landowners wanted more water and that's how they allowed um, a lot of these things on their on their property and we you know funded the monitoring to kind of show that um that it would do that so it's the proof of concept i do believe uh you know that picture is worth ten thousand words so that's one of my favorite pictures of bda i've ever seen and then also the the ones i've seen uh i guess joe that is also in the pbr manual the fire resilience ones that you showed and, and uh, Emily showed today, those things are, are key, I think, to getting these things, um, you know, more widespread in arid, in arid regions of California. And Doty is also a really good um, lesson for California because it is in Placer County, which again, to mention depredation, Placer County depredates seven times more beavers than anywhere else in the state. So it's a scrubby little area in the most difficult county in the entire state. And it still created this beautiful different change. I think it's been spoken about before a couple other speakers on Wednesday now about Doty, but you know, it was really the land trust that was at the front edge of the spear on that uh, depredation piece there in Doty Ravine as well until Damien Ciotti and others showed up. And said, "Well, we'll work with you. It's just U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, but you got to have a beaver peace treaty. You got to stop killing beavers, and and then just a couple of yellow toys, knock out some levees, like Kevin talked about, put in the right BDAs, and they got initially what eight thousand percent increase for not that much money. And now we're a few years later, and we're we're way past that. So we figure it's just the antidote to all of this beaver killing. It's just got to go. All right, who's up? Because I got no hands up. So somebody." wants to share a piece of a beaver story here that we haven't brought up that's relative to California, an angle and want to talk about? I, I'll, this is Karen. I'll ask a question, uh, What? and I apologize, I was on a work call just till now, so I, if this was already talked about. Uh, but I, in looking at pond and plug projects in California, uh, they seem to uh, become habitats for beavers and, and beavers will quickly colonize them. 
And I think they're, you know, they're like, wow, I can just, you know, dam the bottom of this pond and it's already a pond for me. Uh, but there's multiple projects where that's happened. Prazo, um, uh, Big Bear Flat, uh, I, 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 there's a ton of them. And I was just thinking, is that, what do you guys think of that? I mean, I think they saved the projects, but um, just, you know, is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? Well, Damien and I have talked about this and I'll, I'll throw it out to the larger sort of discussion not to disparage those beavers by any means. They're, they're heroes, obviously. And- I just sent you one. Whoa, somebody in the background there. Um, so those beavers are heroes, of course, but they're also like your kind of lazy Cheeto munching kickback and lazy boy barely want to swim to the fridge to get a beer beavers because they don't have to do any work. So the channel is fossilized, the ponds are fixed, the habitat is stable-ish. But, you know, a, a dead system is really stable. A Walmart parking lot doesn't change a lot over a human time scale. But that doesn't make a great habitat just because it sticks. So the thing that's lacking in the pond and plug projects, in my opinion, is the dynamic metastability over time that drives the edge effect that keeps a system resilient versus resistant, which I, I love that. I love that piece, Karen. That was total genius. You know, you get your, like the, the, um, the idea of the oak tree versus the bamboo, right? The oak tree resists and resists and then snaps and blows out. Bamboo lays down and comes back up. So I think they're very resistant. I mean, you throw, what, 300,000 yards of rock at a project, it's going to resist. That's just the nature of it. But that's not the same as resilience and it's not the same as dynamism. So if we're, if we're killing a system and then studying the fossil remnant and calling that stasis success, I think we're really missing the point. And you know, we should go down and tear all that rock out and make those beavers work for a living. Come on, it's the welfare state. You know, if, if we're really mad about like people just handing stuff out, we gotta make those beavers work. Anyway, that's my thoughts on it. Certainly mess with the cost. Exercise those beavers. Uh, all right, uh, John Downs, you're up for a question. Okay, hi. Uh, yeah, I've just been listening all day and uh, I'm at work right now, so I'll make this quick. <laughs> My second job. Um, I work for the Department of Fish and Wildlife. Where I'm in the Watershed Restoration Grants branch, and I put the link up there in the chat. Um, we're unfortunately, we've just closed recently our application or solicitation, but we're reviewing um, uh, projects now. And we have money every year, around 30 to $40 million to give away. And uh, BDAs are a type of project that we have funded in the past and we are, intend to fund in the, in the future. And, um, and, we're, and so it's actually good that I'm catching you all right now because during the time that the solicitation is open, we, we can't really talk to potential grant applicants about how they can develop their, their project so that it can be funded. But now that the grant period is, or the solicitation period is closed, we can work with potential applicants to help them develop plans that fit our program uh, to get funding. So uh, I, can, um, I can also throw my email address in there uh, for anyone who's interested in, in contacting someone directly in the grants branch to, to work on developing uh, proposals for BDA programs or, you know, that's about it. Great. Thanks. John. Oh, yeah. That's yeah. awesome. Uh, Eric Nacida, good to see you on the on here. What, what you got for us? I know. I, I feel like I'm such a neophyte at this and I should just shut up, but <laughs> um, long time. Well, not long time, but uh, yeah, it's been a while since I've been a beaver booster, but um, uh, oh, that's John. Um, so I, I would agree with Kevin. I, you know, I, I, I'm not a big fan of the plug and pond. Um, it's the first technique that I ever saw and I saw some great success. Um, but I do think that there is a place for it sometimes. And, and I do 
I would like to disagree a little bit. The ones that I've seen, they're not using rock to harden the dams. They're using the native fill or the native material from the ponds to build the dams. So there is still some dynamism that can go in there. However, I would much, much rather see the PBRs with a beaver complement. So here on the El Dorado, we're still kind of struggling with, um, you know, you look at the, 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 the uh, beaver map and we just have such a paucity of beaver on this forest. And I get a little concerned about having uh, PBRs that we have to annually maintain in areas that are very, very difficult to get to. And, um, and uh, I, I certainly wouldn't mind going um, out and visiting some of these PBRs when anybody goes out. I don't want to go make a special trip, but give me an email. I want to meet you out there. Great. Paw City sounds like tracking wildlife in an urban area. Is that one? Paw City there? No. Oh. Oh, all right. Okay. Eddie Corwin, how are you? What you got? Yeah. Hey, everyone. Uh, conference has been awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, I was thinking about, um, you know, like uh, the depredation, especially in agricultural land, and wondering, you know, what it would take if we thought about direct payments to farmers and landowners to keep beavers on their lands and allow them to build the dams. Um, you know, there's a lot of corporations like Coca-Cola and Microsoft and Intel that have water replenishment goals. And if we could quantify the, uh, the benefit, then maybe they'd be willing to put money at it. Sorry, I am walking outside now, so <laughs> apologize for the shaky voice. Well, we, we saw the other day and, uh, you know, there's increasingly a bits and pieces of studies that are trying to quantify the environmental service benefits of beaver and beaver related habitats. And so you wanna throw the caster into the commodity or community mix here. It's exactly what they've done in Bavaria for years. It's direct payments to farmers to, um, to leave the beaver there and they have a way of figuring out what's, uh, you know, how much, how much acreage are they giving up and what would that have been uh, worth um, if they were still farming it and they just pay the farmers to keep the beavers there. So there's, there's examples. Yeah, the EU beyond, yeah, I think with, with Gerhardt there, we just need to bring Gerhardt over. People know he's the, he's the German beaver believer who's, we, a number of us have been to the State of the Beaver Conference in Oregon and he's famous, he's, he's uh, written up in a Derek Gal's uh, book about bringing back beavers, which is, primarily about the UK, but they do get into more European for those folks online, have a listen, but yeah, why not? We, we pay for all kinds of other services and in, in the farm bill, look at what, look, look at the stuff that's in the farm bill that we're paying for <laughs> as a society at scale. So why not add beaver into the mix? Yeah, like BDAs, it's nonsense, right? That's in the farm bill now. <laughs> Or at least have a tax credit for farmers that have beaver on their land or um, have a fire credit for farmers that allow uh, beaver dams on their land. Yeah, one thing we worked with a bunch of landowners on the Shasta to do a safe harbor agreement. One thing we found out through that process is that any restoration that they do um, underneath of, of safe harbor, that's tax deductible. So I think uh, that um, it's actually a tax credit. Um, so it's, it's even better. Um, so, so you end up getting uh, quite a benefit from that. And that gave them quite a bit of incentive to kind of, you know, beef up what they had in their site plans there. So I think that's a great idea. Interesting. Brock, I wanted to um, center Elijah's question about because maybe Karen has an answer to this and she's, and maybe she's already answering it in the chat, but um, I was just curious if anyone is aware of dedicated positions within US Forest Service or Fish and Wildlife Service in California for tracking beaver populations that's not related to depredation. Looks like Karen's not, um, she might be busy right now, but we don't have Damien on the call anymore, right? So we can't get that US Fish and Wildlife. Does anyone else in this group know about that? If we have, um, those staff who are tracking beaver distribution. Karen, I'm actually the only one. 
the only one I know who tracks Beaver distribution is Eli. And I think that his funding ran out. So I don't know if he's necessarily tracking them. He's not. I mean, that was the Beaver mapper and, and those data he got from fish surveys, which is great. And now we want to find someone to take all of his data set and add them to iNaturalist just so they're all one place. Karen, can you hear me? Yes, sorry. <laughs> Do you know, is anyone in, in US Forest Service tracking beaver distribution? I don't think so. I don't, I don't know of anybody. Okay. I naturalist. <laughs> awesome. When we, when we had our meeting that Kate mentioned with Director Bonham so many years ago, he basically was asking us that same question. We're like, wait a minute. Isn't that supposed to be your job? Yeah, it's fascinating how we've got a species that no one is formally, structurally paying attention to the distribution, the population density, or anything. And yet we are in Heidi's. Uh, um, let us know just how many depredation permits are out there on the land every year. It's a, it's, it's fascinating. It's kind of like, yeah, interesting. All righty. Who else? Anybody else in the, John, is your hand still up? Do you have another uh, offering for us, John Downs? No. Yes, I, I this is Margie. I have a couple. Oh, there you uh, go. A couple thoughts. Um, you know, one is, you know, funding the initial installation of, of Beaver dam analogs is, is one thing, but, um, you know, like we've been talking about, uh, you know, monitoring the, the beaver population that the department has paid for people to monitor sa salmon populations for, for years and years. And it just recently has started doing it on a doing that work on its own. So, you know, it really is a, a big question about funding to, to uh, monitor beaver, beaver populations. It would be a, another question of funding to, to yeah, come up with a strategy for changing the, the beaver, um, you know, code sections. Um, but, you know, one of the things I, I worry about with, you know, certainly with grant funding is, Sure, we can we can fund Child's Meadow beaver BDAs, and we can and and let's say we take that to scale. Then we need to fund a bunch of maintenance, and we need to fund a bunch of monitoring. And so that's really the, I think that's really the the sort of strategy that the department's sort of struggling with is like. It it takes a concerted effort on the department's part to say. You know, we're going to prioritize the maintenance of these BDAs, these projects over doing other restoration projects, and um, that might be a good thing to do. And and I certainly think that you get a lot more bang for your buck and a lot more acreage out of doing these projects. But um, you know, again, it's one of those things where the the political winds could could blow the other way, and and then you know, the, the funding sources for, for maintenance and monitoring um, of these structures sort of dries up. And so um, the other, um, yeah, so I, I guess, you know, we, we could fund them. It just, it, it, it gets to be a pretty competitive um, program. And so um, it really does speak again to, you know, Beaver being the ultimate answer, but yeah, there's just a, there's a lot of there's a lot of challenges ahead of us. That's that's just I guess what I'm saying. Karen, looked like you wanted to get in on um, what Joe would call the cheap and cheerful solution, huh? Um, I I just wanted to say that um, you know I, I think it's important when we talk about these projects that are are slower. Um, that occur over time versus the kind of one and done restoration projects that uh, you know maybe the idea is that we don't need to monitor um I, I i've been spending a lot of time looking at google earth at some of these projects that aren't being monitored they were they were called a success two years after they were complete and they're totally blown out now and and nobody's been monitoring they were successful pond and plug works and and stays and and so i i think the idea that 
that restoration shouldn't have to be monitored over time is just is just kind of nuts. Um, when we're when we're working with nature, we, we need to learn and we need to to adapt. And and the only way we're going to move forward. Uh, and oh, shoot, zip it. Uh, <clears throat> move forward with it is 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 through monitoring is through science and maybe it, <laughs> my dog just had dinner so he's she's really happy her duck um so <laughs> waterfowl <laughs> sorry about that uh, yeah she's she likes the the beaver supported species um anyway i'll get off my soapbox but i i think that that we we still have a long way to go. We're still having recovery debt, and and we need to learn. And maybe it's not the state that should fund that. Um, and and we're in. Uh, I, I'm a research side of the Forest Service, and they just funded uh, meadow restoration as a research initiative. And so we're starting a, a big landscape meadow restoration focused on ecological meadow restoration, looking at sediment deposition, looking at um, hydrology and and sort of long long scale stuff. So we're with you, CDFW, but don't don't give up on monitoring and 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 adaptive management. No, I I wasn't suggesting that we would. I think that um, you know, I guess you know, we're sort of tied to this three year general fund cycle, um, and uh, and so you know, I think it would be awesome to to basically have almost a a beaver grant program, right? Where you, you, um, you know, you can have all sorts of different elements of this, right? Whether it's landowner education and, and whether it's working on, on uh, changing the, the, the way beaver are handled and, and depredation permits and, um, you know, monitoring projects and, and providing maintenance and, and monitoring dollars. I mean, that's, to me, this is the thing about BDAs is that um, the, the need for maintenance and monitoring is explicit. You know, it's just because they are, you know, in essence, temporary structures that are, are trying to make a, a, a large change with a, with a man, you know, with a handmade structure, um, you know, it's not a one and done. It's that's explicit in the in the whole thing. And so, in order to do these projects, you have to be thinking about doing this for a long term. You know, each project you should be thinking about for a minimum of ten years and probably more, like twenty or more, right? And and so, um, you know, that's the that's the sort of conundrum when it comes to to grant funding these projects is that as you add more each year, you're still funding the one from last year, you know, and so it's just, um, it, it adds up and up and up. And so, um, you know, it's such a different model from some of the other projects that we've done that it almost seems like it would call for, you know, a, a separate pot of money so that there's that understanding there and that it's not competing with other types of projects, you know? Yeah, I want to jump in really quick. I think all of this stuff's super, super important. Um, and I, I have my own soapbox. So Karen, I'm just going to steal it from you for a minute and jump up on there. Um, I, think, I think making a couple of critical distinctions are really important in that when, as soon as you say the term maintenance, someone thinks about their beat up car that they got to take in and get all this work done and expense and time and like, oh God, it just looks like a sink. I think if we're spending a bunch of time and money thinking about maintenance, we actually should we should take a long step back and look at design. If you're having to go in and rebuild these things every year, you're fighting the site. And if Damien were here, I know he would say, don't fight the site. So a lot of the time you see restoration go into the worst, most beat up, steepest, driest, most incised, terrible looking spot on the property which means that you're fighting the site. I mean, behind me, right? Like there's the beaver dam. Those beavers built it. You can't see it because it's behind me in the photo, but there's a giant floodplain connection. Every time the water pulses, it runs out onto you know, hundreds of square yards of floodplain. Beavers are too smart to fight the site. 
they don't need to do the degree of maintenance that we would as humans if we put stuff in in the steepest, narrowest, worst spot. So we can start with intelligent design that picks up the depositional zones where recovery is underway and ignore the stuff that looks terrible because that's, that's your highest hanging fruit that will have serious maintenance costs over time if you're tracking success as a single structure persisting, which doesn't really matter in the larger scheme of things. And if you're worried about a single structure persisting, you know, just put in a hundred and then you don't have to worry about that one. So I think monitoring really needs to be done. I have, hell, I've hardly monitored my sites. Uh, there's, there's no money in it. But I think, yeah, I think maintenance is probably the, the, wrong, the wrong terminology just because of the, that knee-jerk psychological response. When I'm teaching classes in what we call permaculture, regenerative design, one of my core principles we talk about is, I talk about is compose with rather than impose upon. And so the humility stance of working with systems, i.e. the process-based collaborative approach so that the resiliency and dynamism of the system leads, needs less, you know, fussy maintenance makes sense. So a hard one and planned redundancy, like you said. I don't have any hands up here. Um, we got seven minutes left. Anybody else on this call who hasn't spoken? Rick Landman, you got anything for us? Jeff Baldwin, you're being real quiet. You, you want to chime in here at the end. Jackie, you've got things to say behind the sky. I know you're doing good work keeping us going today. Anyone? Heidi? Hey, Brock. It's Rick Landman. Yeah. I just, just comment. I've been watching Beaver use the San Francisco Bay to colonize one stream after the next. It looks to me like they've gone from Martinez and Alhambra Creek to Napa River to Sonoma Creek and hopefully up over that divide now into your side of um, the Santa Rosa side of things. I wonder if they've reached Petaluma River yet. Um, and in the South Bay, um, after translocations in Lexington Reservoir, they've gone down Los Gatos Creek to the Guadalupe River, um, reached the Bay, South Bay, and now colonized up Coyote Creek um, in East San Jose. And we're seeing now, as you saw at the end of my talk, tracks um, up and down the South Bay uh, in the mudflats. Uh, any further evidence of migration of beaver through the bay? You're as, you're as paying attention to it as much as any of us. I, there's those whole A Creek is another one that is just near Sonoma Creek that you mentioned. We haven't been hearing about Petaluma. People call it a river, it's Petaluma Slough further upstream yet, but, um, and also the east side of Marin, there's a couple tribs in there that we're often trying to hear about if there's any beaver action, Richardson Bay area and such, but no, we usually just get false positives on a muskrat or a, a river otter, is, you know. I see, thanks. Jeff Baldwin, you popped on for a sec, what do you got for us? I was just going to say thank you to everybody for all of your contributions, both these last three days at this conference, at this summit, but much more than that, your contributions on the landscape and to our community and to trying to move us to a more resilient space. So thank you. Mutual adoration moment right back at you. Yeah, and thank you so much, Jeff, for taking this on and get, persuading Sonoma to uh, take us on. My pleasure, absolutely my pleasure. Thank you, Heidi, for thinking about doing this. Yeah, all that all that Beaver Festival energy that we couldn't couldn't get in person there, Heidi was. It's great. Thanks for massaging all that pent up COVID energy and. And, and working us into this online format. I think it's been really successful the last two days. It's a, a watershed moment in California beaver believing world. So thank you for leading. Well, let's that. hope that it means that the next one is in person and uh, that that happens in, you know, two years where everyone gathers. 
Yeah, they have yeah that's where the real the real progress happens around the campfires and around the bar stools and yeah um exactly I, I this has definitely been very valuable but um i, I miss you guys <laughs> You too, sure. Bob. We need some. We need some beaver skits and some rapping going on for sure. More dance parties for the Beaver Summit. I'll let folks know while we're sort of at the end, relative to the idea Bob's bringing up about bar stools. Um, uh, up in Chico, there's a new uh, the Golden Beaver Distillery, and these folks who've got this distillery and they're ma actually making bourbon out of rice from the valley, which is a key piece of what we're talking about with this beaver coexistence in the valley. So we could get both surf and turf on the on the salmon and the rice and the bourbon and and apparently we haven't been there kate and i've met with them a couple times and in their showroom or the or the tasting room um they've got like a whole beaver museum apparently and they've got all kind of beaver tchotchkes and things outside of chico so any of you all are up there they sell little little beaver shots and they got beaver liquor and and uh they're they're clearly having their they're they're punishing their way through things as well but um Slowly but surely, we're, there, we're moving into it. So. Rachel does have one interesting question in the chat for folks. And she's asking, oh. she's thinking about going to grad school and she's wondering what some of the most pressing research needs, what would you like her to do her thesis on? Anyone? It's crazy that there are no beaver biologists or ecologists out there. You've got all these damn geomorphologists and hydrologists and fish squeezers, um, and we haven't had a real beaver biologist for ages. Um, there's a couple couple exceptions, but really like that, that, uh, that went out of fad in like the late 70s. So studying anything on the population dynamics and I mean, yeah, there's just so much we don't know. There's so much need there. And if we could, if you could come out of it and call yourself a beaver biologist, that would be a real service. I, I have a thesis, a thesis suggestion. It's Rick Landman. Um, a decade ago, they looked at um, uh, both um, captured and museum specimen DNA of beaver castor fiber all across um, from Mongolia to um to germany and they um even though there were maybe a dozen and a half or two dozen named subspecies of beaver genetically they're all the same except maybe you could say there's an eastern eurasian group and a western U U european group we have the same problem in the u.s where all these 20th century naturals try to name any beaver skull they could find that looked morphologically different from the other ones they named it after themselves and and so we have, uh, you know, we have two dozen different subspecies of beaver. This is an issue because the beaver in Lake Tahoe now uh, were translocated from Oregon and Idaho, and so a lot of people say, "Oh, they're not native." Well, I, I don't believe they're any different than the beaver that were extirpated there in 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 you know at the time of the gold when the gold rush ended the fur rush. Um, uh, so I think a genetic study of museum specimens and captured uh, beaver. You don't have to kill them to do this. Um, across the United States would maybe put to rest this question. And I think it could get accepted in a decent journal. We'll have to name them Lamb and I. <laughs> yeah, we, do. we don't need that. <laughs> All righty, folks, it is six o'clock. We've all Woo! done our duty here. Big round, big, big tail. All flag. right. Thanks all. Nice Good job, job, guys. Everyone. Good job. Great. Thanks, job, everyone. Thanks, everybody. It's been great. Beaver on. Have a great weekend. Get right. on the next round. Oh, my God. All right. Bye, y'all. Thank you all. Thank you all. Great. All right. Well, good work, team. Yeah. Yeah. I'm I'm preserving the chat right now. So make sure we we got that on right. 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 Yeah, so you're you're the Heidi. Yeah. I'll send that to you shortly. Okay, I will not worry about that. Done. Got it. Um, and then the video is just going to take a while to process. So I'll let you know. Right. I got I'm it for not you. as scared as last time. And boy, <laughs> everyone was great with their times today too. Yeah. Yeah. And the Everybody. content was sharp.